Hmm. Susan, would you tell me when we should start? Because it is 7.30. Um, go ahead, uh, Hannah. You can make your introductions. As a matter of fact, Derek has made the introductions. So you could go ahead. All One right. moment, please. Good morning, everyone. Um, I would like to welcome the committee members, the public and the FDA uh, for the 179th meeting of the Vaccine and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee meeting uh, set for two days, February 28th and March 1st. Uh, on the first day, uh, the meeting uh, will be in open session to discuss and make recommendations on the safety and effectiveness of Abrisvo, RSV vaccine manufactured by Pfizer, with a requested indication for BLA number 125769 for active immunization for the prevention of acute respiratory disease and lower respiratory tract uh, disease caused by RSV in adults 60 years of age or older. Uh, I would like uh, to kick us off by uh, introducing Dr. Susan Pedar, the designated federal officer for today's meeting. Dr. Pedar. Thank you, Dr. Asali. Um, Good morning, everyone. This is Dr. Susan Pider, and it is my great honor to serve as the designated federal officer for today's 179th Vaccines and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee meeting. On behalf of the FDA, the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research, CBER, and the committee, I'm happy to welcome everyone for today's virtual meeting. Today, the committee will meet in open session to discuss and make recommendations on the safety and effectiveness of Abrisvo respiratory syncytial virus vaccine manufactured by Pfizer Incorporated with a requested indication in biologics license application number 125769, STN 125769-0 for active immunization for the prevention of acute resp uh, respiratory disease and lower respiratory tract disease, LRTD, caused by respiratory syncytial virus in adults 60 years of age and older. Today's meeting and the topic were announced in the Federal Register Notice that was published on February 1st, 2023. At this time, I would like to introduce and acknowledge outstanding leadership of my division director, Dr. Prabha Atreya, and the excellent work of my team whose contributions have been critical for preparing today's meeting. Ms. Va uh, Valerie Vascio, Ms. Karen um, Thomas, Ms. Joanne Lipkind, and Ms. Lisa Johnson. I also would like to express our sincere appreciation to Mr. Derek Bonner in facilitating the meeting today. Also, our sincere gratitude goes to many CBER and FDA staff working very hard behind the scenes trying to ensure that today's virtual meeting will also be a successful one like all the previous RPAC meetings. Please direct any press media questions for today's meeting to FDA's Office of the Media Affairs at FDAOMA at fda.hhs.gov. The transcriptionists for today's meeting are Catherine Diaz and Deborah De La Croce from Translation Excellence. We'll begin today's meeting by taking a formal roll call for the committee members and temporary voting members. When it is your turn, please turn on your video camera and mute your phone and then state your first and last name, institution and areas of expertise. And when finished, you can turn your camera off so we can proceed to the next percent. Please see the uh, member roster slides in which we will begin with the chair, Dr. Hannah El Sali. Dr. El Sali. Good morning, uh, Hannah El Sali. Baylor College of Medicine, Adult Infectious Diseases. My research uh, focuses on clinical vaccine development. Great, thank you. Dr. Adam Berger. Hi, uh, Adam Berger. I'm the Director of the Division of Clinical and Healthcare Research Policy at the National Institutes of Health. I'm a geneticist by training. I oversee all of our uh, clinical trial policies here for the agency. Great, thank you. Dr. Henry Bernstein. 
Good morning. Good morning. I'm Hank Bernstein. I'm a professor of pediatrics at the Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra and Northwell. I'm a general pediatrician uh, with expertise uh, in vaccines. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh, Captain Amanda Cohn. Good morning. I'm uh, Amanda Cohn. I'm a pediatrician and medical epidemiologist at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention with uh, expertise in vaccine policy. Great, thank you. Dr. Holly Janes. Good morning. Um, my name is, Dr. is Holly Janes. I'm a professor of biostatistics at the Fred Hutch Cancer Center. Um, and my expertise is in vaccine trial design analysis and evaluation. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Captain David Kim. Dr. Kim. Okay, we will move to the next person. Hopefully he will join, be able to join us later. Um, Dr. Stephen Pergam. Hey, Susan. Um, I'm Steve Pergam. I'm um, a professor at Fred Hutch Cancer Center, and my major focus is on um, infections and immunocompromised hosts, and I am an infectious disease physician by training. Thank you, Dr. Pergam. Dr. Stanley Perlman. Hi, I'm Stanley Perlman. I'm a professor of microbiology and immunology in, at the University of Iowa, and my specialty is in coronaviruses and in pediatric infectious diseases. Great. Thank you, Dr. Perlman. Dr. Jay Portnoy, our consumer representative. Good morning. I'm Dr. Jay Portnoy. I'm a professor of pediatrics at the University of Missouri uh, Kansas City School of Medicine, and I'm an allergist immunologist at Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Thank you. Dr. Greg Sylvester, our alternate industry representative. Okay, Dr. Um, Dr. Sylvester is not um, currently available. Uh, we'll come back to them. Um, a little later. Um, next, we will do a roll call for our temporary voting members. I'll begin with Dr. Marie Griffin. Dr. Griffin. Uh, good morning. I'm Marie Griffin. I'm a professor emerita of health policy of Vanderbilt University School of Medicine. I'm an internist and pharmacoepidemiologist. Thank you. Dr. Danielle Feiken. Hello. Um, I'm an uh, internist by training. I spent 20 years at the US CDC working as a medical epidemiologist. Uh, I've spent the last five years as a consultant and temporary staff member at the World Health Organization, focusing on RSV and COVID vaccines. Uh, I, I'd like to state I'm not representing uh, any official WHO position today. I'm just here as myself. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. James Hildreth. Dr. Hildreth. Good morning, thank you. Good morning, thank you, Susan. I'm James Hildreth, the president and CEO of Meharry Medical College and professor of internal medicine. Um, I'm an immunologist by training. And my interest is in viral pathogenesis and how the immune system responds to viral infections. Thank you. Great, thank you. I'm gonna go back and see if um, Captain David Kim is available. If not, we will... Um, if it's still not present, I'll um, call on uh, Dr. Greg Sylvester. I wonder if he's av available. Okay, so um, they will join us um, soon, I'm sure. Uh, we have a total of 13 participants, 12 voting and one non-voting members. Um, I proceed with reading the FDA conflict of interest disclosure statement for the public record. The Food and Drug Administration, FDA, is convening virtually today, February 28, 2023, the 179th meeting of the Vaccines and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee, VRPAC, under the authority of the Federal Advisory Committee Act, FACA of 1972. Dr. Hana al Sali is serving as the chair for today's meeting. Today, on February 28, 2023, the committee will meet in open session to discuss and make recommendations on the safety and effectiveness of abrisfo 
respiratory syncytial virus vaccine manufactured by Pfizer Incorporated with a requested indication in biologics license application number 125769, STN 125769-0 for active immunization for the prevention of acute respiratory disease and lower respiratory tract disease, LRTD, caused by respiratory syncytial virus in adults 60 years of age and older. This topic is determined to be a particular matter involving specific parties, PMISP. With the exception of industry representative member, all standing and temporary voting members of the FERPAC are appointed special government employees, SGEs, or regular government employees, RGEs, from other agencies and are subject to federal conflict of interest laws and regulations. The following information on the status of this committee's compliance with federal ethics and conflict of interest laws, including but not limited to 18 U.S.C. Section 208, is being provided to participants in today's meeting and to the public. Related to the discussions of this meeting, all members, RGE and SGE consultants of this committee have been screened for potential financial conflict of interest of their own, as well as those imputed to them, including those of their spouse or minor children, and for the purposes of 18 U.S. Code 208, their employers. These interests may include investments, consulting, expert witness testimony, contracts and grants, cooperative research and development agreements, teaching, speaking, writing, patents and royalties, and primary employment. These may include interests that are current or under negotiation. FDA has determined that all members of this advisory committee, both regular and temporary members, are in compliance with federal ethics and conflict of interest laws. Under 18 U.S.C. Section 208, Congress has authorized FDA to grant wa waivers to special government employees and regular government employees who have financial conflicts of interest when it is determined that the agency's need for special government employee services outweighs the potential for a conflict of interest created by the financial interests involved, or when the interest of a regular government employee is not so substantial as to be deemed likely to affect the integrity of the services which the government uh, may expect from the employee. Based on today's agenda and all financial interests reported by committee members and consultants, there have been one conflict of interest waiver issued under 18 U.S. Code 208 in connection with this meeting. We have the following consultants serving as temporary voting members, Dr. Marie Griffin, Dr. Daniel Feiken, and Dr. James Hildred. Dr. Greg Sylvester of Securus Incorporated will serve as the alternate industry representative for today's meeting. Industry representatives are not appointed as a special government employees, and serve as non-voting members of the committee. Industry representatives act on behalf of all regulated industry and bring general industry perspective to the committee. Dr. Jay Portnoy is serving as the consumer representative for this committee. Consumer representatives are appointed as special government employees and are screened and cleared prior to their participation in the meeting. They are voting members of the committee. The guest speakers for today's meeting are as follows. Dr. Fiona Havers, Team Lead, Respiratory Virus Hospitalization Surveillance Network Team, Coronavirus and Other Respiratory Viruses Division, National Center for Immunization and Respiratory Diseases, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, Atlanta, Georgia. Dr. Helen Kip Talbot, Associate Professor, Vanderbilt University Medical Center, Nashville, Tennessee. Dr. Natalie J. Thornburg, Acting Chief Laboratory Branch, Coronavirus and Other Respiratory Viruses Division, National Center for Immunization and Respiratory Diseases, Center for Disease Control and Prevention, Atlanta, Georgia. Disclosure of conflicts of interest for speakers follows applicable federal laws, regulations, and FDA guidance. FDA encourages all meeting participants, including open public hearing speakers, to advise the committee of any financial relationships that they may have with any affected firms, its products, and if known, its direct competitors. We would like to remind standing and temporary members that if the discussions involve any other products or firms not already on the agenda for which, in, 
for which an FDA participant has a personal or imputed financial interest, the participants need to inform the DFO and exclude themselves from the discussion and their exclusion will be noted for the record. This concludes my reading uh, of the conflicts of interest for the public record. At this time, I would like to hand over the meeting over to our chair, Dr. Hanna El Salu. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Paydar. Uh, the FDA introduction is next on our agenda. Dr. David Kaslow, Director of the Office of Vaccine and Research Review at CBER, will provide uh, the welcome notes from the FDA. Dr. Kaslow. Thank you, uh, Dr. Asale, and welcome all to this 179th convening of VRPAC for a two-day meeting in open session to discuss and make recommendations on the safety and effectiveness of actually two pioneering RSV vaccine candidates. Pioneering as they represent 21st century science and technology over the shortcomings of previous efforts of a half a century ago, structural immunology and engineering over empiric vaccinology against a respiratory virus that causes life-threatening disease in the youngest and oldest, particularly those with comorbidities. The convening of VRPAC focuses on respiratory syncytial virus disease in older adults, as will be reviewed by presentations this morning. The committee will then consider two RSV candidates, one a bivalent without adjuvant, the other a monovalent with an adjuvant, the particular product for consideration today is one submitted by the sponsor Pfizer in BLA 125769, the other for consideration tomorrow by the sponsor GSK in BLA 125775. Let me conclude these brief welcome by thanking the committee members for their time today and tomorrow, by thanking those from the FDA who reviewed these submissions and helped organize this meeting, by thanking our presenters and by thanking those who have joined this public open meeting virtually. We look forward to a productive meeting today and tomorrow. Back to you, Dr. Assal. Thank you, Dr. Kaslow. Next, uh, Dr. Gu Tam Sen, uh, the review committee chair uh, from the Division of Vaccines and Related uh, Products Application, Office of Vaccine Research and Review. Dr. Sen will go over the BLA for Abrisvo RSV vaccine in adults 60 years of age and older. Dr. Sen? Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, Dr. El Sali, uh, for the kind introduction. Um, my name is Gautam Sen from Office of Vaccine at CBAR FDA. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce you to today's discussion topics, which is biologics license application for respiratory syncytial virus vaccine, Abrisbo by Pfizer. Next slide, please. Uh, here is the outline of my talk. Uh, I'll briefly discuss about the respiratory syncytial virus disease in older adults. Description of Abrisbo, the vaccine in for discussion. Overview of Abrisbo's biologics license application, the clinical package submitted by Pfizer. Overview of today's agenda, voting question for the committee. Next slide, please. RSV is one of the leading cause of respiratory infection in older adults. RSV has two major subgroups, A and B, which co-circulate. Both can cause severe disease. Palivizumab, a monoclonal antibody, is approved by FDA for prevention of serious lower respiratory tract disease caused by RSV in children less than two years of age. Currently, palivizumab is not approved by FDA for use in older adults. In the US, RSV is responsible for approximately 177,000 hospitalizations and roughly 14,000 deaths annually in adults 65 years of age and older. Currently, there is no licensed vaccine to prevent RSV disease in older adults. Treatment of RSV disease for older adults consists primarily of supportive care. Therefore, RSV disease represents a serious condition with an unmet medical need for older adults. Next slide, please. Uh, each 0.5 ml dose of Abrisbo vaccine 
contains 60 microgram each of lipolyzed recombinant prefusion A protein from RSBA and RSBB subgroups expressed in CHO cells, a total of 120 microgram protein. The dosing regimen is a single dose of 0.5 ml administered intramuscularly. Applicants proposed indication, active immunization to prevent acute respiratory disease and lower respiratory tract disease caused by RSV in individuals 60 years of age and older. Next slide, please. On September 30th, 2022, FDA received uh, the biologic license application from Pfizer for Abrisbo. The clinical package includes safety, immunogenicity, and efficacy data from an ongoing pivotal phase three study, C3671013, conducted in the US, Canada, Finland, the Netherlands, South Africa, Argentina, and Japan, with approximately 34,000 participants. Additional safety data from approximately 1,200 for the final formulation recipients across five clinical studies conducted in the US, Australia, and UK were also submitted. Next slide, please. So here is uh, the overview of today's agenda. After my uh, introduction, Dr. Natalie Thornburg from CDC will discuss about RSV virology, strain variation, and surveillance measures, followed by Dr. Fiona Havers from CDC will discuss the RSV epidemiology and disease burden in older adults. Dr. Talbot from Vanderbilt University will talk about durability of naturally acquired immunity and susceptibility to repeated RSV infection. There will be a short break followed by Dr. Alexandra Gartman from Pfizer will present their findings from the safety and efficacy of bivalent RSV prefusion A vaccine in adults 60 years of age and older. Next slide, please. Uh, my colleague, Dr. Nadine Park, uh, the lead medical officer from Office of Vaccine, will present FDA's review of efficacy and safety of Abrisbo respiratory syncytial virus vaccine in adults 60 years of age and older. There will be a 40 minutes lunch break, followed by open public hearing, additional question and answer session for CDC, sponsor, and other presenters. There will be a short break, then committee discussion and voting and meeting will be adjourned. Next slide, please. So here is the voting question number one for the committee members. Are the available data adequate to support the safety of a Brisbo RSV PF when administered to individuals 60 years of age and older for the prevention of lower respiratory tract disease caused by RSV? Please vote yes or no. Next question, next slide, please. Um, here is the voting question number two for the committee members. Uh, are the available data adequate to support the effectiveness of Abrisbo RSV PF for the prevention of lower respiratory tract disease caused by RSV in individuals 60 years of age and older? Please vote yes or no. Next slide, please. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Sen, for presenting uh, the overview. Um, I would like to invite uh, the committee members to uh, use uh, the reaction button to raise the hand should they have any questions to Dr. Sen or Dr. Caslow. I have a quick question in that uh, the BLA is for uh, the, the, the efficacy indication, is for the acute respiratory infection and uh, lower respiratory tract disease. But the question is for lower respiratory tract disease. So should we focus the review and discussion on that question or what do you propose the committee should be doing? Um, thank you, Dr. Elseli. That's a, that's a very good question. Um, so uh, I, I do not want to uh, uh, steal the thunder from my colleague's presentation, um, um, Natalie Park. Uh, she will discuss about uh, uh, why uh, the question doesn't include 
acute respiratory disease in her presentation in details. So I request you to wait for that. Absolutely. Thank you so much. I do not see any raised hands uh, in, in the Zoom. So we uh, thank you, Dr. Sen. Uh, next on the agenda, uh, I would like to welcome Dr. Natalie Thornburg, Acting Chief Lab Branch Coronaviruses and Other Respiratory Viruses Division, National Center for Immunization and Respiratory Diseases at the CDC. Uh, she will go over RSV virology, strain variation, and surveillance measures. Dr. Thornburg. Hi, thank you. Can I do a quick audio check? Can you hear me all right? Uh, yes, we can. Great, wonderful. Um, so my name is Natalie Thornburg, and I'll be talking to you today about a little bit of background about respiratory syncytial virus and the virology, um, strain variation, and uh, our uh, surveillance me measures. Next slide, please. All right, so RSV, or respiratory syncytial virus, is a filamentous um, virus that's part of the orthopneumovirus family. It has an approximately 15 kilobase um, genome, which is about half the size of a coronavirus genome, and it has a single-stranded negative sense um, RNA genome, and that means it has the flip-flop of um, of the of the actual genes that cause uh, that code for proteins. It has 11 viral proteins and can be generally divided into two subgroups or serogroups, A and B viruses. And R RSVA and B viruses co-circulate. Next slide, please. All right, so this is just a cartoon of what avirian might look like. Um, internally, the single-stranded RNA genome is coded in nucleoprotein uh, with associated L polymerase and P phosphoproteins. Phosphor Um, there is a matrix protein that makes up the virion shell and is just inside a lipid bilayer. There's two major transmembrane proteins, um, G, or glycoprotein, and, or, and F, the fusion protein. Attachment of G to the cell may happen through cellular CXCR, CX3, CR1, and fusion through the F protein or fusion. Um, F and G are both targets for neutralizing antibodies. However, absorption assays indicate most neutralizing activity is directed against the S protein. Next slide, please. Um, so the attachment protein or the G, the G protein um, is the G is defines um, RSVA and RSVB viruses, um, historically speaking. And that's because it has the most uh, heterogeneous sequence. It has two large mucin-like domains um, that provide antigenic masking. Next slide, please. All right, so this is a map of the RSV genome. Um, I pulled this from a publication, and this is a truncated image, a truncated image um, and does not include the three prime end of the genome, which encodes a very large L polymerase. Um, L polymerase is very conserved and not a target for neutralizing antibodies, so we're gonna focus on other parts of the genome. Um, across the top of this inside box, um, are the gene products are listed. So you can see NS2, NS1, NS1, NS2, NP, those are the gene products. And I want you to specifically focus on uh, G and F genes. This is the number of substitutions per site, not at the gene level, but the amino acid level. So we're talking about protein substitutions here. Um, percent variability across the entire, um, the entire gene product um, of A and B viruses are shown in parentheses. So that's in black all the way at the top. So if there is at each uh, across the whole gene, if there's 10% variability between an RSV A virus and an RSV B virus, it says 10%. Just below that, there's percent variability across the entire gene, not at the amino acid level, uh, within G B viruses. 
Um, so there's variability, you know, within lots of different B viruses. And so you can see, um, for example, in the G gene product, you can see between 2 and 12% amino acid variability within all of the published RSV B sequences. Um, so the substitutions per site of each amino acid is shown in the graph. So um, the, the bar, the height of the bar, represents the absolute number of substitutions whenever you look at all of the available RSV sequences. Again, pay attention to the G and the F um, gene products as they're the targets of neutralizing antibodies. So you see a lot of variability, as I said before, in the G gene product. But most of the neutralizing antibody activity is directed against the F protein, um, which you can see some variability, but less variability. And so just for context, so you can understand how variable RSV uh, published genomes are, um, if you look at influenza viruses, it's compare, say, H1 to H3 viruses, you actually see uh, less than 40% con conservation between hemagglutinins of an H1 virus for an H3 virus. So that's 60% diversity, and so that would exhibit much more diversity um, if you are looking at F, because those are both targets of neutralizing antibodies. So you're seeing uh, 15 in RSV, A to B, as compared to 60% R H3, H3, HA, as compared to H1, HA. Um, when you compare it to, say, coronaviruses, the Omicron spike to ancestral spike um, had about 3% of amino acid changes, um, which was uh, about 38 out of um, uh, 1,200, 12 to 1,300 in the spike protein, though they were more concentrated in the receptor binding domain, which is um, the target for neutralizing antibodies, which contributed to partial escape. And that was... Uh, there was 15 amino acid changes observed out of 222. So that's a 7% divergence that allowed that shift to happen. Next slide. So the F protein may not have that much sequencing diversity, but it does have structural diversity. And this is a, this is a crystal structure um, published by Barney Graham of the same protein in two different structural forms. So it exists in at least potentially more um, structural forms that prevent different, that present differently to the immune system. And you can just look, see by looking at it that the left version of the protein looks very, very different than the right version of the protein. The left is a demi-stable um, prefusion F, and the, and the right is a more stable post-fusion F. Um, projected onto the surface of those crystal structure are different colored regions, and those represent antigenic regions of the protein um, where antibodies might bind. And so you can see um, the presence of different antigenic regions in these two different structural forms. So it has the same protein sequence, but that rearrangement puts different amino acids together um, to allow antibodies to bind in one form and not bind in another form. And I told you earlier um, that preabsorption of antibodies indicates the most potent neutralizing antibodies are directed against the F protein, not the G protein. Well, similarly, those preabsorption studies have determined that the most potent neutralizing antibodies tend to be directed towards site zero, uh, which is present in the prefusion form of F and not the post-fusion form of F. And that is colored in um, red. As, in, as you can see, it's kind of very large and at the top of a pre-fusion F. Um, and the least um, potent neutralizing antibodies are directed against uh, site one or colored in blue. And then it's sort of scaled in different antigenic sites. So there are neutralizing antibodies that bind to several of the antigenic sites. So for example, um, palivizumab is uh, not directed against site zero. All right, next slide. So I've gone back to um, I've gone back to um, this slide just to remind you of the, the variability in the G gene, um, and uh, and that is why the G gene historically, when genotyping was sort of first defined for RSV in the 1990s, that's why it was used to define uh, genotypes, because if there's differences, then you can identify those differences whenever you sequence the virus. Um, 
All right, next slide. All right, so I already showed you that G protein is the most diverse sequence in the genome, and therefore it's been used historically before the dawn of whole genome sequencing um, to identify genotypes of the virus. And this is just a list of example genotypes, and it's not important to memorize the genotypes or anything like that, um, from a 20, 2017 published um, uh, publication um, studying published RSV genomes that are, um, you know, just available in public databases. I think they looked at um, about uh, 1,100 of published genomes collected between the 1960s and uh, 2014. Um, and so this is just a list of examples of uh, genotypes that were identified in public repositories. Um, so, you know, often terminology like GA, G, GA, GA1, GA2, GA3, or the G gene, a viruses was used, GB, um, although there is some uh, that were identified in specific locations that were named slightly different, differently. So like, for example, ON, NA1, those are A viruses, BA viruses are B viruses. Next slide, please. All right, so um, the two subtypes or serotypes of RSV viruses, A and B, have been found to co-circulate. And this is just a study of community transmission of RSV in Khalifa, Khalifi, Kenya between uh, 20 or 2003 and 2017. And um, it, what you can observe is first, seasonality. Um, not all areas demonstrate seasonality, especially near the equator. Um, it can circulate year round, but many places um, RSV has been shown to have a seasonality. Uh, often, A and B viruses co-circulate, so A is kind of a yellow line, and B viruses are shaded in aqua. Um, in some seasons, uh, one subtype is more dominant than the other, um, and they can be, but not always, alternating dominance. So, uh, one season, you might have really dominant B circulation, and the next year, um, uh, a viruses, but that is not always the case. Sometimes you have uh, a pretty good distribution of A and B viruses. Next slide, please. All right, and so this is just um, the same study where I showed you the list of genotypes, um, and this is just the number of samples that were identified of different genotypes in uh, publicly available databases. Um, so 2017 study, uh, Sequences were collected from specimens um, between 1961 and 2014. There were um, just under 1,100 sequences that were studied. The inset shows you sequences that were identified um, from specimens collected between 1961 and 2000. It's in an inset because it has a different scale. It's only up to 25 uh, sequences just because there weren't that many viruses or specimens available to study. Um, and then the, the scale for the, the remainder of the time time frame is larger, it's up to 180. Um, and so really all I want you to see is that, a, that, that each year, again, A and B viruses are co-circulating. Sometimes there's a genotype dominance by year that can increase and then decrease. Um, but there's not really, really, it's not like what we're seeing with coronaviruses, like almost everything in the Northeast currently is circulating uh, XBB.1.5. But you also have to remember that the number of sequences that is being studied here is much, much smaller. Um, and then and the time frames are not as tight. So it's CDC for our genomic viral surveillance. For coronaviruses, we do weekly bins currently. Um, and this is an entire year looking at things together. Next slide. Um, again, historically, genotypes are defined by the G gene because they're the most diverse in the sequence. Um, G and F are targets for neutralizing uh, antibodies, but F has been found to have the most potent neutralizing antibodies. So I wanted to show you the amino acid variability across the genome of the, the F gene. Uh, and this is at the um, protein, well, it's at the, the gene level. This is from that same study examining uh, published sequences of RSV viruses. Um, and it, it shows you the, the linear um, cartoon of the gene, of the F gene, kind of on the bottom with colors, and those colors um, map to the, the bar graph on the top. Um, and it shows RSV A viruses on the left and RSV B viruses on the right. 
kind of have two scales and above the, the, the X axis scale and below the X axis scale, below the scale are synonymous mutations. So what that means are uh, nucleotide changes that do not result in a change in the amino acid sequence. So they're silent mutations, if you remember from basic biology courses. Or non-synonymous mutations are listed on the uh, above the um, uh, x-axis. And those are changes that result in uh, code, code, the code of the amino acid, which would matter uh, for antibody binding to the protein sequence. So those are more important for antibody binding um, antibody binding to the F protein and probably neutralization. And it just shows a proportion of total viruses. So it's on a scale of zero to one. So one, 100%, 0.5 is 50%. Um, and then you can see the gray sections are the antigenic regions. So um, because proteins fold, uh, antigenic regions are not continuous, meaning the amino acids that an that a, um, antibody might bind are not always right together in a gene sequence because they fold around, they can be um, separated whenever you just look at an amino acid sequence across. Um, so if you want to look at site zero, which is the, the target for the most potently neutralizing antibodies, you can see it's just to the uh, right of uh, MPE.8. And then again, immediately to the right, the other half of the antigenic region is just to the right of the area listed as alpha 2, alpha 3, beta 3, beta 4. Um, and so what I want you to see is that there is um, not a great deal of sequence variability in S um, studying these 1,100 sequences. There, there is more sequence variability in the RSV B viruses on the right side of this graph than RSV A viruses. When you look at that site zero, um, there are some non-coding changes in RSV A viruses, but no non-coding changes in RSV B viruses. There are some coding changes, or sorry, there are some changes in the site zero in RSV B viruses. But again, um, the limitations of this data are the limited number of sequences. This um, only looked at a thousand to 1,100 sequences, and just in general, RSV has not been sequenced as heavily as, um, as coronavirus and influenza viruses. All right, next slide, please. Um, so how is CDC planning to do um, genomic surveillance of RSV viruses? We think it's very important to, to start doing genomic surveillance of of RSV viruses to understand seasonality in different regions, understand the circulation of A and B viruses, and then understand uh, the genotypes that are circulating, as well as potential um, changes in the genome that might affect neutralization after um, either uh, vaccination, infection, or treatment with or prophylaxis with a monoclonal antibody product. And so um, one of the core parts of our plans for genomic surveillance is um, our NVSN network. Now, I know we're talking about adults today, but this is a pediatric network. We do have um, some other networks with um, that involve adults as well to just be sort of a check to make sure what we see circulating in children is the same as what we're seeing circulating in, in adults. But there have been lots of community transmission studies that indicate that school-age children tend to drive transmission in most communities. Um, additionally, children, whenever they're experiencing their first or second um, infection, they tend to shed much higher titers of virus, and therefore their specimens, we can recover much um, better sequences than we can from uh, utilizing specimens from adult infection, where they shed less virus because of probably previous infections. So NVSN is, uh, or the New Vaccine Surveillance Network, is a year-round um, acute respiratory illness surveillance. Um, and it started with three sites between 2000 and 2009 and expanded to seven sites um, from 2016 to, to the current uh, time. 
Uh, it's prospective surveillance in inpatient ED and outpatient clinics. It uses PCR testing for multiple respiratory viruses, including RSV. And it has population denominators and market share used to estimate the disease burden. But for our purposes for um, viral sequence surveillance, um, we, we collect really good quality specimens and can do a deep dive on those specimens to look at A, B, genotype, and sequences as well. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so this is just an example of A and B virus distribution across those different sites um, between the 2016-2017 season and the 2019-2020, sort of just before the pandemic season. Um, and what you can see is um, difference between sites. So at some sites, you have um, RSV B virus dominant and versus RSVA virus. These are just part pie charts representing the percent of A sequences versus B sequences viruses. Um, a is being shown in gray, B in blue. Um, uh, sometimes it's fairly equally distributed at all sites. They're co-circulating um, co in each season. Um, and then there's sometimes it's a little bit more uh, homogeneous, like in 2019, 2020, really all of our sites um, demonstrated um, dominance of uh, circulation of our RSVB viruses. And there can be sort of a back and forth, um, like we saw in the Khalifi study of, you know, one year A, A might be a little bit more dominant in the next year um, B, but that isn't always that, always the case. Like, for example, Seattle, we saw two years of A dominance, and then the next two years, it looks like B dominance. All right, next slide. Um, this is just an example of some of the genotypes we saw from just one year. This is actually the 2015-16 season that we saw. Um, and basically, so each site has a different um, uh, color. Uh, the genotypes are listed. Um, a and B viruses, again, we saw A and B viruses both circulating that year. Uh, we saw very similar genotypes. Uh, circulating. We saw a dominance of ON1 across the NVSN sites in this particular season. Um, and then the, for the B viruses, a dominance of BA virus. And uh, they were not really clustered by location. So I know you can't read the words, but you can kind of see the different colors and you can see that the colors intermingle with each other. Um, and so the sequences um, weren't clustered by community, um, indicating the same viruses tended to to be circulating um, across the whole country. So while we saw some sort of regional difference in dominance of A versus B, we didn't see regional differences in the specific viruses that were circulating. All right, and next slide, I believe this is my summary slide. Okay, so in summary, F and G tar are targets of neutralizing antibodies with most potent antibodies directed against F. G is the most heterogeneous gene and is used to identify genotypes. There's less heterogeneity in F, but more observed in B viruses in comparison to A. RSV A and B viruses co-circulate and can show sort of a back and forth season to season, but not always. Um, and NVSN specimens uh, can be used for A and B surveillance, and uh, as well as we plan to use, utilize it heavily in the upcoming years as genomic and viral surveillance. All right, and that is all for me. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sonberg, for this uh, very informative and engaging presentation. Uh, next, uh, Dr. Fiona Havers, uh, who is team lead for ResPnet Hospitalization Surveillance Team, Coronaviruses and Other Respiratory Viruses Division at the National Center for Immunization and Respiratory Diseases at the CDC. Dr. Havers will go over RSV epidemiology <clears throat> and disease burden in older adults. Dr. Havers? Great, thank you very much. I appreciate you having me here today. Um, next slide. Next slide. Um, so today I'm gonna talk about the RSV epidemiology and burden in older adults. Going on to the next slide. RSV is a frequent cause of severe respiratory illness in older adults. While it's very well recognized by pediatricians, there's much lower awareness of RSV in adults among healthcare providers and the public. 
RSV is underdetected as RSV testing is often not performed, even among hospitalized patients. And this is understandable because as of now, there is currently no vaccine or recommended treatment for most RSV cases. Next slide. This pyramid here shows a range of estimates for the burden of disease in adults 65 years and older. From the bottom of this pyramid up, RSV is estimated to cause approximately 0.9 to 1.4 million medical encounters, 60 to 160,000 hospitalizations, and 6 to 10,000 deaths per year. Note the very large range for these estimates. There is substantial uncertainty in the published literature about the burden of disease in this age group. And depending on the source of information, estimates for these three metrics vary considerably. And there are studies that indicate that the disease burden is higher than what is indicated on this slide. But regardless of the source, however, we do know that the disease burden in older adults is substantial. Next slide. Here's the pyramid that was just shown, as well as comparable burden estimates associated with influenza in adults 65 years and older, as estimates using estimates published by CDC. The burden of disease varies annually for both RSV and influenza. Generally speaking, however, based on these estimates, the burden of RSV in older adults is lower than that of influenza, but in more severe seasons may approach the number of medical encounters and hospitalizations that we can see for influenza in some seasons. There are a number of studies that show clinical outcomes among older adults with RSV are comparable to those with influenza. Note, of course, that influenza has a widely used vaccine, and without this vaccine, the burden of influenza would be much higher. Next slide. This graph shows estimates for rates of laboratory-confirmed RSV-associated hospitalizations over four pre-pandemic seasons from 2016 to 2020 by adult age groups. These data come from RSVNet, a CDC population-based hospitalization surveillance system in 12 sites. These rates are shown for 100,000 population. As you can see, hospitalization rates in adults increase with increasing age, with hospitalization rates that are highest in those 80 years and older. However, please note that there is considerable uncertainty around these estimates. These are likely conservative rate estimates, and other published studies put the estimates of hospitalization rates higher. As noted in the footnote, most of these data rely on PCR testing with nasopharyngeal swabs, which is the most common clinical testing performed in hospitals. However, there is evidence from multiple studies that the use of acute and convalescent serology, saliva, or pharyngeal swabs and other testing modalities to identify additional cases, that NP-PCR testing is not as sensitive as previously thought, and that some studies use large multipliers to account for this. But regardless of how rates are determined, it is clear that rates of hospitalizations increase with increasing age and that those in their 70s and 80s are most affected by severe disease, severe RSV disease. Next slide. I did want to point out that the age distribution of hospitalized cases also differs by racial and ethnic and differs by racial and ethnic groups. These data also come from RSVNet, and as you can see highlighted in the red boxes, the median age of American Indian and Alaska Native, Black, and Hispanic patients hospitalized for RSV is younger than, that, than white and Asian Pacific Islander patients. On the left, you can see the proportions by race and ethnicity of hospitalized patients in different age groups. Generally speaking, in younger age groups, there's a higher proportion of Black and Hispanic patients. And as you can see, the proportion of white patients shown in gray increases with increasing age, likely reflecting the age structure of the underlying population. Next slide. RSV also causes a substantial burden of outpatient disease as well. The data on this slide show rates of medically attended visits for RSV in adults 60 years and older over 10 seasons. In this study, investigators tested patients who presented to outpatient clinics with acute respiratory infection and found that 11% had RSV. Among those, 19% had a serious outcome, which the investigators defined as hospitalization, emergency department visit, or pneumonia. Note that there are two lines on this chart, with the higher dash line showing rates in those with underlying cardiopulmonary disease. Rates were nearly two times higher among patients with chronic cardiopulmonary disease compared to, with those without these underlying diseases. Next slide. I did want to touch briefly on the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on RSV in adults. These are case counts of hospitalizations from RSVNet from 2015 through the current season, with pre-pandemic seasons, which generally 
go from October through April are shown in blue. And the 2020-2021 season shown in red. And the 21-22 season shown in orange. And the current ongoing 2022-2023 season shown in green. As you can see, pre-pandemic RSV hospitalizations in adults con consistently peaked in early January. However, there was very abnormal circulation during the pandemic with almost no RSV associated hospitalizations the first year and an atypical surge in the summer and fall of 2021. And then as I think many of us are aware, there was a very severe early RSV season in the fall of 2022 with a large number of hospitalizations in adults. And these peaked earlier than usual in early December, 2022. And that's shown in green on this slide. Next slide. All right, I'm now going to move to talking a little bit more about clinical outcomes and comorbid conditions. RSV is a frequent cause of pneumonia in hospitalized adults. This was shown in one large study, the etiology of pneumonia in the community, which was a multi-center study of patients hospitalized with community-acquired pneumonia. For all patients that met study criteria, extensive testing for multiple pathogens was undertaken. RSV was detected in 3% of adults hospitalized with, with pneumonia, although in this study, 62% of patients had no pathogen detected. Other studies have shown that the pr proportion of those with pneumonia that have RSV to be higher. Regardless, RSV was the fifth most commonly detected pathogen in adults with community-acquired pneumonia. I'd also point out that RSV is a very frequent cause of COPD exacerbations and other respiratory illnesses that would not meet the criteria for this particular study, but that are very frequent causes of hospitalizations in older adults. Next slide. Underlying conditions play a big role in RSV hospitalizations in older adults. We found that an RSV net among adults hospitalized who had laboratory confirmed RSV, almost all, 94%, had a recorded underlying condition, with nearly half having three or more conditions. Cardiovascular disease, chronic lung disease, and diabetes were the three most frequent underlying medical conditions. These are among pa patients who had clinician-driven testing, and patients with underlying medical conditions may be more likely to, to be tested for RSV than those who do not have underlying conditions. But the proportion of patients hospitalized for RSV who have comorbid conditions is very high. Next slide. Comorbid conditions greatly increase the risk of hospitalization. One condition that is clearly associated with increased risk is congestive heart failure. This slide with RSV net data shows population-based rates of RSV-associated hospitalizations among patients with congestive heart failure in blue and those without in orange. Overall, 28% of hospitalized adult RSV cases had CHF, and hospitalization rates were eight times higher in patients with CHF compared to those without. The difference between the groups was larger in those who were 50 to 64 at 14 times higher um, compared with those who were 65 years and older. But even in the, in among the older age group, those who had CHF were 3.5 times more likely to be hospitalized for RSV than um, those who did not. I also wanted to point out that hospitalization rates are not only higher in those with cardiovascular disease and underlying cardiopulmonary disease, but I wanted to point out that RSV has been associated also with acute myocardial infarctions and stroke, as well as, as I mentioned, a frequent cause of COPD exacerbation. Next slide. Immunocompromised adults, including immunocompromised older adults, are also at increased risk of severe disease from RSV including lower respiratory tract infections, ICU admissions, and death. The greatest risk is among lung, lung transplant and hemophilic cell transplant patients, as well as other immunocompromised populations, such as those receiving chemotherapy for leukemia or lymphoma. Incidence of symptomatic illness is high in some of these groups. For example, in two prospective studies of lung transplant patients, the incidence of symptomatic RSV illness was 12% over a two-year period and 16% over a single season, respectively. Severe outcomes are frequently seen in immunocompromised patients with RSV infection. Progression to lower respiratory tract illness is very common, and mortality can be high. For example, in one study of hemopoietic cell transplant patients, mortality is 26% in those with lower respiratory tract infections due to RSV. Next slide. Overall, among all adults hospitalized with RSV, a large proportion are severely ill, as measured by the proportion admitted to the ICU and the proportion who died. In these RSV net data from over three seasons, we see that about 19% of hospitalized patients 
of all ages, of hospitalized adults of all ages, are admitted to the ICU and 4% died. Mortality was highest in those 65 years and older at 5%. However, note that the proportion admitted to the ICU was higher even among younger patients, 18 to 49, reflecting that younger patients hospitalized with RSV are likely to have underlying medical conditions that made them more vulnerable to severe outcomes. Again, RSV net data only reflects those hospitalized with lab-confirmed RSV, and more severely ill patients may be more likely to be tested for RSV. So these data may slightly overestimate the proportion of severe illness, but this has, the numbers consistent with these, these data have been shown in other studies as well. Regardless, it's clear that RSV can and does cause severe illness in hospitalized adults. Next slide. In addition, long-term care facility residents are vulnerable to RSV infection. It's a frequent cause of respiratory illnesses in this population and is well documented as a cause of severe outbreaks in long-term care facilities. For example, one study showed that 13.5% of all residents of a single facility had symptomatic PCR-confirmed illness in a single month during an outbreak. RSV in long-term care facilities also contributes to substantial disease burden and costs in the healthcare system. In an industry-sponsored study using Medicare data to estimate RSV attributable hospitalizations among long-term care facility residents, they estimated that across six seasons, these cost more than $50 million with an average length of, length of stay of 5.3 days and a cumulative hospital stay days of more than 32,000 days over that study period. Next slide. RSV-associated hospitalization in older adults can also result in a loss of functional status in independence. Branch et al. at Rochester did a study in 302 adults aged 60 years and older in two sites in New York State. They collected data on two measures of functional status longitudinally shown in the panel, the two panels in the figure. Pre-hospital measures are shown in blue and up to six months post-hospitalization are shown in yellow. They also looked at the pre-hospitalization living situation and divided the cohort into those living independently on the left, those living with assistance in the center, and then those living in a facility on the right. As you can see, there was a significant change in the activities of daily living, even at six months post-discharge for patients who required assistance or who lived in a facility at baseline. They also found that 14% of patients required a higher level of care at discharge, and that one-third of patients had decreased activities of daily living or IADL scores at six months post-discharge. This loss of independence and functional status is often not considered when assessing the burden of disease in older adults but it is a very important outcome to consider when looking at the epidemiology and the impact of RSV disease in this population. Next slide. In conclusion, RSV is a frequent, often unrecognized cause of severe respiratory illnesses in older adults. There's a high burden of severe disease with some variability across seasons. Hospitalization rates increase with increasing age. Adults with comorbidities, including immunocompromised adults and, long, and also long-term care facility residents, are at risk for severe illness. A high proportion of those hospitalized with RSV have severe, severe outcomes, including ICU admission and death. And RSV illnesses can result in long-term health consequences, including a decrease in functional status and independence. Um, I want to thank everyone. Uh, next slide. I want to thank um, PERPAC for inviting me to speak today, as well as um, to acknowledge people on the slide and thank many others. And I think um, Dr. Thornburg and I are now potentially available for questions. Thank you, Dr. Havers. Uh, Dr. Thornburg, please turn on your camera. And uh, my colleagues on the committee, please use the reaction button to uh, raise hands. Uh, so. <clears throat> So we see, uh, so, so I can invite you to uh, ask your questions. Um, the, I will begin uh, by a question to Dr. Thornburg. What's the hypothesis behind uh, the remarkably higher variability in the G uh, uh, protein or G uh, gene compared to the F when F is the one that is driving much of the neutralization? I know it's more hypothetical uh, uh, realm, but is there a hypothesis behind that? I would have thought the opposite would be true. 
Um, so sorry. So you're you're asking what? Oh, why? Um, my guess if it doesn't have um, if it doesn't have uh, as much of a of a function. So you know, it's got these big mucin-like domains kind of on the side of it. So that's where huge sugars um, are able to bind and, and block parts of the protein. Um, and so I think it's probably a more limited part of the protein that is required for the function of the virus. And any time a virus really requires a protein for its replication cycle, um, it tends to be more conserved than, than other parts of the virus. So my guess is, is just the, the hypervariable regions in G don't really do anything um, in, in the binding of the virus to the cell or the entry of the virus to the cell. Okay. All right. Um, although we didn't see it in the other proteins, but that's, again, a hypothetical consideration. Uh, Dr. Perlman, please uh, uh, unmute and turn on video. Yes. Hi. I have a question for Dr. Thornburg. So we know from the uh, COVID-19 evolution of the virus, SARS-CoV-2 evolution, we watched it evolve both for binding better to the receptor and in response to the immune response. And we also then went back and looked at uh, cold, common cold coronaviruses, which were not thought to change like 229E and found that they had changed as well over many years. So is there any sense, do you have enough information yet to know whether RSV is changing? Is that still, we, we can see all these different genotypes, but is there any directed evolution that's of interest? I don't know. I don't really think our sequencing data is deep enough to say with certainty. Certainly, we have very, very limited sequencing data from specimens collected before 2000. So, um, you know, we do see genotypes sort of emerge and and then decrease in um, in prevalence. Um, but again, the scale of that particular graph, first of all, it's just absolute number of sequences, but it was like 185. And so when you look at that as comparison to the depth of our current coronavirus sequencing, it's 10,000 sequences a week just in the United States alone. Um, and and, um, and and not collected in any sort of systematic way through the last 20 years, the RSV sequences. So I think it's going to be uh, several years, you know, we can, we're working on going back to 15, 16 season to really start generating that data from systematically collected uh, viruses. Um, we just don't have that data yet. Yes, thank you. Dr. Bernstein, please unmute and turn on your camera. Uh, thank you. Um, great presentations, Dr. Thornburg and Dr. Havers. I have a, one question for each of you. Dr. Thornburg, uh, you mentioned how RSV uh, subtypes A and B co-circulate, and you showed a slide that the epidemiology had variability around the uh, country by different seasons. So I wonder, did you, is there, uh, how does the severity of lower respiratory tract uh, disease vary by subtype in older adults? Uh, so um, I don't know about, uh, I don't know specifically uh, in older adults. When subtype um, specific severity has been looked at just in all populations, uh, the data has been conflicting. Some studies have indicated B viruses might um, cause more severe disease. Some some say A. Others are really inconclusive. So I would say um, there's no strong data yet to determine that. Thank you. And Dr. Havers, um, a lot of the epidemiology that you shared was for those older adults that are 65 and up. Um, today's discussion, uh, both both companies today and tomorrow, are studying for 60 and above. Is there does the data apply for 60 to 64 year olds? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I don't know if it's possible to show slide six for my presentation. Um, we actually broke down the different age groups that show that the rates between hospitalization rates between 60 and 64 are, as expected, somewhat intermediate between those 50 to 59 and those 65 to 69. 
Um, I would say that we sort of see a bigger inflection point around 70, 75. Um, certainly, um, adults 60 to 64 are, are hospitalized for RSV, and um, they generally tend to be people that have underlying medical conditions. Um, but it, the hospitalization rates in that age group compared to older adults, like older, older adults, um, is lower. But I mean, it does go up with increasing age, but hospitalization rates really kind of take a bigger jump when you get into the 70s and the 80s. So there is definitely a significant cause of hospitalization in um, the 60 to 64 age range, but it is the hospitalization rates are slightly lower than in those 65 or 75 or 85. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you very much. Dr. Portnoy, please unmute and turn on camera. Great, thank you so much. I'm still trying to digest all of the information that's been presented. There's so much of it, and it's very interesting. I guess my question involves uh, persistence of immunity to RSV. As a pediatrician, um, we also saw a spike in RSV in our children, but we sort of assumed that that was young children who hadn't previously been exposed to it because they were protected by uh, the, the measures used during coronavirus. So it wasn't surprising that we would have an, an, an increased amount earlier in children. To see it in adults also suggests that maybe the immunity is not lasting as long and that they're acting like people who hadn't been previously exposed. Do we have any information about how persistent immunity is and does it depend on which strain of RSV has uh, caused the infection? If I may interject here, Dr. Portnoy, that is precisely what Dr. Talbot will be presenting in a few minutes, durability uh, of, of immunity after natural infection. Is, is, would you be okay waiting on that question? Wait, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Hildreth. Thank you. Um, I have a question for both Dr. Havers and Dr. Thornburg. Dr. Havers, the higher rates of RSV infection in younger minorities was very striking. Can you unpack that a bit for me and help me understand why that would be the case? Yeah, no, that's a great question. It's something that we're looking at very closely at CDC. Um, we have seen that there are higher rates among American Indian, Alaska Native, Black and Hispanic adults compared with white and Asian American and Pacific Islander adults. Um, and as you can see, the median age for those groups were, was younger than for the white and Asian Pacific Islander adults. I think that that is probably related to a higher prevalence of underlying comorbidities in that in those populations compared to white and Asian Pacific Islander adults, as well as socioeconomic status, access to healthcare, and other contributing factors that lead to healthcare disparities. And I think um, I think that that's probably what is causing um, the sort of disparity in both the, the median age and the proportion of hospitalizations at younger age groups, um, as well as population-based rates, which we're looking at very closely now. Um, I would say that the gap between um, the three groups that I mentioned, the, um, Asian Amer the American Indian, Alaska Native, um, Hispanic and Black, compared to Asian um, Pacific Islander and white populations is the disparities are bigger in the younger age groups compared to the older adults. And I think that that's probably because there's sort of maybe more of an equalizing of the number of underlying comorbidities among older adults. But I think that all of the things that contribute to health disparities in this country are also contributing to health disparities as far as the hospitalization. Thank you. And Dr. Thornburg, I was interested to know whether or not there's data to show that neutralizing antibodies to the F protein and G protein can be synergistic. Um, I don't think we have a lot of great data. A lot of the G um, protein neutralizing antibody data has been um, generated just like in different cell types, so in vitro. Um, correlates of immunity have been really difficult um, with RSV in general, and I think Dr. Talbot will be talking about that, but um, uh, th there have been heavy use of um, uh, human challenge models to determine, try to identify correlates of immunity um, for sterilizing infection, sterilizing protection versus symptomatic infection. And um, the, the, the best bet is uh, 
mucosal IgA um, directed towards the F protein, but I don't think they looked at anti-G uh, antibodies in those human challenge models. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Dr. Faken, uh, please uh, unmute yourself. Hi, my question is for Dr. Havers. Uh, you showed us that almost all of hospitalized uh, elderly adults have some underlying illness um, who are test positive for RSV. My question is, do you have any information about whether the reason for that hospitalization is due to an exacerbation of that underlying illness versus an RSV specific lower respiratory tract infection? Um, I think that it varies. I think it can be both. I think that many of these admissions, and, and this has been shown in multiple studies where they had enrollment criteria of patients who came in with DHF exacerbations, um, COPD exacerbations, or acute respiratory illnesses. Um, the one slide that I showed was for people with radiologically confirmed pneumonia. Um, so there is clearly an impact on like straight up pneumonia, but I, but I do know that, I mean, it is a frequent cause of CH, it, it causes CHF exacerbations and it also can cause COPD exacerbations. So I think that it can be hard to tease out. I mean, people often come in with respiratory symptoms, but then that then leads to a CHF or COPD exacerbation or, or exacerbation of their underlying condition. So I think, um, but it, it is, you know, it, there's a direct causal link between the RSV infection and the reason for them being hospitalized. Um, I think that it just speaks to the fact that RSV can cause a range of severe illness, um, both by exacerbating their underlying medical conditions and also causing pneumonia or other sort of lower respiratory tract infections directly. Did I answer the question? Yes, thank you. You know, teasing out these data requires two clinicians adjudicating every case. It's, yeah. it's a major undertaking for this and other viruses. Dr. Pergam. Uh, thanks. This is a question for Dr. Havers. Um, I'm, I'm curious, you know, a lot of the data that you presented um, is sort of pre-COVID pandemic, and I'm curious if you can discuss rates of RSV in adults. Just in relevance to when these studies were conducted, um, rates of, of RSV um, in adults during the period um, of sort of like 20, uh, 2020 through 2022, um, in comparison to prior years, if that data is available, I know that you know time is a little bit challenging to get that in in real time. But I'm just curious as if, if there's data from CDC to discuss that specific time frame. Yeah, we do have that data, and it's actually um, in slide nine. You could see that on what I was presented. I also we also have a dashboard that actually shows multiple seasons, um, publicly available data that shows unadjusted rates. Um, for multiple seasons that you can compare, that you can look at. And we do have, it's clearly hospitalizations were down during the, the pandemic. Um, the rates of laboratory confirmed RSV, even despite the fact that there was probably increased testing for RSV because there was the quad test where people were testing for COVID, flu A and B and RSV. So I think there was probably increased testing for RSV in the pandemic compared to pre-pandemic years. But we did see that there was virtually no RSV in the 2020-2021 season, that sort of standard winter season. It started to go up in the fall of 2021. Um, and we did a year ago see somewhat of an aseasonal, like atypical seasonal increase in hospitalizations. And then we did see in the fall a big increase in RSV compared to uh, um, the sort of two previous seasons. And it was, the, we saw increased hospitalization rates compared to before the pandemic. So there was definitely decreased circulation during the 2021 through 2022 period. And then um, we actually saw uh, more hospitalizations in adults in the fall um, of 2022 than we had in pre-pandemic years. So um, some of it's a little bit difficult to test out since there were changes in testing practices, but I would say that probably there were more patients being hospitalized with RSV um, than last this during the sort of current season in the fall of 2022 than pre-pandemic. So I think, um, and we definitely saw that in children as well. So there is data available on that, and um, I think during the pandemic there was less hospitalizations, and now it's back. Dr. Holly James. Thank you. Um, uh, I think a question for uh, Dr. Havers, um, I, I, you know, understandably given the surveillance, you know, the vast majority of the data you, you presented was on hospitalizations and, and deaths and, and severe outcomes. But, but what do we know about the burden of infection 
um, and how it varies uh, across subpopulations or, or what do the symptomatic you know, data tell us about the, the burden of infection in the population? Thank you. No, that's a great question. I do think that there is a lot of, I didn't present data on symptomatic infections. We, we do know that sort of there's on that pyramid I showed, we have deaths at the top and hospitalizations and medically attended disease. And there's another layer at the bottom where there's probably millions of infections in adults that are symptomatic that don't necessarily require medical care. Um, there's varying estimates in terms of exactly what that is, but that is definitely um, a contributing factor to the overall disease burden, and I, I didn't focus on that, but it should be noted that, you know, there's a lot of people, including older adults, who get RSV. They don't necessarily seek medical care, but it does impact their life for, you know, at least a number of days and could potentially have sort of longer-term sequelae for them if they have underlying lung disease or other, other conditions. So, um, you know, there is a substantial burden of disease among people um, who are getting, you know, feeling sick but don't seek any medical care um, in, in older adults. Thank you. Dr. Kim? Well, good morning. I, uh, first, I'd like to check in as a, as a committee member. Uh, I, I, this is David Kim. I represent the Office of the Infectious Disease and HIV AIDS Policy in the Office of the Assistant Secretary for Health at HHS. Uh, and I have a question for, uh, uh, for Dr. Havers. Uh, regarding, uh, regarding RSV infections generally, how, if, do we have any information, any data on the burden of, uh, of disease as they relate to asymptomatic infections and, their, and asymptomatic, uh, those who are asymptomatically um, infected to be able to propagate, uh, transmit and, and propagate uh, the disease? Um, it, and, and do the current surveillance, uh, surveil surveillance mechanisms allow us to get, collect data on asymptomatic transmission? There have been studies that have done prospective cohort studies where they've swabbed people weekly and detected that there is, there definitely is asymptomatic, there can be asymptomatic infection. Um, I actually would pass that question to Dr. Thornburg to see if, she, if, if um, Dr. Thornburg wants to comment on that as well. Yeah, um, so when I, I mentioned earlier those human challenge models where it's young, healthy adults, not older adults, so clearly it's a, a, a little bit different. Um, so in, in young, healthy adults in the human challenge model, they've found that if you have a group, uh, enroll a, a group of participants and, and give them RSV, about half of them become infected um, as, as assayed by RT-PCR diagnostics. And of the half that um, become infected with productive detectable virus in the nose, uh, half of those patients have cold symptoms and half don't have cold symptoms. And they're, and they're all almost always mild, but you know, just because of this population, they enroll very healthy people. If I may, uh, uh, is there any, has there been any speculation on what the R not uh, factor might be uh, for RSV compared to, um, compared to other infectious causes? I don't know that. Fiona, do you know that? I don't have a good number off the top of my head that I could quote on that. I think it's it's hard to measure, um, but I, I think it's probably somewhat similar to, I'm not going to say that are not as similar to SARS-CoV-2, but the sort of epidemiology of there being a fair amount of like asymptomatic transmission and infection is probably similar. And then, you know, the tip of the iceberg is people getting symptomatic and severe disease, but it is a very frequent cause of respiratory illness every year in the population. And so I think that, I think that's hard, but I, I, I don't have, uh, reliable source that I can quote off the top of my head for for the R not. Yeah, and just as far as like repeat infections go, I know I know this isn't what you asked, but you know people periodically get reinfected throughout their lifetimes, and I think I've seen numbers ranging ranging from it's typical for a person to get an RSV infection every like five to ten years. Well, thank you, Dr. Sornberg, Dr. Havers, uh, for these uh, two presentations and answering these questions. I would like to now invite Dr. Talbot, Dr. Keith Talbot, Associate Professor at Vanderbilt University Medical Center in Nashville. Dr. Talbot will uh, uh, inform us on the durability of naturally acquired immunity and susceptibility to repeated RSV infections. Dr. Talbot. Good morning, thank you for inviting me. 
I'm, I'm glad to see a lot of questions popped up early in the other talks about the durability and reinfection. And so hopefully I can answer some of those. But as Dr. Thornburg pointed out, most of the challenge studies um, have been done in young healthies, um, probably because of the ethics of um, challenging an older adult. All right, so to begin with, we're gonna talk a little bit. Next slide. Okay, am I able to move them or will I? That's a question to Mr. Bonner. Can, can Dr. Talbot move or do you move? No, okay, the answer is no, which is All fine. Right. I just need to know. All right, so we'll talk about an overview of the immune response to infection. We'll talk about pre-existing immunity. Please remember that almost everyone was exposed to RSV as a child. So all the infections that we will be discussing in adults will be reinfections. And I'll mention that multiple times. We'll talk about infection in an adult. So what we see um, is our risk factors and what antibodies look like. We'll also talk about this in frail older adults. We'll talk about the durability of immune response. And we'll also talk about the proximity of reinfection. Next slide. Next slide. So this is a very, very busy slide, but it's really just to highlight that RSV enters through the respiratory tract. And because there's some pre-existing immunity due to prior infection, there's um, quite the breadth of immune responses from innate to antibody related. Um, there's definitely a neutrophilic, a dendritic, uh, a lymphocyte, response, but then this is also um, complemented by RSV IgG in the serum and uh, pulmonary or nasal IgA. I want to point out here briefly that interferon gamma has a strongly protective response, and that'll be important later as we talk about immune responses in the elderly and the reason that RSV is so successful at reinfection. Next slide. Next slide. So this is a cohort that was done that looked at pre-existing immunity in younger adults compared to older adults. There were 30 in each age group. The median age for those that were young was 26 years of age, and those that were older were 74 years of age. Specimens were drawn from these adults between May and June, so after and before an RSV season. And this was to grasp what is the pre-existing immunity prior to an RSV infection. All participants were medically stable, which means no hospitalization within the last two months. So these are not the extremely frail or the ones with uncontrolled or unstable medical problems. Next slide. This slide summarizes the antibody responses, both serum or plasma IgG and nasal IgA. What will you see in part A is that the young and elderly have similar levels of neutralizing antibody titers. You will also see that the young and old, remember these are healthy older adults, have similar F-specific plasma IgG. And if you look at part D, you'll see that when it comes to RSVF, and total IgA, the young and elderly have similar amounts found in total nasal wash. Next slide. However, for what we see in antibody responses, there's a significant difference when it comes to interferon gamma. These slides show the interferon gamma responses to different proteins um, in A and B, and then the CD4 responses based on interferon gamma. What you will see will be a marked difference in the young and the elderly, with the elderly having much less of an immune response. And remember, these are much less of an interferon gamma response. And these are fairly healthy older adults. Next slide. 
So what level of pre-existing immunity is consistent with risk of infection? So this is one of those challenge studies that Dr. Thornburg mentioned. This one included 61 healthy adults, 18 to 55 years of age. They were all challenged with live RSV and serum and mucosal antibodies were measured pre and post infection. So this was looking at what levels of antibodies would predict um, protection. 36 of those, so over half became infected. So remember, they've all seen RSV before, yet still 36 became infected. And of those, 28 were symptomatic, or 68% were symptomatic. Next slide. So this shot, this slide shows the pre-existing humoral immunity and the risk of infection. Those that are uninfected are in the white circles, and those that are infected are in the dark black circles. The top two graphs show anti-RSV IgA and anti-F protein IgA. So these will be nasal antibodies. And what you see is that there's a lower level of IgA in the infected compared to the uninfected. The bottom slide is the serum neutralizing antibody. You'll see the RSV naive infants on the far left with little to no serum neutralizing antibody, uninfected in white, and infected in black again. And what you see is that there's very little difference between the serum neutralizing antibodies between those infected and uninfected. So the main difference is in the nasal IgA. Next slide. So this is a peak into duration. We'll talk a little bit more about duration, but in that same cohort, they looked at antibody responses pre and post RSV infection zero days before inoculation, 28 days post-inoculation, and 180 days or six months after inoculation. And what they see is pre-existing antibodies for almost everyone with a rapid rise after infection, but unfortunately a decline back to pre-infection levels at six months. So just to point out, that means prior to the next RSV season, antibody levels were at the level that they were prior to the infection seen here. Next slide. So infection in frail older adults, what do we know? So Ann Falsey's group looked at a cohort of frail elderly adults. So these are actually frail and they were followed over a 26 month period. And during that 26 month period between 1992 and April, 1994, there were 28 RSV infections that were diagnosed. Because they followed this group prospectively, they had antibody levels pre and pre infection. And what they saw, the mean neutralizing antibody levels were lower in those that were infected compared to those that were uninfected. Next slide. So we'll talk about the durability of the immune response. So we saw previously that antibody levels fell. Um, within six months to pre um, level. So this was another study that was done in young and older adults, and this is a representative sample. So this occurs in both older and younger adults. What you'll see in the dark black line is the micronutrialization assays and the gray or enzyme immunoassay to the F protein. The dark arrows are time of infection. So you will see at time of infection that there is a rise in antibody levels in both the micronutrialization and the enzyme immunoassay. But then those levels once again fall um, rapidly. So next slide is the proximity of infection. So this comes from a nice review paper from Dr. Graham and it talks about reinfection. And there's one key component of the RSV virus that helps it reinfect. And one of them is it suppresses the interferon mediated antiviral responses. We did see earlier that older adults have a less um, effective and less responsive interferon gamma response. And so this also predisposes them to more infection. There's also something that we don't quite understand is the failure to protect against reinfection. Dr. Thornburg nicely outlined the genetic diversity of the F protein. Um, it does somewhat change, but nothing like HIV, COVID, or 
influenza, other RNA viruses that would explain the reason for failure to protect against reinfection. Next slide. Next slide. Thank you. So this is one of those hallmark studies in RSV. It was then um, and published in 1991. Um, Carolyn Hall um, was the lead author, and she has led many of the early RSV work, um, along with Ed Walsh and Ann Falsey at Rochester. So they took 15 adults that had been naturally infected with RSV, and they challenged them on a regular schedule with RSV to see if they became reinfected and if they became symptomatic. So they actually took them two months after natural infection and exposed them and challenged them with RSV. They did it at four months, eight months, 14 months, 20 months, and 26 months. You'll see in this slide at two months, 47% of them were infected. This was the highest rate of reinfection after that, rates were lower. And you almost wonder if it wasn't because there was natural infection and then two months later, RSV, that they may have developed a higher immune response, resting or pre-existing. Of those that were infected at two months, 85% of them were symptomatic. And please remember, these were not necessarily elderly adults. Next slide. So how often can a person be infected? Turns out quite often. Of those that were in the study, 10% were reinfected at least once in the 26 month period. 47% of them were infected at least two more times after natural infection. And as we mentioned, the highest reinfection time point was at the first challenge at two months. Next slide. So the main takeaways that are incredibly important for this are that natural RSV infection does not provide durable or complete protection from reinfection. Anti-RSV antibodies return to pre-infection levels within six months after infection. And reinfection can occur as early as two months after the last infection. Older adults have weaker interferon gamma responses to RSV than younger adults, liking, likely making older adults more susceptible to infection and to severe infection. Each of the authors summarized their papers in the discussion talking about likely the need for annual immunization. They all responded that, that, that vaccines would provide some protection, but like natural infection would not be durable or complete and that likely annual vaccination would be necessary. Next slide. <clears throat> well, thank you so much, Dr. Talbot. That was uh, very informative, and I hope it began to answer some of the questions posed uh, by the committee members uh, a little earlier. Um, I would now invite uh, the committee members to use the raise hand function for questions uh, to Dr. Talbot. And I will begin by asking a question regarding cellular immunity. Um, you have uh, shown us data that a major difference between young, and adults, uh, young adults and older adults uh, is the um, cellular uh, antigen-specific responses. However, in the subsequent uh, challenge models and uh, natural infection models, that was not looked at. And um, so any idea on, on, on the role of, of the cellular immunity as we uh, progress in age and susceptibility to infection? Yeah, that's a great question. I think one of the reasons there have not been good cellular data is that these studies were done in the 90s. Um, and there have been some done more recently, um, but one of the problems with cellular immunity is the standardization of it across laboratories, and how do you use that? As we age, immune senescence actually changes multiple arms of the immune system. Some are upregulated and some are downregulated. 
And so it is likely that multiple arms of the immune system working would be beneficial to prevent infection. Um, there is little data, however, on that. Um, and I think it would be a great area of study. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Pergam. Dr. Talbot, um, that was a great review. Um, I appreciate um, the data. I was just curious, can you, can you remind us um, if there is any cross protection for, say, uh, an adult who gets a A strain of, of RSV versus a B, and whether that has a, a relevance in terms of how we're thinking about the, the vaccine studies that we're evaluating today. Yeah, there's not a lot of really great descriptive work um, in adults, especially older adults, about cross immunity. There's posh There are some assumptions that there would be, but there hasn't been a great description of it. And um, are you familiar with any cohorts uh, in hospitalized elders uh, looking at? their cellular responses to the virus? No, unfortunately not. I know of some that are underway, but not okay. <laughs> yet done. All right, maybe on your next uh, presentation, we'll hear about those. Any additional questions to Dr. Talbot? I see Dr. Bernstein, but I don't see his hand. Do you have a question? Okay, Dr. Bernstein. Great talk, Kip. Thank you very much. I, I just... Uh, how is immunosenescence measured by the different age groups as like Fiona mentioned about 60 to 69 and then 70 to 79 and then 80 plus, and then you fold in, uh, uh, you know, uh, chronic medical conditions. How do they measure immunosenescence? Welcome to the world of adult medicine, Hank. Um, it's very complicated. <laughs> um, so yes, unfortunately, immune senescence is not necessarily due to just age. Um, and so you can have a healthy, fit 80-year-old who does not appear to have a lot of immune senescence and then have a 60-year-old who appears to be very immunosenesced. There have been attempts to measure that. Um, looking at CMV levels, looking at frailty, looking at other um, endpoints in um, immunity. And there hasn't necessarily been a consistent way that's been accepted by everybody, which makes the study of vaccines even more difficult in this age group. There is increasing immune senescence with age but age does not necessarily tell you how immune senesce a particular person is, which makes it more complicated. And I forgot and the second the, half of your question, Hank. <laughs> well, that, yeah, no, I, I knew it was gonna be a little gray. Um, where, how does one fold in frail patients then uh, when thinking about if age is in everything and, underlying medical conditions, where, what's the definition of a frail individual? Yeah, a frail individual is one that is lacking residual. So any minor insult um, can cause great illness and also loss of independence and loss of um, daily activities. Um, the way to study frail older adults is to enroll them in randomized clinical controlled trials. Unfortunately, if you're a frail older adult, you may not be driving, you may not be leaving the house, you may not be doing extra visits out of the house. So participating in clinical trials can be very difficult. And there are a few places in the U.S. that do it well. It's great if you can take a bus to them <laughs> and do the study in their setting. So there's actually not a lot of good data in those frail older adults because they do not necessarily participate in studies. We see a lot of very healthy seniors who participate in Senior Olympics and read to the blind and do all kinds of fabulous things because they're out and about. So that's a huge area that needs investigation. What percentage of residents in long-term care facilities are considered frail? I do not know the exact number, but very high. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Dr. Perlman. 
Yeah. So I just have a question about one of the pieces of data that you presented. So when you talked about uh, reinfection at two months after uh, the previous infection, so do you, is there any information in those tr uh, the, those trials from any immune correlates or virus loads? Is it really just zero protection at two months, or do you think that uh, something else is going on? Could this be immunopathological? Could it be lower virus loads and more immune responses? Yeah. Um, so obviously the study did not, I shouldn't say obviously, in the early 1990s, late 80s, there wasn't a lot of PCR used for viral detection. Um, and so these studies actually use viral culture um, in serologic responses to determine infection. So we're lacking a lot of that data. Why these particular people were susceptible at two months is unclear. And is, are those studies going to be repeated? Or are they being repeated now that we're doing more human challenge studies? I don't know. Um, and so there's kind of two questions to that. One is, can we repeat it in young adults with some of the newer techniques, cellular immunity as doc, um, and immune responses such as antibodies and PCR in addition to culture would be phenomenal. The second question is, how do we obtain that data in the older adults, the ones that are most likely to be hospitalized in our state? Thank you. Dr. Griffin? Hey, I'm Marie Griffin. Hey, Kip. Nice talk. Um, yeah, it sounds like there, from your talk, there's no real correlate of protection. Do we know anything else about um, how you would measure protection, or is there any other data on correlates of protection? Yeah, not that I saw, and it's really hard because in the vaccine world, we tend to use serum, <laughs> IgGs, or correlate. Um, and as you notice, it wasn't the best predictor of who would be infected compared to the nasal IgA. Um, so I think that's going to be a work in progress. Yeah, more, more importantly than, I guess, uh, a virus that's capable of infecting young, healthy adults every two months, if you expose them fully, is understanding the correlates of protection from severe disease, which, which yes. doesn't seem to be just antibodies for sure. And I think one of the things, too, is if you can prevent the cold or the RSV upper respiratory tract infection, you will likely also prevent the severe disease but knowing where that cutoff is will be incredibly important. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you, Dr. Talbot. Uh, great ideas for a lot of research projects for you. Um, next on the agenda is a 10 minute break. Uh, it's 10.17 now. Uh, so let's reconvene at 10.27. Recording stopped.
Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome back uh, to the uh, first day of our uh, RSV vaccine meeting, 179th meeting of the VRPAC. Uh, <clears throat> our next session is the sponsor presentation. Dr. Alejandra Gut uh, Gurtman, who is the Vice President of Vaccine Clinical Research and Development at Pfizer, uh, we'll go over the safety and efficacy of bivalent RSV prefusion F vaccine in adults 60 years of age or older. Dr. Gurtman. Thank you, Dr. Sally. Good morning, members of the committee, FDA, and ladies and gentlemen in the audience. It is a real pressure to be here today. I am Dr. Alejandra Gurtman. I'm an adult infectious disease specialist and Vice President in the Vaccine Research and Development Group at Pfizer. I would like to thank the FDA for organizing this BRPAC and the BRPAC Chair and members for their time. It is my privilege today to present to you Pfizer's RSV Prefusion F Candidate Clinical Development Plan in the context of our request for licensure of the vaccine. We are seeking the following indication. Prevention of acute respiratory disease and lower respiratory tract disease caused by respiratory syncytial virus in individuals 60 years of age and older by active immunization. The vaccine presentation is 120 micrograms without an adjuvant. Each dose contains 60 micrograms of each prefusion protein antigen in a 0.5 ml injection. The presentation is a lyophilized vial with a water for injection in a pre-filled syringe. The vaccine is to be stored at 2 to 8 centigrade and used within four hours after reconstitution. My presentation today will follow this agenda. After I provide a brief introduction on the unmet medical need, I will review the RSV Prefusion F vaccine Prefusion F candidate development program for our vaccine, including clinical safety and clinical efficacy data. After this, I will review our pharmacovigilance plan and the benefit risk, and will provide conclusions for my presentation. RSV infection is common with nearly all children infected before the age of two. Repeat infections can occur through life. Although RSV typically causes cold-like symptoms, some persons are at higher risk for serious illness from RSV, including infants, children, and younger adults with certain conditions like chronic lung or heart disease. Older adults are also at high risk for serious illness due to RSV, which is either caused by the virus itself, bacterial superinfection, or deterioration of already existing chronic medical conditions. In fact, in the US, the burden of disease is substantial among adults 65 years and older, with RSV estimated to cause between 60,000 and 160,000 hospitalizations and between 6,000 and 30,000 deaths. Yet, despite the burden of disease, treatment remains a supportive care and there are not approved target prevention options to date. After more than 50 years of RSV research and vaccine development efforts, groundbreaking structural work by the National Institute of Health elucidated that RSVF on the virus exists as an unstable prefusion form. As shown on the left of the cartoon, RSVF is anchored on the surface of the virus where it fuses the viral and host cell membranes during cell entry. This fusion process is a result of a dynamic and irreversible change of F from its metastable prefusion conformation to a stable postfusion conformation. Only the prefusion form on the virus can bind to human airway cells resulting in the virus entering the cells where it can replicate, causing illness. Antibodies specific to the prefusion form are most effective at blocking virus infection. The Pfizer stabilized prefusion F vaccine candidate is substantially more immunogenic compared to F antigens not stabilized in the prefusion form. Shown here from early studies in non-human primates, 
we can see a 50-fold higher neutralizing titers with a stabilized pre-fusion F vaccine candidate than a post-fusion F candidate. So what was our rationale for a bivalent RSV pre-fusion F vaccine? Historically, RSV vaccines targeting F had been monovalent with sequence based on the RSV A subgroup. This is largely based on the high level of sequence identity between RSVA and RSVB F proteins, as well as the high levels of F based cross neutralization between the A and B subgroups. However, the sequence variability between RSVA and B F proteins, highlighted in blue on the structure on the slide, localized to the prefusion specific site zero. A bivalent RSV vaccine containing one prefusion F construct, each from the RSV A and B subgroups, could elicit more balanced immunity to the two subgroups, which we have shown in both preclinical and clinical studies compared to other monovalent prefusion F vaccine candidates. A recent analysis of global RSV epidemiology supports the Ontario RSV A and Buenos Aires RSVB remain dominant genotypes and are the basis of Pfizer RSV pre-F bivalent vaccine. We also know that RSVA or RSVB viruses can dominate from season to season, and both subgroups are associated with severe disease outcomes. For the rest of the presentation, I will refer to this vaccine candidate as RSV pre-F. Our older adult clinical development program is comprehensive and includes adults 18 years of age and older in six different studies. We conducted two phase one, two studies that included older adults with those region, with those region absence and presence of aluminum. And the second study included CPG aluminum as an adjuvant. The early phase studies also included arms with and without influenza vaccine. We demonstrated that the addition of aluminum increased local reactions and did not have any immunological benefit, and the addition of CPG aluminum did not show any benefit either. Displayed here are RSV neutralizing geometric mean titers and geometric mean fold rises for RSV subgroups A and B in participants 65 to 85 years of age. Neutralizing antibody titers and GMFRs are shown for the final RSV pre-F selected dose of 120 micrograms without aluminum from our phase one, two study at one, six, and 12 months after vaccination comparing to pre-vaccination titers. GMFRs of 9.8 for A and 8.5 for B were seen one month after vaccination. Neutralizing antibodies decline through the first 12 months, but remain 3 to 3.8 fold higher at 12 months after vaccination compared to before vaccination, indicating good antibody persistence. In the study where we evaluated CPG aluminum, all RSV pre F vaccine candidates elicited robust serum neutralizing responses when administered with influenza vaccine as you can see on the left graph of the slide. There was no notable difference in neutralizing response between the formulations, including those containing CPG aluminum. No difference in T-cell response between those levels or with and without CPG aluminum was observed one month after vaccination. This study was important because our preclinical data with CPG was promising, but as I just show you, in humans, the inclusion of CPG aluminum showed no substantial benefit in enhancing the immune response compared to RSV pre-F formulations with aluminum at any dose level or compared to RSV pre-F alone. Based on these two studies as I shared, we demonstrated that RSV pre-F was highly immunogenic in a non-adjuvanted formulation and adding aluminum or CPG confer no immunological benefit, and the formulation without aluminum had fewer local reactions. The final dose selected was 120 micrograms containing 60 micrograms of A and 60 micrograms of B strains without an adjuvant. And before initiating the large phase three study, 
We decided to evaluate the safety and efficacy of the final dose and formulation selected in a human challenge study. An RSV pre F immunization was highly effective against symptomatic and asymptomatic RSV infection and shedding of the infectious virus in healthy adults. Before we get into the results listed here, let me just begin by delivering background information. There were 70 participants, 18 to 50 years of age, randomized one to one to receive RSV pre F or placebo. And approximately 20 days after injection, participants were inoculated intranasally with an RSVA virus and observed for 12 days. Vaccine efficacy of 86.7 was observed for symptomatic RSV infection confirmed by any detectable viral RNA on at least two consecutive days. Vaccine efficacy of 100% was observed for symptomatic RSV infection confirmed by any quantifiable viral RNA on at least two consecutive days. And efficacy against RSV infection, regardless of the presence, absence, or severity of symptoms, was 75% for any quantifiable RT-PCR results on two consecutive days. In addition, RSV pre F elicited large increases in neutralizing titers and a substantial increase in the RSV F specific CD4 T cell TH1 response at one month after immunization. Again, in the study, the vaccine was safe and well tolerated. After we completed the human challenge study, we moved to three phase three studies, including a clinical low consistency study a concomitant flu administration study with a high-dose adjuvanted flu vaccine, and the phase three pivotal study, which will take most of the remaining of my presentation. In summary, and before starting our phase three pivotal study, we were able to show that RSV pre F induced high levels of neutralizing titers, and the addition of aluminum or CPG did not provide any immunological benefit. The vaccine was highly efficacious in protecting against symptomatic respiratory disease in a human challenge study, and these results allow us to obtain FDA breakthrough designation. And a single dose, bivalent, and adjuvanted RSV pre F subunit vaccine had a good tolerability and safety profile. So, with this data, we initiated the Renoir study, which is our vaccine safety and efficacy study in older adults. This is a global phase three study designed to evaluate efficacy, safety, and immunogenicity of the Pfizer bivalent prefusion F subunit vaccine for two seasons. The Renoir study is being conducted at 240 sites in seven countries, including the US. The study was targeted to enroll up to 45,000 participants 60 years of age and older. Participants were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to receive either RSV pre F or placebo. The placebo is an exact match without the protein and without this and with the same excipients. Randomization was stratified by age. Participants were eligible if they were healthy or have stable chronic conditions, including stable cardiopulmonary disease, diabetes, asthma, or COPD. Those with an immunocompromised, immunocompromised condition were excluded. And the study was designed to cover two RSV seasons. As you know, in the US and in many countries, RSV has been a seasonal disease. And the study was conducted during the COVID pandemic when RSV, the RSV season became unpredictable. We started the enrollment in August of 2021 when RSV was circulating. In each of the countries where the study is being conducted, we have different methods to follow the RSV system from the beginning of the season to the end. Regarding safety monitoring, a subset of participants completed a daily e-diary to monitor local reactions and systemic events for seven days after vaccination. When we look at all participants, unsolicited adverse events were captured through one month after vaccination in all participants, and serious adverse events and newly diagnosed chronic medical conditions are captured through the end of the study, which, as I mentioned, covers two seasons. 
all participants undergo active surveillance for acute respiratory illness by completing a weekly e-diary, which I will describe to you in a few minutes. Finally, a subset of participants have blood draws at three pre-specified time points to assess immunogenicity. Now, I would like to turn your attention to the objectives of the study for safety. The objective was to describe the safety profile of the RSV pre vaccine. The primary efficacy objective was to demonstrate the efficacy of RSV pre in preventing RSV-associated lower respiratory tract illness with at least two or at least three signs and symptoms in the first RSV season following vaccination. There are several secondary efficacy objectives, including efficacy against first episode of RSV-associated acute respiratory illness during the first season, and efficacy against severe RSV-associated LRTI in the first season. Additional objectives include efficacy of the vaccine in the second season and across two seasons. The focus of today's presentation is safety and efficacy against lower respiratory tract illness and acute respiratory illness in the first RSV season after vaccination. Before I go to how the cases have been captured, I will cover some important statistical considerations. As with many vaccine efficacy studies, Renoir was designed as a fixed event trial. The analysis I'm presenting today was a per protocol pre plan interim analysis. And for the endpoints I'm presenting today, this is considered the final analysis. We have agreement with regulatory agencies on the licensure criteria, including vaccine efficacy with a lower bound of at least 20%, as well as agreement on the case definitions for RSV associated lower respiratory, RSV associated acute respiratory and RSV-associated severe illness. We have adjusted the type 1 error for this interim analysis. Participants complete a weekly active surveillance diary from day 15 until the end of the season 1. If a participant experiences an acute respiratory illness, such as nasal discharge, nasal congestion, sore throat, cough, sputum production, wheezing or shortness of breath for more than one day, he or she is prompted to collect a mid-turbinate nasal swab, optimally on day two or day three after the onset of symptoms, but within seven days from the day of onset. The electronic diary communicates with the investigational site to potentially initiate a respiratory illness visit, which could be performed as telephone, telehealth, clinic, or home visit. In-person visits are conducted if the investigator deem it is necessary for the participant to be seen in person, and if this is the case, an additional nasal swab is collected. Finally, the swabs are shipped to the Pfizer Central Lab for PCR testing. To understand how cases are captured in the study, I will describe the key study definitions once a participant completes an acute respiratory illness assessment for the symptoms I just mentioned to you. Lower respiratory tract illness is defined as an acute respiratory illness with at least two or at least three signs or symptoms of new or worsening cough, sputum production, wheezing, shortness of breath, or tachypnea. And severe LRTI is defined as a lower respiratory tract illness has at least one of the following objective criteria, hospitalization due to RSV, new or increased oxygen supplementation, and new or increased mechanical ventilation, including CPAP. I will not be presenting today an analysis on severe illness as we did not accumulate enough severe cases at the time of this analysis. A case definition of RSV associated ARI or RSV-associated LRTI is made when a participant has at least two or at least three signs and symptoms or severe illness and a positive validated RSV-PCR test. I will now present the interim analysis results of the study starting with enrollment and demography. 
we enrolled more than 35,000 subjects and 34,284 were included in the safety database. The RSV, Brief, and placebo groups were balanced when looking at sex, race, ethnicity, and age. Please note that approximately 38% of participants are over the age of 70, and the age range is the age range is 60 to 97 years, years old. Of note, one participant was 59 years old. In terms of pre-specified high-risk conditions, this data includes all participants, and approximately 50% of all participants had at least one pre-specified high-risk condition. 15% in each group had at least one chronic cardiopulmonary condition, and about 19% in each group had diabetes. I am now excited to share with you the safety results. Let's start with local reactions by maximum severity within seven days of vaccination, which were more frequently reported in the vaccine group than in the placebo group at 12.2 versus 6.6% .6 respectively. The most frequent, re frequently reported local reaction was pain and the injection site, followed by redness and swelling. Both reactions were reported in a low percentage of participants. Most local reactions were mild, lasted one to two days, and resolved. Systemic events are shown on this slide by maximum severity within seven days after vaccination. As you can see on the left, the proportion of participants who reported the systemic event within seven days were similar in the vaccine and placebo at 27.5 and 25.7% respectively. The most frequent reported systemic events were fatigue, headaches, and muscle pain, and were similar across the groups. Fever rates were very low at 1.4% in each group. There was only one grade four event of a fever of 40.1 centigrade on the day of vaccination in a participant who is in the placebo group. Most systemic events were mild or moderate and of short duration. Not seeing much difference in safety when compared to placebo should potentially encourage uptake of the vaccine in the future. And for unsolicited adverse events from vaccination through the one month follow up visit, about 9% of participants in each group reported any adverse event. The frequency of related, immediate, severe, and life-threatening adverse events were similar in the vaccine and in the placebo groups. At the bottom part of the table, you can see that newly diagnosed chronic medical conditions were also similar in both groups. There were three SAEs deemed by the investigator to be related to the vaccine, and I will present them to you in the next few slides. Adverse events leading to withdrawal from the study or leading to death were also similar in the vaccine and placebo groups. Adverse events leading to death were reported in 52 RSV pref recipients and 49 placebo recipients. The primary cause of death most frequently reported were in the system organ class of cardiac disorders none of the deaths were assessed as related. As I just mentioned, three RSV PREF recipients reported serious adverse events assessed as related by the investigator. The first was an allergic reaction seven hours after vaccination, which resolved on day five. It was deemed to be a delay allergic reaction and not anaphylaxis. I will describe the cases of miller fisher syndrome and guillain syndrome on the next slide. A participant from Japan experienced initial symptoms of fatigue and ataxia on day nine after vaccination, followed by bilateral ophthalmoparesis, a lumbar, punct a lumbar puncture, or electrophysiological studies were not performed. She was seen by a neurologist several weeks later when the neurological event was resolved and a retrospective diagnosis of miller fisher syndrome was made. Please note that she had a sore throat infection treated with antibiotics that preceded the event. This case meets level four of the Brighton collaboration, which means that there is insufficient evidence to meet this diagnosis. 
A participant in the U.S. developed Guillain-Barre syndrome on day eight after vaccination and one day after presenting with a non-ST myocardial infarction requiring angioplasty. His CSF and electrophysiological studies were consistent with Guillain-Barre syndrome, and therefore this case does meet Brighton collaboration level one, which means that it's a high diagnosis certainty of this diagnosis. The miller fisher syndrome and the Guillain-Barre syndrome cases both had potentially confounding factors and occur in an age group that has a higher incidence of the disease. All these cases were evaluated by our external DMC who did not identify any safety signal. Please note that after the data cut off, two cases of Guillain-Barre syndrome were reported from the study. The first one received RSV pref eight months before and was assessed by the investigator as not related. The second event occurred 14 months after vaccination and this participant is in the placebo group. This case was also assessed by the investigator as not related. As I mentioned before, all serious adverse events from vaccination through the data cut off for the interim analysis were reported equally in both groups with no significant differences. The most common system organ class for the reported serious adverse events was cardiac disorders followed by infections and infestations neoplasms, or nervous system disorders. In conclusion, the interim analysis for the Renoir phase three pivotal trial demonstrated that rsv pref was safe and well tolerated. Local and systemic events were mostly mild to moderate and shortly. There were no difference in systemic events between those who receive rsv pref and those who receive placebo. The adverse events profile did not suggest any safety concerns for the RSV pre vaccination in adults 60 years of age and older. Considering that the vaccine was well tolerated and there are no differences in adverse events between RSV pre vaccine and placebo groups, this data should potentially encourage uptake once the vaccine is approved and recommended. I would like now to turn your attention to the efficacy results. At this time, at this pre-plan analysis, when looking at RSV-associated LRTI, defined by at least two symptoms, there were 11 cases in the vaccine group and 33 in the placebo, with an observed efficacy of 66.7%, with a lower confidence interval of 28.8%. For those who had at least three symptoms, there were two cases in the vaccine group and 14 in the placebo group, resulting in vaccine efficacy of 85.7%, with a lower confidence interval of 32%, indicating an even higher efficacy against those who have worse symptoms. Both primary endpoints met licensure criteria. This slide shows the cumulative case accrual curve from day of vaccination for RSV-associated LRTI with at least two or more symptoms. The blue line is the vaccine group and the gray line represents the placebo group. Vaccine efficacy is shown after day 15 and persists for at least six months, sufficient to cover a typical RSV season. And similarly, this is the cumulative figure for RSV-associated LRTI with at least three or more symptoms. Vaccine efficacy also persists for at least six months. To further characterize the clinical presentation, those who have at least two or more symptoms presented mainly with cough and sputum production, as you can see on the left side of the table, versus those who had at least three or more symptoms who had a clinical presentation with more wheezing, shortness of breath, and tachypnea, which is shown on the right. And in this group of those who have at least three or more symptoms, where vaccine efficacy was higher, there were four participants who had a diagnosis of pneumonia or bronchopneumonia, resulting in two hospitalizations and four cases diagnosed as bronchitis, all requiring corticosteroid treatment. All pneumonia cases, including the two hospitalizations, were in the placebo group. 
I will now share vaccine efficacy analysis in those with at least two or more symptoms at the top, or at least three or more symptoms at the bottom of the slide. You can see that efficacy was consistent across the different subgroups, including age, and those with pre-specified high-risk conditions. When looking at those with three symptoms at the bottom, you can see that consist you can also see consistency in vaccine efficacy. For subjects 70 and 80 years of age and older, vaccine efficacy was high, although for each subgroup, the numbers are small and the confidence intervals are wide. When looking at RSV associated acute respiratory illness, those presenting with at least one symptom lasting more than a day, RSV pre F was also efficacious with a case split of 22 cases in the vaccine group and 58 in the placebo group for an observed vaccine efficacy of 62.1% with a lower confidence interval of 37%, indicating that RSV pre F also protects against less severe illness, primarily upper respiratory disease. On the right side, you see the cumulative curve for acute respiratory illness where the turquoise is the vaccine group and the gray is the placebo group. Please note that at the time of this analysis, not all swabs were tested for acute respiratory illness, and therefore some of the results can change in the future. Again, we can see vaccine efficacy after day 15 persisting for at least six months, sufficient to cover a typical RSV season. It is important to look at vaccine efficacy by subgroup A, and B, across those with at least two symptoms or more on the top, at least three symptoms or more in the middle, or just at least one symptom or those with RSV associated acute respiratory illness at the bottom, and vaccine efficacy was consistent for both subgroups A and B. As you can see again here, some of the numbers are low and the confidence intervals are wide. I would like now to share our analysis of those participants who sought medical care because of their illness and not because of the study, representing true healthcare utilization. Several types of visits could be reported by a participant, including any outpatient or inpatient visit, such as emergency room, urgent care, home health care services, primary care physician office visit, a pulmonologist or a specialist office visit, telehealth, or hospitalization. Taking those medically attended visits prompted by the participant and looking at vaccine efficacy based on the first episode of RSV-associated lower respiratory tract illness with at least two or more symptoms, at least three or more symptoms or RSV-associated acute respiratory illness that were medically attended you can see the vaccine efficacy ranges from 65 to 80%, with confidence intervals above zero. And why is this data important? Uh, the data is important because RSV pre F has the potential to prevent up to 100,000 emergency room visits, 34 to 136,000 hospitalizations, and 250,000 to 845,000 RSV associated acute respiratory illness outpatient visits. This is based on the burden of disease and healthcare utilization in those 65 years of age and older, and assuming that RSV pre F was approved and recommended, and also provided that the uptake was high since the vaccine is well tolerated. In conclusion, RSV pre F was highly efficacious in reducing RSV associated lower respiratory tract illness in adults 60 years and older, and also in reducing RSV-associated acute respiratory illness in this age group. The study is ongoing and we anticipate having additional data in the future. I will now turn your attention to the pharmacovigilance plan. Pharmacovigilance activities are a critical component of activities to detect unexpected safety events rapidly. Pfizer will conduct robust pharmacovigilance activities and collaborate with regulators and international groups. Our pharmacoepidemiological studies will include older adults in order to evaluate the safety of the vaccine and possibly rare adverse events. In our plan, 
we're including a post-marketing study to further assess guillain barre syndrome and immune-mediated demyelinating conditions, which has been requested by the FDA. And finally, let's look to our encouraging assessment of benefit risk. More than 17,215 adult participants aged 60 years of age and older receive RSV pre-F 120 micrograms in the pivotal phase three study. No important identified safety risks were detected. Local reactions and systemic events were generally mild to moderate in severity. Adverse events, including related adverse events, newly diagnosed chronic medical conditions, and serious adverse events were similar between the RSV pre F and the placebo groups. None of the deaths were considered vaccine related. And overall, RSV pre F was well tolerated in adults 60 years of age and older. And from a benefit perspective, RSV pre F was 66.7% efficacious in preventing RSV associated lower respiratory tract illness with at least two symptoms or more. 85.7% efficacious in preventing RSV associated lower respiratory tract illness with at least three symptoms or more in the first RSV season after vaccination. In addition, efficacy was 62.1% against first episode of RSV associated acute respiratory illness in the first RSV season after vaccination. In conclusion, the pivotal phase three study provides robust evidence that RSV pre F is well tolerated and a safe vaccine with a favorable safety profile. The vaccine is highly efficacious in reducing RSV associated lower respiratory tract illness and efficacious in reducing RSV associated acute respiratory illness. The benefit to risk ratio is highly favorable and supports the proposed indication which is prevention of acute respiratory disease and lower respiratory tract disease caused by respiratory syncytial virus in individuals 60 years of age and older by active immunization. We at Pfizer wish to thank our clinical trial participants without whom we wouldn't be here today. All of our sites, investigators and their dedicated staff we're also grateful for the guidance provided by the FDA and other regulatory bodies. We, thank, we want to thank our colleagues at Pfizer and other companies for their tireless work and dedication to develop our RSV pre vaccine candidate. This concludes my presentation. Thank you for your attention. I am happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. Gertman, for going over the data. I would like to invite uh, the committee members to uh, raise a uh, hand uh, in, in, in Zoom uh, should they have questions, uh, understanding that there will be also another opportunity to deliberate further. I will kick us off by kind of two related questions. Uh, one pertaining to co-administration with influenza. Uh, the uh, the sponsor indicated in their briefing document that in the phase one study, there was interference uh, in their co-administration phase one study. There was interference in responses to influenza vaccines when the product was uh, co-administered with uh, inactivated the uh, flu vaccine. Uh, and the, uh, the sponsor uh, has since designed and implemented a study looking in um, at, at the co-administration question, and the study is fully recruited. And there was also an expansion in one of the earlier studies where co-administration with influenza was uh, was a was an endpoint. Uh, can you um, uh, enlighten, help us uh, understand further the interference with influenza uh, vaccine responses, and why weren't these data um, from from the additional studies presented? And that would be sort of a safety question there. So thank you for the question. Um, uh, you are correct. In our phase one, uh, two studies, we did look at um, potential interference with flu vaccine, but the studies were not power, actually a stone inferiority study. So it's just, uh, it was a trend. And um, this is one of the reasons why we are now conducting a study in this age group with the high dose and attributed a flu vaccine, which, um, as you mentioned, it has been fully enrolled and the results are going to be um, available very soon. And 
um, we will be submitting this data to uh, the FDA to hopefully be able to include a co-administration in the label. And, and the related question is that uh, the, the study, the pivotal study is a two season study. Uh, and the second season is almost over now. Uh, is there, uh, again, a rationale for not uh, presenting the study data in its totality so that sort of the deliberations and the uh, decisions are more informed? Yeah. So um, uh, thank you for the question. I have additional data that I would like to share with you. This data actually just became available and it was submitted to the IND, but it has not been yet reviewed by the FDA. So at the end of uh, season one, and I'm going to come to season two in a second, if I can please have the slide with the new efficacy. Yeah, if we can bring slide number two. I, I would like to orient you because this is now the totality of the data for end of season one. And um, on the slide on the left, you can see end of season one, and I want to walk you, and on the right is the interim analysis. So everything that is on the right is the information that I just presented to you. Now that we have completed end of season one on all the PCR testing, you can see that vaccine efficacy actually has been maintained. And in fact, when you look side to side, for example, for those who have three symptoms, um, you see that what I mentioned was vaccine efficacy of 85.7 with a lower confidence of, uh, of 32. Now vaccine efficacy, now that we have 20 cases with a split of two in the vaccine and 18 in the placebo, vaccine efficacy is 88.9% with much tighter uh, confidence intervals, right? And the lower confidence interval at 53.6. And I use that as an example because that's where the uh, vaccine is very highly efficacious. But even if you look at those with um, ARIs um, <clears throat> and compare side to side, um, you see that the confidence intervals actually are much tighter. And on the first line, what is the uh, acute respiratory illness, um, which excludes, right? So we excludes those who have two and three symptoms. It's only looking at those who have at least one symptom. Vaccine efficacy now is 60% with a confidence interval, um, the lower confidence interval of 33%. So um, I'm happy to show this. I also have Kaplan Meyer Corps if the committee would like to, to see. Um, so that's the totality of data for season one. With respect to your second question, because of what happened with the COVID pandemic and RSV circulation, we are uh, about to complete season two. And that data will be uh, coming, you know, soon uh, once we're able to do all the PCR testing. <clears throat> I hope uh, I answered that question, right? But uh, our colleagues at CDC presented the data of how the season now is, the second season is ending. And I understand. Uh, I mean, your study that. is appropriately a multi-season study and uh, seeing the data at the completion of the study would have been, uh, at least in my opinion, more informative. Uh, regardless, uh, we will take questions from our committee uh, colleagues. Dr. Berger. Dr. Berger, please unmute. I see. Right. Sorry, it takes a little bit for it to undo everything. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gerben. I, I, I just have a pretty simple question. I, I was struck by the persistence of uh, neutralizing titers through 12 months that you showed um, compared to what we saw in the earlier data uh, related to natural uh, immune response. Um, I, I realize that the numbers of in, infected individuals that you have in your study are pretty low, but I'm curious if you were able to see any rates of reinfection um, or if that was assessed at all in the study. Yeah, so in this particular study, the one, if I can bring please slide number one, which is a slide that I presented um, earlier with um, this study is actually um, obtains immunogenicity after vaccination at different time points. Uh, but we have not collected in the study. This comes from the phase one, two actually cases. Um, and so I, I am not able to answer that question with respect to this study, but in the new, in the study that I'm presenting today, we also have immunogenicity um, and immune responses, and we see a very robust immune response. And um, there is no reason to think that the immune, um, that the immune response will persist for at least um, 12 months, offering potentially uh, protection for, for the season and even longer. 
Thank did you. That answer, did that answer your question? Yeah, no, that, that, that does. Thank you. Dr. Portnoy? Great, thank you so much for that presentation. One, one of the uh, concerns that I have, and one of the reasons why uh, previous RSC vaccines apparently have not been available until now is the risk of enhanced disease. Patients who get immunized and then when they get the disease, it's actually worse. Uh, in fact, there was an FDA advisory panel that discussed that very issue a number of years ago. Did you observe any cases of enhanced disease and if not, did you take any specific actions to try to avoid that? Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Porner, for the question. Um, we recognize that the nature of enhanced disease is really focused on circumstances where one is immunizing naive populations, right? We have seen that in in a pediatric population. Um, but in the study, you know, individuals who are in the 60s, 70s, and 80s had a lifetime of experience with RSV. So the, um, the, the chance of having enhanced disease is actually pretty remote. And in fact, what we see in the study is the opposite, is that we are able to protect you know, the population, even in those who are 80 years of age and older. Um, so we have not seen any enhanced disease and we were not expecting with this um, uh, formulation and the pre-F confirmation in this particular population who has been um, already very experienced with RSV to see any enhanced disease. Okay. Thank I look you. forward to hearing what you find with younger populations. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Kim. Well, thank you. Thanks very much for that presentation. Um, yeah, in your presentation, you mentioned a number of severe and life-threatening adverse events on post-vaccination active follow-up. Um, we're talking um, uh, these these reported events at numbering in, in, in dozens, several dozen. And, and you also discussed three relevant cases that you identified as being, uh, as being uh, of interest. Um, one case of Guillain-Barre syndrome, another case of, uh, of uh, Miller-Fisher, and another case of anaphylaxis. Of the remaining uh, severe and life-threatening adverse events, were there other conditions that you uh, that you and your colleagues felt needed additional discussions and uh, and, and had um, had uh, and proceeded to adjudicate the the, the uh, adverse event that was reported uh, to determine uh, uh, its relevancy for reporting for uh, for today's uh, presentation. Um, and I, and I have another question, but uh, but I'll go back to the end of the line uh, for the second question. Thank you. If I can please bring slide one to the screen. So when you look at um, you know any of the adverse events, and you look at um, in blue is the vaccine, and in gray is the placebo, uh, we have no differences in adverse event reporting between the two groups. Um, to other the other part of your question, we did not see any immune-mediated um, conditions that could have been related to the vaccine, and we have not seen any other events actually uh, of concern except for the ones that I mentioned to you. And that's one of the reasons why we have an assessment that the vaccine is actually very well tolerated and safe. Um, with respect to, let me, let me um, maybe pause here and, and ask if I answer your question. Uh, I'm asking for details on some of these uh, some of these most serious uh, adverse events that have been reported, and how that uh, and the process that, that you went through to eliminate them uh, from uh, uh, from being associated with the with the vaccine. I mean, it, I understand that, that that you adjudicate the matter, but uh, were were there others that caused that gave you a pause? Um, in terms of, uh, because these are severe, and as you as you said, these are life-threatening conditions. Yeah, so um, if I can please bring to slide number two, um, where you have serious adverse events from uh, vaccination, and now is through the data cut off, right? So initially presented the, the one month. This is now through the time that we um, completed uh, the package to submit to the FDA. And as you can see, the most common SAEs were cardiac disorders, infections and infestations, neoplasms and nervous system disorders. And there are almost no differences between the two groups. And, and uh, we have every event that is reported to us is properly assessed. 
and its query when there are questions that may, you know, we may need to answer. And each of the essays have been properly assessed um, by uh, my colleagues uh, at Pfizer, and we have not seen any event that uh, will make us pause, um, to, to use the words that you were asking, uh, of, of uh, any concern. Dr. Bernstein? Yes, thank, uh, thank you. Um, I appreciate the informative presentation and I also appreciate I had uh, similar questions that Dr. Sally asked about co-administration with flu and uh, or COVID vaccine and also presentation of efficacy over the two seasons because it seemed the data that we reviewed was only the one. So I re appreciate your responses. I, I was wondering whether in fact, the uh, GBS or inflammatory uh, neuropathy might be a safety signal and whether in fact it exceeded the what would be the background or expected rate. Yeah, so thank you for the question. I am going to ask uh, one of my colleagues, um, Scott Kelly, uh, from our safety epi group to uh, come and answer the question in terms of observed versus um, expected. Hello, Scott Kelly, Global Medical Epidemiology. Thank you for your question. Um, Pfizer, we did conduct a review of the literature for the background rate. Um, to note, there is a lot of variability and heterogeneity for incidence of incidence rates of GBS, which they vary by age group, gender, pre-existing conditions, region, and temporality. As, as long as along with the case definition. In general, the background rates range from about 1.8 to 7.8 events per 100,000 person years. Um, I'll stop there for the background rates. If there's any questions there, I'll move on to the observed versus expected um, results. Okay, I'll proceed. Um, so whether using any of the various background rates in the range I provided. You know, again, the, the ranges from the lower end using um, a case definition where it's neurologist confirmed studies in a systematic review by Shavar in 2011 that included, I think, roughly 16 studies were on the lower end of that range, whereas additional newer data that included administrative claims data, as well as elect electronic health records, which again, the case definition varies whether you're using a more um, specific um, instance rate where the criteria requires that the primary position in the record um, signifies GBS, um, as well as in the inpatient setting. Those are more on the higher end of that range I suggested. No matter which instance rate is used from the studies, um, the observed versus expected is above one. However, there's a lot of uncertainty in those estimates, which is exhibited by very wide conference intervals. Um, you know, while the trial was very large, um, you know, proper assessment of any potential signal and refinement, you know, is best conducted in post-marketing studies with large databases with millions of patients or more to properly assess um, any potential signal for RSV in the vaccination. Thanks. Thank you. Dr. Griffin. Do Dr. Griffin. Yes, thank you. My question was also about the Guillain-Barre. I mean, it, um, it seems to me that, you know, no matter what the background rates are, you have to think in terms of the rate within a few weeks rather than within a year. So if it's one to seven per 100,000 person years, it's much lower for within three to four weeks. So it seems to me that one case is a red flag 
um, two cases is very concerning. And it's concerning to me that Pfizer doesn't think that there are any safety concerns. Yeah, so um, uh, thank you for the comment. Um, I fully agree that, you know, when you use, for example, Brighton collaboration uh, to assess potential relatedness of a vaccine is the 42 days um, that has been uh, widely accepted. Uh, in these two particular cases, there were confounding factors. Um, the the Miller Fisher syndrome had a, a infectious, um, you know, um, presentation a few days prior to the presentation, and the Guillain Barre syndrome um, had the myocardial infarction the day before he started with back pain. Um, so, and they're both in an age group, right, where uh, Guillain Barre is um, already has a higher incidence. So, we are going to be conducting a post marketing um, um, study to assess actually Guillain Barre and uh, other potential demilinating conditions. And that study is being currently discussed with the FDA. Dr. Feiken? I hope I'm saying your name right. Please yeah, it, it's it's pretty close. Um, <laughs> I, I have a a, a question, a two part question uh, related. Um, the, the first is, I wasn't exactly clear uh, how vaccination uh, was related to the RSV season in this study. What was it? Was it was vaccination timed um, to to um, occur? close before onset of, of, of a typical RSV season? And what's the spread of, of, of time from vaccination to RSV season onset? And then the second part of the question is, uh, I saw in the immunogenicity plots that you, you get the highest uh, titers of neutralization about a month after vaccination, uh, followed by some slow decline in, in neutralization. And I was wondering if you uh, you showed a cumulative incidence curve out to a year, but it seemed like really no cases were occurring after six months. So within that first six months, were you able to, st to stratify your uh, efficacy based on, on time since vaccination? Yeah. So uh, thank you, Dr. Feigen, for the question. Um, uh, to answer the first question, um, as you know, um, COVID pandemic really disrupted the RSV season. Um, and last year we had this interseasonal RSV that, that was uh, on, a, on the summer. Um, the, the season in the United States was, uh, as I mentioned, the study was initiated in uh, at the end of August of 2021 and the season, during the season. And we, um, we, we started in September um, of 2021, and the season went to July 2022 in the Northern Hemisphere. And in the Southern Hemisphere, it was from June to October. Um, I do have a slide with the course, but that's I think if that answers the question in terms of seasonality, we conducted the study when RSV was circulating in both the Northern and the Southern Hemisphere. Um, with respect to your second question, I would like to show you the new Kaplan-Meier curves, uh, which I can bring, please, slide. Um, uh, I don't have the slide with the new Kaplan-Meier for the two and three symptoms, if my colleagues can bring that up. So now that we have finished the season, um, as I mentioned before, and we have the data that was not available at the time that the briefing document was written. If I can please bring slide uh, one to the screen. You have now a complete season and you can see vaccine efficacy against LRTI with two symptoms on the left and three symptoms on the right. And the, um, you know, on the bottom you had the RSV vaccine and the dotted line is the placebo. And you can see persistence um, uh, well, immune response, but actually protection uh, through a longer period of time. So the immunogenicity um, that I show you, which, which shows some decay um, to through 12 months, uh, seems to still be protective through a longer period of time. Did I answer your question? I think so. So, so the curves continue to separate through 270 days. 
Um, yes, <clears throat> correct. Thank you. Dr. James. Thank you. Um, somewhat, my question is somewhat related to the prior question. Um, you know, you, you mentioned that the immunogenicity data has been generated for this phase three study. Um, what uh, work has been done or is planned in terms of evaluating um, those immunological measures as correlates of protection? And, and here I'm thinking both of measures um, at or, or near the, the time of infection, as well as um, measures uh, after vaccination. Um, and and, I, and I, I'm thinking also in particular of the, um, both the humoral and, and ideally the cellular immune responses that were um, discussed in, in prior talks as, as uh, potential correlates of, of risk in, in, in terms of natural, natural infection. Thank you. Yeah, uh, so thank you for the question. Uh, we know, as it was presented today, that natural history studies um, in older adults show clear relationship between the neutralizing antibodies and protection, but we don't have yet a correlate of protection. If I can please bring slide number one. So this is data, again, that uh, just became available very recently and has been submitted to the IND, uh, but has not yet been reviewed by the FDA. Um, but this that is are the titles actually from the current Renoir study. So just to orient you on the slide, we have um, immune responses. So we have GMTs and GMFRs. Uh, on the very left is by type A and B. In the middle is by age, by decade of age, so 60 to 69, 70 to 79, and more than 60. And on the right, you have those with and without chronic cardiopulmonary conditions. And as you can see, the GMFRs for any of these groups actually uh, is uh, 12, 11.6, 12 and above. Um, and, um, and it's pretty important to see that in the decades, you know, going from decade to decade of life, uh, we still see very uh, high levels of neutralizing titers. And so therefore, um, with knowing that neutralizing um, antibodies are the ones that probably confer protection. And now seeing that the vaccine is almost 89% efficacious against uh, those who have more severe disease, uh, we have full confidence that, that uh, when we see this implemented and instituted, you know, recommended, um, and the uptake is, is good, that we will be able to see uh, the same eff efficacy that we saw in post-licensure effectiveness studies. Um, if you have a more specific question about cellular immunity, I'm not sure if I if I answer your question or you have more questions about cellular immunity. Well, I, I guess a basic question, has cellular immunity been characterized in this study? Thank you. Dr. Jane's question was, uh, did, the, did the investigators measure CMI during the study in the immunogenicity subset? Cell mediated. No, in the phase three, we did not do um, cellular immunity studies. We only had them in the prior studies. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Kim, uh, you know, the sponsors, CDC and FDA, are, are going to give us uh, an hour of their time after lunch break. Do you want to ask now or save for later? Because I'm sure a lot of us have a lot of questions remaining. Yeah, uh, to if stay it on track. Let me uh, maybe, maybe ask this question to uh, uh, to Doctor uh, to to the Pfizer sponsor. Um, the I was looking at your projected annual community uh, benefit model with some interest, um, and it's a, it's a powerful uh, and impactful slide. Um, and it contained uh, something of a sensitivity analysis for, uh, for vaccine uptake ranging from 25% to 100%. And, uh, and, and given that you, uh, that you presented demonstrating, uh, that, that you also presented a slide that demonstrated high, but also declining levels of neutralizing antibodies over time, does the model, or is there another model that also accounts for the declining duration of protection uh, particularly over your uh, two-year observation period, that, that that might give us a, a more realistic sense of, uh, of what the impact might be? 
Um, I, um, I, I'm not sure if I heard the last part of the question. I, I apologize, the audio wasn't good. So if you don't mind um, repeating that. I, I, I got the first part, but not the, the question itself. Okay, so it's uh, it's simply a question of whether uh, whether there's a whether this model uh, of the community benefit uh, that you presented also in, uh, in, um, yeah, well whether it, can, it includes um, uh, the declining duration of protection uh, as a as a, a variable uh, for for analysis uh, to demonstrate the uh, projected annual community benefit, um, particularly over a two year observation period. Yeah. So um, now I understand the question. Thank you. I'm going to call uh, my colleague Brad Gessner from uh, the Medical and Scientific Affairs Group uh, to come and answer the question. Uh, thank you. Hi, uh, Brad Gessner from Medical and Scientific Affairs. Yeah, just to comment, um, there's a variety of models. Some of them are, are more simple and some of them are more robust. Um, so if you look at the NNVs, for example, the duration of protection is just taken as two years. Um, so when you're calculating that, it's just dividing by two. And if you want an NNV that doesn't have that, then you can multiply that by um, two. Right. So the cost effectiveness model, though, takes a uh, seven month. It's seven months. It goes from the efficacy that it has and takes a straight linear decay down to 24 months. So hopefully I, I answered your question. I can, uh, I'm not sure that there's a slide, but you can maybe go to slide one. That is the slide that goes through the data that you were referring to that looks at um, the projected cases averted by the percent vaccinated. So, but the, the formal cost effectiveness model, which incorporates all of those data, and I, I'm sure you know that there's lots of different variables that go in there um, and that there's a wide range that has been reported as the colleague from CDC mentioned. So depending on those values, those will change as well. So it's not just the duration, but your specific question on whether we modeled uh, declining efficacy, yes. And it was modeled over a two year decline as a linear decay. Thank you. Thank you, uh, which um, I think uh, these are all the questions to the sponsors for now. Uh, there will be opportunity to ask additional questions after the break. Um, Next, uh, we have Dr. Nadine Pert Akindeli, a medical officer at the Division of Vaccines and Related Products Application at CBER. Dr. Pert Akindeli will be going over the FDA review of efficacy and safety of a Bristol RSV vaccine in adults 60 years of age and older. Dr. Pert. Uh, please unmute. You're still on mute. Okay. Sorry about that. Good morning. Uh, my name is Nadine Peart, and I'm a medical officer from the Office of Vaccines Research and Review Division of Vaccines and Related Product Applications. Today, I'll be presenting the FDA review of the efficacy and safety data submitted to support the biologics licensing application of Abrisbo, the candidate RSV vaccine. Next slide, please. This is the outline for today's presentation. I'll start by providing an introduction, then we'll discuss the clinical studies submitted to the BLA, as well as the efficacy and safety data supporting the application. I'll finish by summarizing the pharmacovigilance plan and finally summarize the data and present the questions for the advisory committee voting and discussion. Next slide. Starting with the introduction, next slide. Abrisvo, or RSV pre-F, is a candidate RSV recombinant stabilized prefusion subunit vaccine composed of equal parts of RSV pre-F from subgroups A and RSV B. It is administered intramuscularly as a single 0.5 ml dose containing 120 micrograms of antigen. The applicant's proposed indication for RSV pre-F is prevention of acute respiratory disease and lower respiratory tract disease caused by RSV in individuals 60 years of age and older by active immunization. Next slide. Now I will discuss the clinical studies submitted for FDA review. Next slide. 
The data from six clinical studies with RSV PREF were submitted to support the biologics license application. The primary data to support the safety and efficacy of RSV PREF in individuals 60 years of age and older is from an ongoing multinational phase three randomized double blind and placebo controlled trial study C361013. Please note that I will be referring to the study as study 1013 throughout this presentation. In this study, 34,284 participants, 60 years of age and older, were randomized to receive a single dose of RSV PREF or placebo to evaluate the efficacy and safety of RSV PREF. The study is being conducted, conducted in 240 sites in the US, Canada, Finland, Japan, the Netherlands, South Africa, and Argentina. Although the remaining studies will not be discussed in detail in today's presentation, I will briefly summarize the five other studies submitted. Study C361014 was a phase three lot to lot immunogenicity study conducted in the US intended to support manufacturing consistency. The study met the predefined study success criteria for demonstration of similar immune responses across three lots of RSV PREF. The safety database included 745 healthy adults, 18 through 49 years of age, who received one dose of RSV PREF. There were no serious adverse events, no deaths reported in the study, and no concerning safety events were observed after FDA review. The remaining phase one and phase two studies submitted were conducted in the US, UK, and Australia. The majority of these studies either did not include the target study population and or did not use the final study product. These studies evaluated the safety and immunogenicity of RSV PREF in adults ranging from 18 to 85 years. From a safety database of an additional 1,982 participants enrolled in the four remaining studies, no safety concerns were identified after FDA review. Next slide. As mentioned, study 1013 was designed as a phase three efficacy and safety study. Participants were enrolled and randomized one-to-one -to, -one to receive either RSV PREF or placebo administered intramuscularly. Of note, the placebo used in this trial consisted of excipients matched to those used in the RSV PREF vaccine formulation minus the active ingredients. The physical appearance of the RSV PREF vaccine and placebo were similar. The study was designed to assess primary efficacy endpoints during the first RSV season and is planned to be conducted over two RSV seasons. Randomization was stratified by age and the target enrollment was at least 6,000 participants that were six through 69 years of age, at least 6,000 participants that were 70 through 79 years of age, and at least 800 participants that were 80 years of age and older. Participants enrolled included both healthy adults and those with stable chronic diseases. Starting 14 days post-vaccination, participants were actively monitored for acute respiratory illness, or ARI, and lower respiratory tract illness, or LRTI symptoms. Regarding safety monitoring, a subset of participants in the US and Japan were included in the reactogenicity subset and monitored for solicited local and systemic reactions through seven days post-vaccination whereas all participants were monitored through one month post-vaccination for unsolicited adverse events and through the entire study duration for newly diagnosed chronic medical conditions and serious adverse events. The study used a data monitoring committee or DMC to review unblinded cumulative safety data throughout the study and the interim analysis for efficacy. The DMC was independent of the study team and included only external members. Next slide. This slide shows the overall planned timeline for the study with highlights of key study dates. The study was initiated on August 31st, 2021. After informed consent, a subset of participants underwent a pre-vaccination blood draw and all participants received the study of intervention as randomized on study day one. After vaccination, study monitoring was initiated with monitoring of local and systemic solicited reactions for seven days post-vaccination in a subset of participants as described, and for unsolicited adverse events or AEs for one month in all participants. As mentioned, serious adverse events or SAEs and newly diagnosed chronic medical conditions or NDCMCs will be monitored throughout the study end. 
Active surveillance of ARI and LRTI symptoms was initiated in all participants starting 14 days after vaccination. Additional blood sampling occurred in all participants at one month post-vaccination and again in the immunogenicity subset at the start of season two. The red star on the timeline indicates the data cutoff for the analyses included in the BLA submission of July 14th, 2022. At the time of the data cutoff, 66.3% of study participants had completed season one surveillance. This included all participants enrolled from the United States, Canada, Finland, and South Africa. As of the data cutoff, the median duration for follow-up for efficacy and safety was approximately seven months. Please note that the analyses of immunogenicity endpoints had not yet been conducted at the time of submission and were not uh, yet reviewed. Immunogenicity analyses that were included in the end of season one analysis will be reviewed by the FDA at a later date. Next slide. As shown in the previous slide, starting 14 days after vaccination, all participants were actively monitored for onset of acute respiratory illness or ARI symptoms. Participants met criteria for ARI if they experienced at least one of the following, new and increased sore throat, nasal congestion, nasal discharge, wheezing, sputum production, cough, and shortness of breath. And participants who met criteria for ARI were instructed to self-collect mid-terminate nasal swabs optimally on day one to two after um, onset of symptoms. An illness visit was to be conducted within seven days of onset of symptoms. The swabs were collected by the study site and sent to the laboratory for RT-PCR testing for RSV. Lower respiratory tract illness associated with RSV or LRTI-RSV was defined as ARI with at least two or at least three LRTI signs or symptoms lasting more than one day during the same illness with confirmed RSV infection by RT-PCR. Signs or symptoms for LRTI included new and increased wheezing, sputum production, cough, shortness of breath, and tachypnea. Note that the first four symptoms are also included in the criteria for ARI as previously mentioned. Next slide. The primary efficacy objective evaluated the efficacy of RSV pre-F to prevent RSV-associated LRTI in the first RSV season. Vaccine efficacy against LRTI with at least two or at least three symptoms were the first and second primary endpoints respectively and evaluated sequentially. The primary efficacy objective for the study was considered met if the statistical success criterion was met for the first primary efficacy endpoint of vaccine efficacy against LRTI with at least two symptoms. Success criterion for the study was that the lower bound of the confidence interval for the vaccine efficacy against LRTI with at least two symptoms is greater than 20% at either the interim or primary analysis. The study was designed as an event-driven study with the primary analysis planned to be conducted after accrual of 59 valuable first episode LRTI cases with at least two symptoms. An interim analysis for this endpoint could be conducted after accrual of at least 29 first episode LRTI cases with at least two symptoms. If there were 15 or more first episode LRTI cases with at least three symptoms, the second primary endpoint would also be evaluated as part of the interim analyses. The study specified that if success was achieved for the primary objective at the time of the interim analysis, the interim analysis will be considered the primary analysis for the study and the planned primary analysis would not be conducted. For this study, an interim analysis was conducted after 44 first episode LRTI cases with at least two symptoms had accrued in the first RSV season using the cutoff date of July 8th, 2022. There were 16 first episode LRTI cases with at least three symptoms using the same cutoff date. Therefore, the interim analysis of the second primary endpoint was also conducted. Next slide. A key secondary endpoint was to evaluate the vaccine efficacy against severe LRTI RSV or SLRTI RSV starting 14 days after vaccination. SLRTI was defined as meeting LRTI criteria plus at least one of the following um, listed criteria, including hospitalization due to LRTI, new or increased oxygen supplementation, and new or increased mechanical ventilation, including CPAP. If there were at least 12 valuable first episode SLRTI cases in the first RSV season, 
then this secondary endpoint would also be evaluated at the interim analysis. The minimum number of first episode SLRTI cases had not accrued as of the data cutoff, and therefore the secondary endpoint was not included in the interim analysis. Another secondary endpoint was to evaluate vaccine efficacy against ARI RSV starting 14 days after vaccination. A preliminary descriptive analysis of these endpoints was included in the interim analysis. Next slide. At the time of the data cutoff and submission to the FDA, additional planned secondary objectives were to evaluate vaccine efficacy in preventing LRTI, SLRTI, and ARI at each RSV season and across two RSV seasons following the vaccination. To evaluate immunogenicity as measured by neutralizing and binding antibody responses from one month post-vaccination through the end of season two. And to evaluate the rates and descriptions of LRTI-associated healthcare resource utilization. These analyses were reported to be conducted with the end of season one analysis and or at the end of study analysis and will not be discussed in today's presentation. Of note, all participants in study 1013 currently remain in blinded follow-up. Next slide. The populations that were identified in the study included the safety population, which was the population used for analyses of safety and included all enrolled participants who received the study intervention, the modified intent to treat or efficacy population, which included all participants who were randomized and received study intervention, the evaluable efficacy population, which was the population used for analyses of efficacy and included all study participants who met criteria of being eligible for the study, having received study intervention to which they were randomized, having completed follow-up through 14 days post-vaccination, and having had no major protocol violations before the symptom onset date of the confirmed ARI or LRTI case. And the e-diary subset safety population, which was the population used for analyses of solicited safety, included all participants from the reactogenicity subset who received the study intervention and had at least one day of e-diary data transferred. Next slide. Now I will discuss the efficacy data submitted. Next slide. Of the 35,971 enrolled participants, 34,383 were randomized to receive RSV pre-F or placebo. The MITT efficacy population included a total of 33,987 participants. The evaluable efficacy population used for the primary analyses of efficacy included a total of 32,614 participants with 16,306 RSV pre-F recipients and 16,308 placebo recipients. The percentages of participants excluded and reasons for exclusion from the evaluable efficacy population were similar between the two treatment groups. The most common reason for exclusion occurring at a rate of 4% in both groups was efficacy surveillance duration of less than 15 days mostly due to participants receiving the vaccine after or less than 14 days before the efficacy cutoff date. Next slide. This slide and the next few slides that follow will summarize the demographics of the participants in the evaluable efficacy population. Overall, the demographic characteristics were similar between the vaccine and placebo groups. As you can see, the study population was equally distributed between male and female participants. The majority of participants were 60 through 69 years of age, approximately 32% were 70 through 79 years of age, and approximately 6% were 80 years of age or older. Overall, the majority of participants were located in the US. Next slide. With regard to race and ethnicity, across both groups, the majority of participants were white and non-Hispanic or Latino. Next slide. The majority of participants in the evaluable efficacy population had one or more pre-specified at-risk condition, the most common of which was diabetes. Approximately 15% of participants had one or more chronic cardiopulmonary condition, the most common of which was asthma. Overall, the proportions and types of at-risk conditions were balanced between the RSV pre-F and placebo groups. Next slide. Shown here are the analyses of the primary efficacy endpoints of vaccine efficacy against LRTI with at least two or three symptoms. 
As of the cutoff date, there were 44 cases of first episode LRTI with at least two symptoms with onset starting 14 days after vaccination. The case split was 11 cases in the RSV pre group compared to 33 cases in the placebo group with a vaccine efficacy of 66.7% and a lower bound of the 96.66 confidence interval of 28.8%. This met the pre-specified study success criterion. There were 16 cases of first episode LRTI with at least three symptoms with onset starting 14 days after vaccination. The case split was two cases in the RSV pre group compared to 14 cases in the placebo group with a vaccine efficacy of 85.7% and a lower bound of the 96.66 confidence interval of 32%, again meeting the pre-specified study success criterion. As mentioned earlier, as of the data cutoff, the median follow-up for efficacy was approximately seven months. Among participants in the invaluable efficacy population, 66.3% had completed season one surveillance, including all participants in the US. Next slide. Here, the cumulative case accrual curve for LRTI with at least two symptoms starting the day of vaccination in the MITT efficacy population is shown. You'll note that starting approximately 25 to 30 days after vaccination, the curves diverge with more cases occurring in the placebo group than the RSV group. Subsequently, cases accrue at a faster rate in the placebo group compared to the RSV pre-F group through approximately seven months following vaccination, which was around the median duration for follow-up of participants in the study at the time of the data cutoff. The cumulative case accrual curve for LRTI with at least three symptoms generally followed a similar pattern as is displayed here, but was on, based on a smaller number of cases. Next slide. Although the study was not powered to assess vaccine efficacy by demographic subgroups, subgroup analyses were performed. Shown here are the subgroup analyses by age for the primary endpoint of vaccine efficacy against LRTI with at least two symptoms, Although the vaccine efficacy point estimates appeared to trend higher with increasing age, the small numbers of enrolled participants in RSV cases in the older age subgroups, especially among participants 80 years of age and older, led to wide confidence intervals, which limits the interpretation of these results. Next slide. Point estimates also appeared to be preserved among participants with at least one at-risk condition for severe RSV. However, again, interpretation is limited by small sample size and the low number of cases for these subgroups. Subgroup analyses for the endpoint of LRTI with at least three symptoms generally followed similar trends as for those with two symptoms, though the fewer number of cases, again, yielded wider confidence intervals resulting in less reliable vaccine efficacy estimates. Next slide. Vaccine efficacy against RSV subgroups A and B were also individually calculated for each of the primary endpoints. The majority of LRTI cases accrued in the study were due to RSV subgroup B. Interpretation of the vaccine efficacy by RSV subgroup is again limited by the low number of cases resulting in wide confidence intervals. Next slide. At the FDA's request, a post hoc analysis of medically attended LRTI associated with RSV was performed. A medically attended RSV case was defined as an episode of LRTI with any outpatient or inpatient visit. This included hospitalization, ER visit, urgent care visit, home health care services, primary care physician office visit, pulmonologist office visit, or any specialist office visit, or telehealth contact. It did not include illness visits conducted at the study site. The analyses demonstrate that the vaccine efficacy point estimates were similar to those obtained in the primary efficacy analyses for the two LRTI endpoints. Next slide, please. Because the pre-specified number of first episodes severe LRTI or SLRTI cases had not accrued as of the data cutoff date, a formal evaluation of the secondary endpoint was not conducted at the interim analysis. As of the data cutoff, there were two cases of SLRTI reported, both among placebo recipients. Both participants were hospitalized and one required supplemental oxygen. Next slide. Vaccine efficacy against ARI was a secondary endpoint for the study. As of the data cutoff date, there were 80 first episode ARI cases reported starting 14 days after vaccination, with 22 cases in the RSV pre group compared to 58 in the placebo group. In a descriptive analysis, the vaccine efficacy for this endpoint was 62.1%, with a lower bound of the 95% confidence interval of 37.1%. 
However, the FDA considered this vaccine efficacy estimate uh, described to be preliminary. At the central lab, swabs from cases which met criteria for LRTI with at least two symptoms were prioritized for RT-PCR testing, which led to approximately one-fourth of the swabs meeting um, criteria for ARI, not completing testing by the time of the data cutoff, because the actual case count at the time of submission might have been higher than the number reported and the analysis displayed. At this time, we considered these results um, incomplete. Next slide, please. Next, I'll summarize the safety data submitted. The next two slides summarize the demographics of the safety population. The demographics of the safety population and the e-diary subset safety population were very similar to that of the evaluable efficacy population as shown earlier in the presentation. The median age of participants was 67 years with 16.3% of participants 75 years of age or older. Next slide. Again, the race and ethnicity of participants in the safety population were very similar to that of the evaluable efficacy population, with the majority of the participants identifying as white and non-Hispanic or Latino. Next slide. In this ongoing phase three study, a total of 34,284 or 99.7% of the randomized participants received study intervention and were included in the safety population. This resulted in 17,215 participants in the RSV pre F group and 17,069 participants in the placebo group. Of these participants, 77% had completed at least six months of follow-up post-vaccination at the time of the data cutoff. The e-diary subset safety population used for the analyses of solicited safety included 3,630 and 3,539 participants in the RSV pre F group and placebo groups, respectively. 5.3% of participants withdrew from the study after receipt of the study intervention. The reasons for withdrawal and proportions of participants withdrawn were similar between the RSV pre F and placebo groups. Common reasons for withdrawal from the study after vaccination were withdrawal by the participant occurring at a rate of 2.6% and loss to follow-up occurring at a rate of 1.9%. Death during the study led to withdrawal of 0.3% of participants in each group. Study withdrawal due to non-fatal adverse events were rare and occurred in less than 0.1% of participants in each group. Next slide. This is an overview of the proportion of participants in each group who reported adverse events during the study. Unsolicited adverse events within 30 minutes of vaccination were reported infrequently and at similar frequencies between the RSV pre F and placebo group at a rate of 0.2% in each group. These events consisted primarily of injection site reactions, and none of the events that occurred were clinically concerning for anaphylaxis. Rates of unsolicited adverse events within one month of vaccination were similar between the two groups. The types and proportions of newly diagnosed chronic medical conditions reported throughout the entire study period were balanced across the groups. Serious adverse events were reported by 2.3% of participants in both the RSV pre F and placebo groups with three SAEs, all in the RSV pre F group, considered to be related to the study intervention. These three SAEs will be discussed later in the presentation. As mentioned, at the time of the data cutoff, deaths occurred at equal rates in both groups, with 52 deaths occurring among RSV pre F recipients and 49 deaths occurring among placebo recipients. Next slide, please. Data on solicited local and systemic adverse reactions within seven days following vaccination were collected from a subset of 7,196 study participants. You will note that the ends provided are a range, as only participants who completed the e-diary entry for the specified solicited reaction were included in the respective analyses. Within two days post-vaccination, the proportion of participants reporting grade one or higher local reactions was higher in the RSV pre F group compared to the placebo group. The most frequently reported local reaction in both groups was pain at the injection site, reported by 10.6% of participants in the RSV pre F group and 6.6% of participants in the placebo group. Severe or grade three solicited local reactions were rare, reported by 0.2% and less than 0.1% of participants in the RSV pre F and placebo groups respectively. Among those who received RSV pre F, 
the median day of onset of local reactions after vaccination was two to three days post-vaccination, and the median duration was one to one and a half days. Next slide. This table includes the percentages of RSV pre-F and placebo recipients who reported any solicited systemic adverse reactions within, one, within seven days post-vaccination by maximum severity. The rates of solicited systemic adverse reactions were similar between the vaccine and placebo groups, and grade three systemic reactions were reported infrequently in 0.7% of RSV pre-F recipients and 0.6% of placebo recipients. Fatigue was the most frequently reported systemic adverse reaction, followed by headache and muscle pain. Next slide. Fever was reported in 1.4% of participants in each group. Fever with a maximum temperature of 38.9 degrees to 40 degrees Celsius was reported by one and two participants in the RSV pre-F and placebo groups respectively. Fever greater than 40 degrees Celsius within seven days post-vaccination was only reported by one placebo participant, and it was measured at 40.1 degrees Celsius, occurring on the day of vaccination only. Among those who received RSV pre-F, the median day of onset of solicited systemic adverse reactions was between two to three days post-vaccination, and the median duration was one to two days. Overall, subgroup analyses of solicited adverse reactions by age and sex were similar to the overall population. However, solicited reactions were reported more frequently in the younger age subgroup of 60 to 69 years of age as compared to the older age subgroups. Next slide. Unsolicited adverse events were monitored in the entire safety population through one month following vaccination. During this monitoring period, the overall rates of unsolicited adverse events were similar between vaccine and placebo recipients. The most common unsolicited adverse events by MEDRA system organ class occurring at a rate of over 1% were infections and inf infestations, respiratory, thoracic, and mediastinal disorders, and general disorders and administration site conditions. The rates of unsolicited adverse events within each of these SOCs were similar between the vaccine and placebo groups. Subgroup analyses of unsolicited adverse events by age, sex, race, ethnicity, country, or predefined at-risk condition identified no specific safety concerns. Although there was no imbalance in the overall rates of unsolicited adverse events, there was a numerical imbalance noted in the events of atrial fibrillation within one month post-vaccination with 10 events in the RSV pre-F group and four events in the placebo group. Four of the events in the RSV pre-F group and three of the events in the placebo group were reported as serious adverse events. None of these events were fatal. Among the 14 participants who experienced events of atrial fibrillation, a medical history of atrial fibrillation was reported by six RSV pre-F recipients and two placebo recipients, and the event onset ranged from 18 to 30 days post-vaccination. Among all study participants, a baseline medical history of atrial fibrillation was documented at a rate of 0.3% in each group, with 60 in the RSV pre-F group and 43 in the placebo group. When assessed through the data cutoff, events of atrial fibrillation were reported by 25 RSV pre-F recipients and 22 placebo recipients, and the imbalance was no longer observed. None of the events of atrial fibrillation were considered related to the study intervention by the investigators. However, the FDA review of these cases is ongoing. Next slide, please. As of the data cutoff, serious adverse events were balanced between study groups, occurring at a rate of 2.3% in each group. Three SAEs, all of which were in the RSV pre-F group, were considered to be possibly related to study vaccination by the FDA in agreement with the investigator's assessment. The first case was that of a 61-year-old female who had experienced hypersensitivity of moderate severity beginning eight hours after receipt of RSV pre -F. The participant developed shortness of breath and chest pain, had loss of consciousness, and required hospitalization. She received a diagnosis of an allergic drug reaction, and her symptoms resolved five days after onset. The second case was that of a 66-year-old male with a past medical history of hypertension who developed Guillain-Barre syndrome, or GBS, graded as life-threatening in severity, with an onset seven days after receipt of RSV pre -F. 
Prior to the onset of his symptoms, on day seven, the participant had experienced a non-ST elevation myocardial infarction not considered related to study vaccination. He was hospitalized from days seven to eight and underwent cardiac catheterization and angioplasty. On day eight, he developed lower back pain, and on day 14, he developed bilateral lower extremity weakness and had a fall leading to his hospitalization. Physical exam and laboratory findings were consistent with the diagnosis of GBS. He was treated with intravenous immunoglobulin and five sessions of plasmapheresis. His symptoms improved and the event of GBS was resolving at the time of the last available report, approximately six months after symptom onset. The third case was that of a 66-year-old female with a past medical history of type 2 diabetes mellitus who developed Miller-Fisher syndrome, a variant of GBS, and was graded as severe with onset eight days after receipt of RSV pre -F. The participant reported fatigue on day nine, sore throat on day 10, and ataxia on day 11. On day 19, she was hospitalized for severe fatigue and unstable movements, and later diplopia, ataxia, and paresthesia of the bilateral palms and soles. Ophthalmoplasia was seen on exam. Her symptoms started to resolve on day 40 without treatment. On day 41, she was retrospectively diagnosed with Miller-Fisher syndrome based on her clinical course. The participant's symptoms resolved completely approximately three months after symptom onset. Through the data cutoff, deaths occurred at a rate of 0.3% in both the RSV pre and placebo groups. In general, the causes of death among participants were representative of the most common causes of death among the elderly adult population. None of these deaths were considered related to study intervention. Next slide. Next, I will summarize the plans for pharmacovigilance. Next slide. The applicant's pharmacovigilance plan includes passive and active surveillance activities for continued vaccine safety monitoring, including routine pharmacovigilance. The applicant has identified use in immunocompromised older adults as missing information and has proposed to conduct a post-marketing safety study in this population. Based on review of the submission to date, the FDA has requested that the applicant identify GBS and other immune-mediated demyelinating conditions, as well as cardiac disorders as important potential risks. The applicant has agreed to perform expedited reporting for all cases of GBS and other immune-mediated demyelinating conditions and all cardiac disorders. Aggregate analysis of GBS and other immune-mediated demyelinating conditions and cardiac disorders in periodic safety reports and a plan to plan a post-marketing safety study to assess the risk of GBS and other immune-mediated demyelinating conditions among individuals vaccinated with a RISVO. Next slide. Finally, I'll close by summarizing the data from the submission and presenting the FDA questions to the advisory committee. In summary, based on a median follow-up for efficacy of seven months, and with 66.3% of participants having completed season one surveillance, including all participants in the United States, vaccine efficacy to prevent first episode LRTI with at least two and at least three symptoms were 66.7% and 85.7% respectively, with both endpoints achieving lower bounds of the 96.66% confidence interval that met study success criteria. Additionally, descriptive vaccine efficacy estimates appear preserved among participants 80 years of age and older, and among participants with at least one at-risk condition, although these data were limited by small subpopulation sizes. As you'll soon see, we will be asking for your vote today on vaccine effectiveness in the context of the primary endpoints against LRTI due to RSV. Evaluation of the secondary endpoint of vaccine efficacy against ARI resulted in a vaccine efficacy est um, est estimate of 62.1% with a lower bound of the 95% confidence interval of 37.1%. However, these data at the time of submission were considered preliminary by the FDA due to the need to compete, complete the testing of the remaining nasal swabs meeting ARI criteria. Please be aware that although we are not asking you to vote on the secondary endpoint submitted, we would like to hear your opinion regarding the, the, the data presented on vaccine efficacy against ARI. Data are currently not available on the duration of vaccine effectiveness, the vaccine efficacy in immunocompromised and frail elderly adults, and vaccine efficacy in preventing severe LRTI 
as there were only two cases of SLRTI as of the data cutoff, both among placebo recipients. Data regarding concomitant administration with vaccines routinely recommended for use in this population are also not available. Next slide. To summarize the safety data, the study included 34,284 participants, including 17,215 who received rsv pre -F. Of these vaccinated participants, 77% have had at least six months of follow-up. Solicited local and systemic reactions were generally mild to moderate and of short duration. The most frequently reported solicited reactions among RSV pre-op recipients at a rate of over 10% were fatigue, headache, injection site pain, and muscle pain. Within one month after vaccination, a numerical imbalance was observed for events of atrial fibrillation. FDA review of these events is ongoing. Serious adverse events were balanced between the RSV pre-F and placebo groups. Three SAEs, including one case of GBS and one case of GBS variant were assessed by the FDA as possibly related to the RSV pre-F vaccine in agreement with the investigator's assessment. Finally, review of the safety data from five supportive clinical studies did not reveal any other safety signals including additional cases of GBS or other immune-mediated demyelinating conditions post-vaccination. Next slide. Today, we will be asking you to vote on the following questions. Question number one, are the available data adequate to support the safety of a BRISVO when administered to individuals 60 years of age and older for the prevention of lower respiratory tract disease caused by RSV? Please vote yes or no. Question number two, are the available data adequate to support the effectiveness of BRISVO for the prevention of lower respiratory tract disease caused by RSV in individuals 60 years of age and older? Again, voting yes or no. Thank you for everyone for listening to me today. And thank you so much to my colleagues at the FDA who have helped to uh, create this presentation and conduct a review of this vaccine. Thank you, Dr. Perth. I want to invite my colleagues to use the raise your hand function. And uh, so we can begin with questions. I see the first question by uh, Dr. Portnoy. Dr. Portnoy. Hello. hello. Thank, thank you so much for that presentation. It was very informative and, and very clear, and I appreciate it. Um, I'm used to looking at vaccine data from vaccines that are being applied for emergency use authorization, like with the COVID. And so numbers like you're showing me are very familiar. But when the vaccine is being um, submitted for full approval and not just for emergency use authorization, usually the numbers are higher than what I've seen. And this is still uh, preliminary data. The studies are still ongoing. And I'm just wondering, does the FDA have any sense of whether these numbers are high enough to be considered useful for full approval, or is it this more emergency use authorization types of numbers? Do you have any sense of that? Thank you for your question. Yes, the numbers that were submitted and the data that was provided by the applicant are acceptable for consideration for a BLA submission. Thank you. The second question is from Dr. Perlman. Yes, a great presentation. So I had, I had a question to follow up of Dr. Portnoy's. So there's not data on what I would consider some of the most important things in the in RSV, the RSV world, death, uh, immunocompromised uh, people, how, and the vaccine. We just don't know how well the vaccine is going to work there. So if we give uh, a BLA now, what's going to be the future if, as data come in about those populations, does the BLA get revoked if there's no protection or how, how does the FDA deal with that? That's an excellent question. Um, once the BLA, if the vaccine is approved, um, post-marketing surveillance um, will be conducted by the FDA as well as our colleagues um, at the um, from Pfizer. Um, if there are new safety signals or new safety events, additional communications will be provided. Um, but I will um, pass uh, the microphone over to some of my colleagues at the FDA, um, do uh, Dr. Caslow, um, who might be able to provide additional information on what might happen should additional concerns be raised. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? 
Right. Yeah. So as additional information um, is made available, it'll be um, submitted to the PSBLA, to the to, to the BLA and reevaluated. And if changes in the label are required, those will be those will be undertaken. So data driven analysis um, through the part post marketing studies. Um, the third question is from Dr. Bernstein. Wonderful presentation, uh, thank you. Um, I, so I, I also had the, the question about the efficacy against severe lower respiratory tract uh, disease, which uh, you just answered. My other question is that the epidemiology suggests that um, the older the, the subjects are, the worse or more likely to have RSV disease. And I wondered why the lower age group was down to 60, which then, uh, but not enough in the 80 plus age group. It only uh, accounted for, I think, 5% of the total population, where a third were in the younger age group. And it seemed that it would be better to have a larger sample size in the 80 plus Adrian. Thank you for your question. Um, yes, this was a very large study. So although the proportion of participants 80 years of age and older um, does seem small comparatively, the absolute number is reasonable. Um, about 5,500 participants, um, 20, uh, 2,700 about of which we were vaccine recipients, were 75 years of age and older. And um, the numbers of participants in this age population are comparable with those that we've seen in studies for other vaccines that have been used in older adults. Um, of course, if the vaccine is licensed, more data will then be more available on the age group, um, and we would be able to access that through real-world evidence. Thank you. And the fourth question is from me. Uh, the um, issue of acute demyelinating disorders. Um, there were two that were identified in the six weeks post-vaccination. Um, however, there were a lot more SAEs, you know, in that umbrella, um, and not otherwise defined. Would did the sponsor or the FDA look at this at this small subset um, and uh, determine whether any of those are could be remotely uh, in the category of acute demyelinating disorders? Because I mean, we're talking about a full order of magnitude in, in incidence here. It's more than a Yes. Um, so absolutely, we definitely hear that concern, and we have been addressing that concern internally by conducting um, serial uh, analyses of the participants who might have met criteria for um, immune demyelinating conditions. We've reviewed all of these cases extensively and so far have only identified the two cases that we've reported to you that have met criteria for GBS or GBS variant. Specifically ADEM as well, right? Specifically, Adam as well. Yes. All right. Thank you. I see Dr. Griffin. Question number five. Yeah, um, my question is about GBS, uh, demyelinating diseases as well. And uh, you know, I'm interested in the post-marketing plan. What would be sort of? I mean, because this is such a high rate. Does FDA have an idea of what what they would be looking for? How many new cases or sort of, you know, we, we've, FDA has considerable experience with this and, you know, Shingrix, but that's like one in a hundred thousand or something. Yeah. So I'm just wondering how many cases would you have to see before something happened besides just the label change? Um, that's an excellent question. Um, we, um, we, we might have to um, return to you with an answer on that exact question when our pharmacovigilance um, team is available, but I will turn the mic over to Dr. Castle, who might be able to provide additional information. Sorry. No. So thank you for the question. And it really is a quite important one. And I think, um, as you saw in the presentation, we're highlighting these post-marketing pharma 
the surveillance studies as being critically important in terms of monitoring the, the safety of these of these vaccines. Okay, question number six from Dr. James. Thank you. Um, my, my question is about um, some of the um, subgroup analyses, um, and, and in particular, um, the, the, the one that caught my eye is, is the analysis of efficacy against RSV A versus B. And um, you know, as you as you pointed out, you know, there aren't very many endpoints here, and and um, and so the precision with which we can estimate how VE varies uh, according to the. The, the type of, of, of uh, viral uh, infection is, is limited. Um, but I'm wondering if you can provide any additional context or help us to interpret what is, in my mind, sort of an intriguing um, potential difference in VE. Are there any, any additional data that, that can be brought to bear on helping us to interpret whether that's a, a real difference in VE or, or a statistical artifact? Um, that's an excellent question. Um, we only have the data that was submitted with this um, application currently at this time. Um, so I would not be able to provide additional data, but I would uh, you know, uh, 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 invite our Pfizer colleagues to be able to provide any additional data that they might have to address that question. Okay. Uh, question number seven would be Dr. Feiken. Yes, hi. Um, a couple questions. The, the first is I another question about the GBS. Um, I'm wondering, does, does when FDA considers uh, a potential related SAE, how do you consider other potential causes of that SAE? Because we heard for both of those cases, there was another potential cause. One case was a, was a viral upper respiratory tract infection. The other was a an uh, acute myocardial infarction followed by a uh, angioplasty. Um, so, so that's the first question is, do you nuance your interpretation based on that? And the second is, I, I was surprised in your presentation to hear about the imbalance in the atrial fibrillation, because I didn't see that in the briefing document for Pfizer. And so I'm just wondering why, why it wasn't there, what, what the disconnect is between what you presented and, and what we saw in the briefing document. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Um, in regard to um, GBS, how we determine whether or not the uh, event is possibly related is first starting with whether or not there are imbalances, um, the severity of the uh, condition, um, the likelihood of the condition being associated with the vaccine, um, as well as the background rates of the condition. Um, we use all of these um, um, information and have several teams on board that help us to determine whether or not we have a concern about a safety signal. Um, and then once we've determined there's a concern, we will, if a, pro a product is um, licensed, most marketing additional data might be able to be obtained. Um, regarding the question of uh, atrial fibrillation, um, I, I would have to defer that question to Pfizer. Um, thank you. Uh, I mean, I want uh, the last question. I think we have just a couple more minutes. Is uh, <clears throat> pertaining to the an echo of what uh, Dr. Perlman and Dr. Bernstein mentioned, and that the study recruitment kind of by design um, or the way it happened had only one percent CHF patients uh, of all age ranges, and we heard this morning uh, that of all comorbidities um, in any age, really. This seems to stand out as a risk factor for severe disease. So, um, you know, especially um, what Dr. Tabot also mentioned that, you know, frailty and comorbidity um, are not just the number, the age uh, that, that of the patient. So I wonder about the ability of the trial to, to answer that question just by virtue of the population involved. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a hanging question now, but 
Yes, that's a great question. So um, I will say, uh, in addition to, as you mentioned, uh, congestive heart failure, uh, even our colleagues at the CDC, Dr. Havers had addressed that there were additional comorbidities such as COPD and diabetes um, that are put you at higher risk for severe RSV disease. Um, there were a higher proportion of participants, about 18% in the RSV pre-F group on about the similar amount in the placebo group who had diabetes, um, and those who had had um, COPD at a rate of about 6.6% in um and both groups. So although we had a lower rate uh, or they or although the, the the study had a lower rate of congestive heart failure, it does seem as though again um, the point estimates for VE for those who have these at-risk conditions is preserved. Um, however, again, that data does seem to be limited due to the um, the wide confidence intervals that it had. I do not see additional hands for questions. So with that, we conclude uh, this portion of the meeting and allow everyone to stretch and have lunch. Uh, it's 12.29, we have 40 minutes. So uh, 1.10 uh, Central or 2.10 Eastern. Thank you all. Recording.
Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome back to our 179th meeting for the VRPAC, discussing uh, the safety and efficacy of RSV vaccine as presented by the sponsor Pfizer. Uh, we are in the open public hearing uh, session. And now I will be reading the open public hearing statement. Welcome to the open public hearing session. Please note that both the, F the Food and Drug Administration and the public believe in a transparent process for information gathering and decision making to ensure transparency at the open public hearing session of the advisory committee meeting. The FDA believes that it is important to understand the context of an individual's presentation. For this reason, FDA encourages you, the open public hearing speaker at the beginning of your written or oral statement to advise the committee of any financial relationship that you may have with the sponsor, its product, and if known, its direct competitors. For example, this financial information may include the sponsor's payment of expenses in connection with your participation in this meeting. Likewise, FDA encourages you at the beginning of your statement to advise the committee if you do not have any such financial relationships. If you choose not to address this issue of financial relationships at the beginning of your statement, it will not preclude you from speaking. Uh, I will turn the meeting now uh, to Dr. Susan Pedar, who will uh, moderate the open public hearing session. Dr. Pedar. Um, hi, everyone. Um, thank you, Dr. Osali. Uh, before I begin calling the registered speakers, um, I would like to add the following guidance. FDA encourages participation from all public stakeholders in its decision-making processes. Every advisory committee meeting includes an open public hearing, OPH session, during which interested persons may present relevant information or views. Participants during the OPH session are not FDA employees or members of this advisory committee. FDA recognizes that the speakers may present a range of viewpoints. The statements made during this open public hearing session reflect the viewpoints of the individual speakers or their organizations and are not meant to indicate agency agreement with the statements made. With that guidance, I would like to begin. Every speaker will have only four minutes to make their remarks. I'll begin with our first OPH speaker, Mr. Burton Eller. Mr. Eller. Thank you for this opportunity to speak on a topic of great public interest and concern. Founded in 1867, the Grange is the oldest national organization advocating for the 22% of Americans living in rural and small town America. Our mission is to work together to support and advance the safety, health, economic security, and well being of those who have chosen a rural way of life. We are here today to continue our effort to highlight the vulnerability of our communities to respiratory disease and to speak to the urgent need for safe, effective, and accessible preventive measures to keep them from taking the lives of our families, friends, and neighbors. For many years, the National Grange has worked with public, private, and nonprofit agencies and organizations to find ways to reduce the elevated risk public citizens face from respiratory diseases such as flu and pneumonia. Some aspects of that risk are quite harsh. Lack of access to care has been estimated to account for 55% of what could be preventable hospitalizations or deaths from all causes. Rural life expectancy is two years shorter than that of urban residents. In the past eight years, almost 200 rural hospitals have shut their doors and recent studies project that one third of those who remain are struggling and are li not likely to survive. Just before COVID, it was reported that the rates for influenza and pneumonia were higher in rural communities than in urban areas. As a result of where we live, rural Americans must travel longer distances to obtain services from fewer available clinicians, diminishing numbers of hospitals, and more limited choices of pharmacies than our urban and suburban counterparts. In addition, the COVID-19 pandemic added an enormous new burden to the already fragile healthcare delivery system in rural America, and even more danger to the respiratory health of rural patients. As the, 
As the pandemic began to ease, the unprecedented rise in RSV cases throughout the country during the fall and early winter of 2022 added yet another highly dangerous respiratory condition to the list of those that have already taken such a heavy toll on us. News outlets throughout the country once again were reporting the challenges the remaining rural hospitals faced as they tried to cope with the influence, influx of patients needing care, but with no space to offer them. When fall arrives this year, we could once again face a quadruple respiratory threat from flu, pneumonia, COVID, and RSV. We must not let last year's crisis repeat itself if there are resources available to prevent it. We add our voice to those calling attention to the urgency and critical importance that safe, effective vaccine prevention can offer our communities from RSV. We have full confidence in the FDA's work to protect all Americans from these multiple respiratory threats and to do so as expeditiously as possible so that all segments of the healthcare delivery system are prepared before the next season is upon us. We appreciate the opportunity to present to the committee today. Thank you, Mr. Allura. I appreciate your um, opinions. Um, next is Robin um, Strongen. Good afternoon. My name is Robin Strongen, and I direct health policy for the National Consumers League. Founded in 1899 by the renowned social reformer Florence Kelly, the National Consumers League has long championed vaccines as life-saving medical interventions. In fact, Kelly's support of vaccinations played a key part in mitigating a critical smallpox outbreak towards the end of the 19th century, and her tireless advocacy for immunizations has informed NCL's bedrock principles for increased access and vaccine confidence. 124 years later, we are honored to persist in our efforts to protect consumers from vaccine preventable illnesses. And we extend our gratitude to this committee for the opportunity to present our public comments. We know that despite decades of effort, no vaccine to protect against RSV disease in any population has been authorized, resulting in a very serious unmet need. The dramatic rise in cases this past fall was a wake-up call for us as a nation. As Americans faced the threat of contracting RSV, the flu, pneumonia, and COVID were circulating simultaneously. The difference, of course, is that vaccines for COVID, influenza, and pneumonia are widely available, and many in the most vulnerable communities have embraced these tools to reduce their risk of serious illness and death. However, the lack of any such tool to protect against RSV made for a frightening reality for Americans already facing serious threats to their respiratory health, especially among the very young and the elderly. NCL is also concerned with the serious strain these viruses put on our healthcare system and its ability to provide quality and timely care for patients. From hospitals running at capacity to overtaxed healthcare providers, and family caregivers, the prolonged burden such an uptick in cases can inflict is not sustainable. We are encouraged by the continued progress in the development of vaccines to help strengthen our ability to fight back against devastating diseases like RSV. Ensuring broad and equitable access to these vaccines is an important next step to improving the health of all communities while reducing the high burden these viruses place on our healthcare system. NCL cares deeply about the health and well being of our nation. We will continue to do our part to educate people about the importance of vaccines and the value they offer consumers and society as a whole. Thank you. Thank you for your participation, Ms. Strongen. Next presenter is Meredith Whitmire. Hi, all. Um, I have no financial disclosures to make. Uh, my name is Meredith Whitmire, and I represent the National Association of Nutrition and Aging Services Programs, um, also known as NANASC. Our organization's members collectively serve over 4 million older adults through nutrition and other community-based services. Since 2014, we have been at the forefront of discussions on vaccines for older adults, beginning with our efforts to advocate for Medicare coverage of pneumococcal conjugate vaccines. We appreciate your examination of the safety of these RSV vaccines for older adults. We urge you to make your decision in a timely manner in order to hopefully continue the vaccine's overall consideration by the relevant federal committees and agencies. 
We are living in unprecedented times with four respiratory threats, COVID-19, influenza, pneumonia, and RSV circulating in our environment simultaneously at elevated and deadlier levels than they have in previous years. While there have been vaccines that Americans can take to protect themselves against three of these threats, RSV has remained a dangerous condition for older adults. At the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, older Americans quickly stepped up and did their part to become vaccinated when safe and effective options were made available. To date, over 94% of older adults in the U.S. have received the primary series of the COVID-19 vaccine. Similarly, the rate of uptake among older Americans is higher for the flu vaccine as well. Recent CDC data showed that flu vaccine coverage for adults 65 years and older is 36% higher compared with adults 18 to 49 years. Not only does this generation value vaccines as an important aspect of protection for their own health, but they also understand that they can help to protect the younger generations as well. Many older adults care for grandchildren, so approval of RSV vaccines for older adults would help protect babies and younger children as well. Since we know that RSV can be quite serious and even deadly for the youngest and oldest in our population, it stands to reason that we should be doing everything we can to provide the most vulnerable with these vaccines before the next round of respiratory threats comes our way in the fall. We are grateful for this committee's tireless work on behalf of older Americans to evaluate new and innovative options for vaccines and to provide expert guidance on their use. We also know that the true value of vaccines relies not in the science alone, but in connecting the science to the people who would most benefit from it. NANASP, our members, and our partner organizations all connect with older adults in the states, cities, and communities where they live when new vaccine options are available. We also work to ensure, ensure broad and equitable access to these vaccines for all who would benefit. Though we are still in February, we are already looking ahead to how we can best serve our communities in helping them to prepare for yet another fall of an unpredictable deluge of threats to our respiratory systems. We are encouraged by the prospect that a major aspect of that planning could be ensuring access to these new and much needed protections against RSV. In short, older Americans are eager for the ability to strengthen their immune systems against this virus before we face yet another season of elevated respiratory threats in the fall. They are ready and willing to take the vaccines if approved. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Whitemeyer. Um, next speaker is Martha Nolan. Good afternoon. My name is Martha Nolan. I am the Senior Policy Advisor for Healthy Women a women's health online resource dedicated to educating women to make informed health decisions, advocate for themselves, and prioritize their health and wellness. And I am not participating today in this meeting at the direction of the sponsors, nor have I or my organization been paid to be participating in this meeting. Much of our focus on women's health is centered around educating and empowering women to take control of their health and to know the facts about what resources are available to support their overall wellness and prevent serious illness. Vaccines are one of those essential resources, and therefore we routinely share information and updates on available vaccines to keep women and their families informed. History has proven time and time again that vaccines help society keep dangerous diseases in check. Pre-COVID, many Americans may have thought of vaccines as primarily a tool for infants and young children to build up their immune systems to fight off disease and illness throughout the rest of their lifespan. However, COVID illustrated for all of us how the strength of our immune systems wanes as we age, along with our ability to fight off illness. RSV is one such virus that many have associated with impacting young children, but we know it can also da be dangerous for older adults. Each year, an estimated 177,000 adults are hospitalized with RSV and 14,000 will die. As cases of RSV dramatically rose this fall, past fall, a virus many people had never even heard of quickly became a very serious threat to our communities as it coincided with the now predictable spike in COVID-19 and the annual threat from the flu and pneumonia seasons. It has reinforced the lesson we all learned at the start of the COVID pandemic, which is how interconnected we all are as a community. The intergenerational nature of our society, while so important in many ways, also lends itself to an environment in which viruses can spread among those most vulnerable, from the youngest to the oldest. 
the societal costs of RSV are considerable as well. RSV costs the U.S. more than a billion dollars in healthcare costs and lost productivity each year. Women are often the caretakers of the family responsible for the health and well-being of both younger and older generations in our society, and they are very much feeling the burden of this increased threats as well. And given that women have longer lifespans and are more likely to reach an older and more vulnerable age than men, we believe it is critical that they have access to effective vaccines to protect against serious illness and preserve their long-term health. That is why Healthy Women supports the continued innovation of vaccines and is encouraged by the prospect of safe and effective vaccines for RSV in older adults. We are hopeful that as we enter into fall of 2023, we can do so with this added protection against RSV, strengthening our immune systems. We appreciate this committee's role in ensuring that Americans have access to these vital technologies, and we will continue to share the FDA's updates on the newest approved vaccines and ensure that women are informed about the value they offer to our overall health and well-being. Thank you for this opportunity to speak before the committee. Thank you, Ms. Nolan. I appreciate your participation in VRPAC. Um, the next speaker is uh, Mr. Um, Kenneth Mendez. Great. Thank you. Good afternoon, members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to provide this testimony. Uh, disclosure, AFA receives financial support from Pfizer and other vaccine manufacturers, but I'm here to represent our organization. I'm president and CEO. Uh, we are the oldest and largest nonprofit patient advocacy group representing the 65 million Americans with asthma and allergies. Our mission is to save lives and reduce the burden of disease through support, advocacy, research, and education. I'd like to express our perspective using some statistics from the asthma world and why an RSV vaccine for older adults with asthma is so important. We know that RSV can be particularly dangerous for older adults with asthma. RSV can trigger asthma episodes or asthma attacks. Being over 65 and having asthma are factors for greater risk of RSV-related hospitalization or death. Our hope is that an RSV vaccine for this age group will reduce hospitalizations and deaths for people with asthma. Let's look at some statistics on asthma and age. 7.8% of the US population or 4.2 million adults older than 65 have asthma. There were 4,100 deaths in 2020 from asthma, and 41% of these deaths were from those aged 65 and older. This age group has the highest death rate of any age group, 31 deaths per million, more than twice the rate of the death in the next highest age group. An RSV vaccine has the potential of reducing the negative impact of RSV on those who have asthma and their unique challenges for the 65 and older age group. Evidence suggests that elderly asthmatics are more likely to be underdiagnosed and undertreated. Physical changes from aging, reduced motor and other skills, lower income, and the demands of other comorbid conditions can all exacerbate older adults' asthma and create barriers to care. Asthma also impacts older adults of certain racial and ethnic groups more severely. For example, older adults with asthma who are black, Hispanic, and or low income are at a heightened risk of frequent hospitalization from asthma. Because of these factors, we asked the advisory committee to take into account not only the overall potential impact of RSV vaccines for older adults, but the potential importance of such vaccines for older adults with asthma, including those subpopulations most burdened by the disease. The vaccine for RSV can reduce asthma exacerbations, improve quality of life for older adults living with asthma, and reduce mortality, particularly among older adults with asthma. Thank you for your time, and thank you for the work that you do as a committee. Thank you, Mr. Mendes. We appreciate your participation, sharing your perspective. Uh, last but not least, our last speaker is Lindsay Clark. Good afternoon. Thank you to the committee for this opportunity to comment. My name is Lindsay Clark and I'm the Senior Vice President of Health Education and Advocacy at the Alliance for Aging Research. The Alliance received some industry funding for non-branded health education campaigns on older adult vaccination. One of those campaigns that I lead at the Alliance is the Our Best Shot campaign. 
Over the years, this campaign has produced dozens of educational resources focused on raising awareness about the importance of vaccines in older adults, how they work, and which ones are recommended by the CDC's Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, how the Medicare program covers vaccines, and more. The educational resources have included a focus on influenza, pneumonia, shingles, and COVID. And this past year, we produced an educational campaign and film on RSV and older adults emphasizing to viewers that RSV is not just a pediatric disease. We know that the reported 14,000 deaths and 177,000 hospitalizations in older adults each year due to RSV are likely underestimated due to under testing and reporting of the disease. We also know that in those older adults who are infected with RSV, but don't have serious complications, they can still pass the virus on to vulnerable children and infants in their lives. In addition to adults ages 65 and older, adults ages 60 to 64 living with asthma, congestive heart failure, COPD, are at high risk for RSV-related hospitalizations and deaths. Studies from the CDC and others presented at the ResVanet conference last week demonstrate that a higher proportion of adults ages 60 to 64 who were hospitalized and or experienced severe outcomes due to RSV were Black, Hispanic, or American Indian Alaskan Native. These racial and ethnic differences are critical for the FDA and CDC to recognize as they consider labeling and vaccine administration recommendations by age. Earlier and higher rates of asthma, COPD, or congestive heart failure in communities of color due to structural racism leads to earlier RSV onset and higher risk of hospitalization and severe outcomes, including deaths. We ask both agencies to heed the still raw lessons of COVID-19 and work together to collect and analyze data by race, ethnicity, as well as age, to better ensure RSV vaccine equity and equity for all other vaccines. Additionally, please do not layer on a shared clinical decision-making recommendation for this vaccine as a utilization management technique. It is not needed and will only reinforce known disparities. Effective vaccines for RSV and older adults clearly have the potential to make a tremendous impact and save tens of thousands of lives. We call on the CDC's Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices to meet and vote on recommendations within a week or two of any FDA approval and to publish the recommendations in the MMWR without delay. While respiratory surges are no longer limited to the traditional cold and flu season, we know that the surges of influenza, COVID, pneumonia, RSV, and other respiratory illnesses continue to flood and overwhelm our healthcare system in the fall and winter months. That gives us six months to approve, recommend, and start administering these vaccines while simultaneously educating older adults and clinicians about their benefits and availability. Lastly, we urge the federal government to make sure that the safety of co-administering multiple vaccines like RSV and influenza, COVID, or pneumonia is clearly communicated. We know from our education and outreach that misinformation about the safety of receiving multiple vaccines at once persists, and clear communication from the FDA, CDC, and other agencies is critical in the distribution of reliable and trustworthy information on vaccination and specifically on co-administration. We are excited by the fact that RSV vaccines could be available for older adults before the start of this year's cold and flu season. While general awareness and prevention will remain a priority for the Alliance, we look forward to being able to encourage older adults and all adults at high risk to receive an RSV vaccine protect, to protect themselves and their loved ones. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Ms. Clark. I appreciate your participation. This concludes open public hearing session for today. I now hand over the meeting back to our chair, Dr. Al Saleh. Could you please start the next session? Sure. Thank you, uh, Dr. Paydar. Um, our next uh, agenda item is the Q&A session. During the session, uh, the committee members will have the opportunity to ask questions uh, to the presenters uh, this morning. Uh, it would be the CDC, the FDA, the sponsor, and additional presenters. To that end, uh, I invite uh, the committee members to use the raise your hand function in the Zoom uh, so we can begin without delay. Um, no hands so far. I'll get us started. The, the reminder, please use uh, the raise your hand function. It's under reactions in the uh, ribbon below. So you can raise your hand for questions to all of our presenters from this morning. Um, so the, the first question I have is uh, for the 
sponsor. In the uh, document, uh, in the briefing document, you presented uh, the antibody response at one month and the antibody decay at 12 months was superimposed when we looked at 60, 120, and 240 microgram, give or take. Uh, moving forward, uh, the program went with 120 microgram. Uh, what was the rationale? Yeah, so Alejandra Gertman again, uh, here from Pfizer. Uh, the rationale for uh, the dose selection was that we did not see much difference between the 100 and 240 micrograms. And it was a little bit of a, of a dose selection with the 60 micrograms. And um, based on the totality of the immunogenicity data and the safety that we observed with the vaccine, although the vaccine was safe at all doses, we selected the 120 micrograms. Okay, so, all right. Uh, I see Dr. Caslow. Dr. Castro, please unmute. Yep. Sorry. So, Dr. El Sali, I wonder if it would be helpful for the advisory committee to hear at a, at a very high level the vaccine safety review process during the, the BLA regulatory review process, kind of where we are now in considering those safety signals, what steps remain, and how the post approval information will, will be assessed. It seems like there's great interest around that. And, and if so, our colleague, from the Office of Biostatistics and uh, Pharmacovigilance, Dr. Uh, Elneem Tendani is, is on standby to do so, if that would be helpful. Definitely. Hi, this is Meghna Alim Tendani. Can you hear me okay? We can hear you. Okay, great. So I just wanted to take a couple of minutes. Um, so Pfizer has proposed a post-marketing active surveillance study in Medicare beneficiaries to further assess the risk of GBS. This post-marketing study is under discussion between FDA and Pfizer at this time. And Dr. Kaslow asked that we provide an overview of our process at FDA with regards to review of post-marketing safety studies. Uh, we are currently reviewing Pfizer's study proposal. Our next step is to discuss the study and taking into account the comments from VORPAC today at a CBER safety working group. This is an internal uh, safety working group, which includes members from the center's leadership. Our review will consider, consider the study design, including the study objectives, the data source, study feasibility, and also the timeline for conducting the study when the study would be completed and the submission of the final study report. So FDA will be providing our comments on aspects of the study design to Pfizer for them to include FDA recommendations as they prepare the final study protocol. And we wanted to remind the VRPAC that post-marketing safety studies can be conducted as post-marketing requirements or commitments and FDA has the regulatory authority to require the sponsor to conduct a post-marketing study to assess a serious risk. So following our internal discussions with center leadership, FDA would issue sponsor notification for a safety study that would be either a PMR or a PMC. So that's all I had just to provide a high level overview. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Alim, Alim Chandani. Alim Chandani, yeah. Alim Chandani. Uh, I see Dr. Cohen has a question. Great, thank you. This is a question for FDA. I am curious about the rationale um, regarding setting up the study uh, with Pfizer originally to be a whole of two seasons and then doing this interim that analysis. And what is FDA's plan, for example, if during the next season, as this study continues, efficacy is very different? What would the um, approach B, given that originally this was meant to cover two years um, or two RSV seasons. Hi, thank you for that question. Um, it's a great question. We are, of course, uh, monitoring um, uh, the study, the ongoing study, uh, as it's uh, being conducted. And if new data becomes available um, that changes our current opinions on the vaccine and its efficacy, of course, we would uh, uh, reevaluate at that time and likely um, request uh, another meeting with the committee to uh, determine further uh, plans. Thank you. Yeah. 
The committee is a little quiet. Any additional questions? Dr. Cohen, you have a second question? Sorry. Sure, I have a follow-up question if nobody else has raised their <laughs> hand. Um, thanks for that uh, response. I guess I was wondering if there are any other examples of vaccines that have been meant to cover um, uh, cyclical, like, so influenza vaccine, we we have annual with, with changing strains, and that's why it looks like COVID's going. But do you have any examples where you have, um, where you want to have long-term protection, but you, um, and you required a longer duration of protection before licensing a product um, or a vaccine specifically, or do you always use that short-term immunogenicity or effectiveness for your um, determinations? Um, thank you. As you mentioned, influenza is um, uh, a great example of that. It's a respiratory virus um, that uh, changes annually and requires updates annually to the vaccine schedule. Um, we do have that model if we do need to address this vaccine in that in that manner. Um, but again, until we have additional data, um, I will not be able to further comment on that. Thank you. Dr. Griffin. Um, yeah, <clears throat> I'm, I'm also concerned about the a vaccine that's going to could be recommended for all adults, um, but have has been tested in a relatively healthy adult population where the number of hospitalizations has been pretty low. <laughs> so how would FDA like? <laughs> How are we going to find out if it really works for frail elderly and nursing home patients? And is that going to rely on observational studies like we have had to do for influenza vaccine for years and years? Um, I mean, and would that change the labeling at all if an observational study showed that it wasn't effective in nursing home patients? Um, I'm just wondering if it's possible to get more efficacy data. Um, again, an excellent question. Um, so I do want to also just readdress that, you know, the study where we did ask for a post hoc analysis on medically attended um, cases, and there were 64.6% of medically attended cases um, in the RSV pre-F group as compared to the placebo group for those who had LRTI of at least two symptoms. Um, but that medically attended definition was broad and did include um, hospitalization, inpatient hospitalization, hospitalization, but also outpatient um, hospitalization data. So I just wanted to make sure to um, bring that up again to the committee. And then going to the question that you asked about um, if new data, how this would be assessed, how the efficacy would be assessed um, in the frail elderly population. Um, it's uh, in previous vaccine um, trials and studies, um, that specific population has not always been um, taken out to, uh, to study and to study the efficacy in. And in the same circumstances as what would happen with this vaccine, potentially um, real world evidence and data would be a supplement to the data that we have already to help in establishing and in understanding the vaccine efficacy. Now, um, when that data becomes available, um, yes, we would definitely readdress that by whether or not we need to come back to a, a committee to rediscuss it, and then if needed to uh, update the label um, accordingly. Thank you. Dr. Kim? Well, thank you. When Dr. Gertman uh, presented her information, there was, uh, uh, there was, uh, there there were certain cutoff points uh, for age groups, uh, for example, at age 60 and another at age 80. And then uh, and you also went into, into a little bit of a discussion into the age 65. And I'm looking at this um, RSV vaccination from a policy perspective on this. And we have, um, uh, we have uh, vaccination recommendations for, uh, for people 65 or older. And, and Pfizer is obviously very, uh, in tune with uh, with uh, uh, with Prevnar vaccine recommendations at age sixty five, and there's also of course the influenza vaccination um, for those sixty five or older uh, to be, to receive the high dose uh, either the high dose influenza vaccine or an adjuvanted influenza vaccine. So given that uh, that we have certain age um, uh, process uh, for for routine immunization schedule for adults at age sixty five, and we don't have one for age sixty. Um, 
and uh, and, and to implement and, and for, from for, from an implementation perspective, a sixty that would add a, a, a layer of complexity uh, to the uh, to the overall larger immunization schedule. So for for our Pfizer colleagues as well as uh, our FDA colleagues. Is, is there some consideration for age 65 to, to really look at, dive into uh, into the data for age 65 and look at the benefits of, uh, from 65 on and uh, and compare that to uh, those uh, age less than 65 and determine whether uh, whether a, a, a policy consideration can be made for uh, for 65 and older as opposed to 60 and older? Uh, so uh, thank you, Dr. Kim, for the question. Um, our program is seeking an indication in adults 60 years of age and older. And as it was mentioned this morning, immunosenescence um, is hard to define, but it starts uh, probably at age 50. Uh, the final recommendation of how the vaccine will be recommended will be up to the CDC. Uh, but we have shown data uh, our study includes all the age groups between, as I said, the youngest 60 to 97 years of age, and we have shown consistency on vaccine efficacy across the different decades of life. So the submission um, put together for the VLA actually supports the request for the age 60 and older, and recommendations at the end will be made uh, by CDC and the ACIP. Dr. Perlman? Yeah, so I, I have a question about uh, going back to the safety issues. So with this vaccine, uh, is the thought that this is going to be given uh, yearly every other year? And is that going to, how does that affect the risk of GBS if, you, if one gets multiple uh, in, inoculations? Do we have any information about that? Yeah, so thank you for the question. The the revaccination data that we have is in a very small cohort of subjects uh, in this age group, but not to support uh, a response to you, uh, to your question. Uh, however, as it was um, mentioned by um, uh, the FDA expert, we will be uh, crafting and designing a study to uh, clearly investigate the incidence of GBS in this um, age group. And um, that study, as it was mentioned before, it has been currently discussed with the FDA. And um, in addition to the study, we will have also um, our enhanced pharmacovigilance uh, that we will do to ensure that we detect cases of GBS or other immune demyelinating conditions. And that is an expedited report that is done to the FDA, regardless of the severity of the of the syndrome or regardless of any relationship so it will be the study design as it was mentioned but also enhanced pharmacovigilance activities which we have done for a long time and we can um really we have the whole system to support uh detecting cases if they are presented and reporting them to the fda i have a question uh to dr alim ali Manch. I'm sorry, uh, to the FDA, um, and it pertains also to the safety. The sponsor did indicate that there is interference uh, when the va this vaccine is co-administered with influenza vaccine. Um, in this particular population, with the VE of influenza every year being so closely monitored and uh, being so vital for our public health efforts to decrease hospitalizations and death uh, each year. In the absence of data to the contrary, that it does not interfere, because all we see in the briefing is that it does interfere. In the absence of such data to the contrary, what, what would be the post-marketing or what would be a piece of information that would help alleviate this particular concern? So I think in terms of the post-marketing safety surveillance study, you know, we can do sensitivity analysis and that will be, you know, under consideration as we look at the protocol. I think for any sort of specific questions about the study design, I would defer back to Pfizer if they have um, additional comments on that. 
So if I may, Dr. Tisali, we, um, we, we truly didn't show interference. We just show a trend in decreased responses in the flu vaccine in a study that was not power to look at really non-inferiority. And that's why we are conducting and now completed a study with, um, with flu vaccine, actually, to see if there is interference or not. So the data is not available yet, but will be available very soon. And um, as I think I mentioned in the morning, we will be submitting that data to the FDA with potential for potential inclusion in the label. Um, in terms of um, co-administration with flu vaccine and RSV, in terms of detecting GBS in our pharmacovigilance, um, enhanced pharmacovigilance um, studies or, or um, activities, actually, we um, we collect when the information is available, but not always is available. But we made an effort to collect that concomitant administration uh, once the vaccine uh, will be approved and recommended. Okay. Um, thank you. Dr. Bernstein. Yeah, I wanted to follow up, Dr. Sally. I, I think the co-administration is, uh, is uh, very important. And I was wondering whether there was a, a study uh, to do this with COVID vaccine as well, um, because those are certainly the population that we're dealing with 60 and above or 65 and above uh, are well vaccinated, but also very uh, vulnerable. And then the other vulnerable population that I wanted to ask about was what, what plans are there for the immunocompromised populations or those that have not so stable chronic medical conditions? Yeah, um, so um, thank you for the question. In terms of concomitant uh, or co-administration or, or the future of vaccines, um, I think that I'm, I'm very excited to say that Pfizer will continue to try to bring vaccines that actually can uh, make a difference in public health. Um, this is one of the vaccines, and we are evaluating actually different respiratory combinations um, that are included as the ones that you mentioned in the future, uh, because it might be the way that some of these vaccines might be given uh, based on the seasonality and based on the fact that they're in this case, we're talking about all respiratory pathogens. Um, clearly, combination vaccines have made a difference in, pediatric, in the pediatric population, and hopefully that will be the case um, in the future as well. And I apologize because I did not. Um, at, uh, could you please repeat your second question to me? Yeah, I was interested in. Um, uh, it oh, sounds the like Sorry. the immunocompromised yeah. and yeah. those with the not so stable chronic medical uh, conditions, who both who would be very much at risk for problems uh, getting RSV. Yeah. So uh, thank you for the question. We're currently evaluating to um, a study, not the post-marketing commitment study, but the study to assess actually those who are immunocompromised. And that will be um, all ages from 18 um, all the way to older adults. Um, but also we are looking at uh, doing um, in the same study, actually having a different population for at risk uh, in those who are 18 to 60 to address some of the comments that were made today in terms of um, higher disease and higher hospitalization and mortality in those who have chronic cardiopulmonary conditions regardless of age. So that's something that I am also uh, looking forward to um, start very soon and have the data available um, for additional information uh, to, for the question that you're asking. Dr. James. My my question is 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 very related to the last question. So, but 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 maybe I'll pose it a bit differently. Um, and and to the FDA, you, you know, so the epidemiologic overview um, earlier really, you know, characterized a number of impacted populations, um, including older adults, but but also including um, individuals with you know pre pre existing conditions. And and importantly, I was struck by the racial and ethnic disparities in terms of. Um, burden of disease, and 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 so I, I guess I wonder what FDA's perspective is on, um, you know, the pursuit of data on safety and and efficacy in these other populations. Is that part of the 
post marketing um, requirements uh, that have been worked out with the sponsor. Uh, thank you for that question. I think um, we might ask uh, Dr. Alam Chand Chandri to uh, comment a little bit on if it's uh, if, if it's related to a post marketing question. Thank you. I'm so, I'm sorry, sure. This is Meghna Limtanani again. So, so for the PMRs that I said, the safety, those are really focusing on safety. We have the regulatory requirement to have these PMRs under FADA uh, for safety's, you know, purposes. For the efficacy, you know, portion, we sometimes have uh, post-marketing commitments if we have agreed upon studies with the sponsor for to look at efficacy. But I would really um, defer back to OVRR for any any questions related to post-marketing efficacy studies. Uh, thank you. We'll take that under advisement and we'll be considering that as we um as we discuss with the sponsor. Thanks. Dr. Kim. Uh, this is partly a follow-up for uh for uh, from from Dr. Jane's question, uh, as well as what Dr. Hildra had asked in the, uh, near the beginning of our discussion today, and that has to do with um, uh, racial and ethnic disparity. Uh, the data that you presented, Dr. Gerdman, uh, on on the, um, the demographics of the uh, 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 phase three, as well as uh, previous phases, um, indicated that, that there was a, a significant uh, amount of um, uh, Latinos, um, as well as African Americans and and, and, uh, and Asians. And, but the but the study studies took place in in Japan, South Africa, and elsewhere in Argentina, and, and so on. So I, the question I have is the data that you showed uh, were were aggregates from all these other all these countries in in addition to, to the United States. And uh, and if so, uh, then then the uh, uh, for example uh, the the Japanese social determinants of health and the Argentinian social determinants of health would be very different from what we would see uh, in the United States um, in in terms of uh, African Americans um, in in the United States versus African Amer Africans in South Africa. Um, it, so the data we have is. Uh, are related um, uh, are more of a more of a national difference. Uh, so for the U.S., uh, um, do you have any additional information on uh, on how the uh, how the vaccination uh, impacted the American uh, uh, population uh, with regards to this intervention? Yeah. So um, uh, thank you, Dr. Kim, for, for your question. And, and you are correct. The data that I presented is aggregate data for all the countries. Uh, about 63% of the participants came from the United States. And most of the cases actually came from the United States. So I think that vaccine efficacy, efficacy that I presented today um, is, is highly representative of the US population. But also we saw consistency of vaccine efficacy across the other countries that had sufficient cases for us to be able to evaluate that. Um, it, I want to emphasize that we really strive at Pfizer to enroll a diverse population. We understand how critical it is to have uh, participants that are representative of every um, ethnic um, you know, and race uh, group to ensure that the data as an aggregate actually is representative of the population. For the US, um, as I mentioned, because of the most of the cases came from the U.S., I I I do think that um, it is representative. Thanks for that additional information. Doctor Feiken. Yeah, I have a, a question for FDA and a question for uh, Pfizer. Um, for F I, so I, I want to circle back to the, to the atrial fibrillation question. I, I was able in the break to go back and 
I realized I was looking at an earlier briefing document, um, and in a later briefing document, it, it did mention the, the uh, atrial fibrillation uh, imbalance. Uh, so my question is to the safety um, follow-up uh, post, post-marketing, post um, whether FDA is considered uh, also looking at, at atrial fibrillation, um, potentially given the, the, the possible um, class effect um, for for this this type of vaccine, RSV prefusion vaccine in, in the elderly. I think we'll be seeing some other data uh, tomorrow. Uh, so that's the first question is, is to Pfizer, uh, sorry, to FDA about that. Uh, my question to Pfizer is, um, you know, many, many of us have noted that the lack of, of efficacy data for severe disease, which is which is ultimately what, what we want to pre- prevent. Um, and I think there were only two cases that met the severe case definition. Um, I, I'm wondering if, if, that, if that is lower than you expected. It seems, I, I don't know the exact rates, but it, it seems to be quite low given the size of, of the study that, um, that there were only two, two severe um, cases of, of RSV LRTI. Um, and I think maybe only one of them was hospitalized, but I'm not sure about that. But just wondering if that is lower than you expected, and if so, why? So I um, uh, I can start with the Pfizer or, or the FDA first, and then second. Um, well, maybe I will start. Since yeah, I, sure, go ahead. I have yeah. The microphone. So, um, so thank you for the question. So a couple of things. Um, we had very high vaccine efficacy rate right, of 85.7. And with the new data I show you about end of season, uh, one of about 89% against three plus symptoms. And those participants clearly had a much more compromised clinical presentation. Um, there is no reason for us to think that if the vaccine was so highly effective on those who had three plus symptoms will be as high or even higher, uh, present higher efficacy for those who have severe disease. And we have seen this recently with the COVID vaccine, for example, where we have been able to prevent the most severe cases such as you know, death and hospitalization and similar for the flu vaccine with, um, for example, ICU admissions. With respect to the question, so we have, um, we have four pneumonias um, out of the cases that I presented today and two of those were hospitalized, and the two hospitalizations were in the placebo group, and the four pneumonias were in the placebo group. Um, The reason why we didn't see more severe cases uh, is probably multifactorial. One of the reasons is potentially related to the COVID pandemic, and um, how I speak came back, and actually we are detecting uh, probably a five to six fold lower in the study that we would have seen uh, prior to the pandemic. But the other piece which was uh, mentioned this morning is that the protocol accepted actually PCR testing if it was done at the hospital level. But as it was mentioned this morning, we don't have great RSV testing when patients are hospitalized. So some of, um, I can tell you that the two cases of hospitalization, actually one was, a, a, a local PCR testing and the other one was a, a central one. So it's, 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 a, it's multifactorial. So I think it's the pandemic, the rate, the lack of RSV testing. Um, patients who are very sick usually don't get to self you know, swab before they go to, to the hospital. They just go to the emergency room. Um, and But I, having said all of that and having seen such high vaccine efficacy, in the three plus symptoms, I think that um, hopefully we will have the opportunity to uh, see the true impact of the vaccine on post licensure studies. Did you collect uh, information on all cause respiratory hospitalizations? We did not. We did not um, collect that information in the study. And we only did PCR testing for uh, RSV <clears throat> centrally. Okay, hi, this is Meg Nalam Chandani from FDA. So I think your your first question, uh, uh, Dr. Fakin, was about 
uh, AFib and what we're going to do for post market safety. Correct. Um, so we are. So we under our post market safety regulations for certain adverse events of special interest, we can implement enhanced pharmacovigilance. So we are uh, discussing that with the applicant, and we want them to uh, submit reports to us for all AFib and supraventricular tachycardias as expedited reports and provide um, sort of aggregate analysis in their periodic safety report. So that's our plan for now to do the enhanced pharmacovigilance. And if there is new safety information in the post-market sort of post period, that may trigger additional actions. Thank you. Any additional questions? I see Dr. James. Yes, if it's all right, I have one more question for, for FDA, um, and it, it's somewhat of a rephrase of a question that's been asked before, but I, I wonder if um, our FDA colleagues can help us, um, you know, gauge the, the importance of the strength of evidence here. So, so what we've been presented is, a, is, a, is evidence from a, a single phase three trial that, that has, a, you know, a fairly modest number of primary endpoint events, 44 primary endpoint events. Um, and um, it, it admittedly, it was it was done in a, in a global context, and um, and 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 enrolled a, not, a, a large number of individuals in order to accrue that number of events. But but I'm wondering if FDA can can provide us a little bit more background and rationale in terms of the 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 strength of evidence that that they deem is needed to to justify um, approval for a product such as this. A, a sing, again. Um, on what basis would a single uh, phase three efficacy trial um, with data as of an interim analysis um, be deemed uh, adequate for um, for a licensure rec recommendation? Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. So as we've mentioned, the data that uh, that the applicant has submitted, it was acceptable for BLA submission. And um, so now at this point, um, that's what we are looking to hopefully um, generate conversation about today, um, whether or not the advisory committee um, agrees that the data presented um, demonstrates adequate safety and efficacy. Um, so we're looking forward to the conversation. Thank you. Any additional questions to the FDA, the sponsor, or the CDC from the committee members? I don't see any hands, but I hope I didn't miss any. Okay, so that concludes uh, this portion of the meeting, whereby we ask questions to the presenters and the FDA. Uh, we take a 10 minute break and we reconvene during which we will uh, deliberate as a committee the two questions and then vote on the two questions. So now it's uh, 1.14 or 2.14. So we will reconvene at uh, 2.15. Uh, I'm sorry, 2.24.
Dr. Pedar, can we resume? Um, yes, please go ahead. Um, we will have the question, uh, voting question number one uh, from, for the committee. And um, so we will discuss that first before we go into voting session. Very good. And are you going to put it on the screen? Yes, there it is. There we go. Uh, welcome back, uh, dear committee members. Um, <clears throat> Uh, for this uh, next uh, portion of the program, we will uh, go over two voting questions. The goal is to divide our time 50-50 between both questions or close to it. Uh, the way you know we envision this going is that we discuss question one. Uh, Dr. Uh, Pedar will, will uh, ask us to vote and after we vote, uh, we go around the virtual table and ask for uh, final comments from each member, from each voting member. So uh, I will read the voting question and I ask that um, uh, everyone use the hand uh, function again in Zoom so I can call on your name uh, to, to discuss your viewpoint uh, pertaining to the first question. Um, so the voting question number one, are the available data adequate to support the safety of Abrisvo RSV pre-F when administered to individuals 60 years of age and older for the prevention of lower respiratory tract disease caused by RSV? And uh, to start us off will be Dr. Portnoy. Great, great, thank you. See, I've learned the trick of hitting the raised hand early so I get in early. Um, I just wanted to make a few comments before we vote on these two questions, and this one in particular. I'm a pediatrician. Uh, every year during the fall, I see, and, and in the winter, I see epidemics of kids in the emergency room and in the hospital with RSV. It's a total disaster this year. The emergency room was completely filled. Uh, so I'm very aware of the importance of getting a vaccine for this disease. It's been the scourge for as long as I've been in practice. As an older adult, I wasn't aware that it affects older adults as much as it apparently does. Uh, so it is a little bit eye-opening. Um, my comment is that I would have liked Pfizer to have completed all of the studies before submitting it for uh, licensure. Uh, I'm used to emergency use authorizations from COVID. I've seen the data there. It is urgent. It, that's why it was submitted and approved before all of the data were in. This is not an emergency. This thing has been around for as long as I've been in practice. Um, I would like to see it, but I think it's a little premature. I would really like to have seen them complete all of the studies before submitting it. Um, I have to admit, I'm reassured that there are no major safety signals and including enhanced disease. I wasn't aware that it wasn't a problem in adults, but in pediatrics, it's going to be an issue that we'll have to discuss. We definitely need a vaccine. This is a good start, but I really would have liked to have seen them complete all of the studies before they submitted it for full licensure. Um, so thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Portnoy. Dr. Griffin. Uh, yeah, I'd say I think the... Um... There are safety concerns. And I think when you talk about safety, it's always a benefit risk. So I think um, I would be less concerned about safety in a population that had a very high, if we knew the population was a very high hospitalization risk, we're gonna receive a benefit. So unfortunately, the, the population that was studied was underrepresented with these frail people. And so it's really hard to make a, um, when there's this huge safety question of Guillain-Barre, um, to say that, that um, that's not a concern because I think the benefit uh, for relatively healthy uh, older people is not, you have to consider that, is not that great compared to a possible high risk of a very severe outcome. Okay, thank you, Dr. Griffin. I do not see hands risen, but this is the portion where even if you have minor or no 
uh, consideration, I'm going to ask your uh, your opinion. Uh, oh, I see Dr. Bernstein. Dr. Bernstein. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Sally. Sorry about that. Um, so I, I, I don't know. I'm 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 a bit challenged by this. I mean, after decades of scientific study, this R RSV vaccine really shows incredible promise, and an RSV vaccine could have immense impact on a really very common respiratory pathogen. But I do think that there are a lot of concerns that I think we probably need a little bit more data. I'm concerned about the safety signal with GBS or inflammatory neuropathy. I think the amount of there's only a modest amount of data on the most vulnerable uh, populations. I think there's limited co-administration experience uh, with this vaccine, with high dose influenza and COVID vaccines, the VE for hospitalization and death is unknown or not documented well at this point. And the data, at least most that was presented, only reflects the one RSV season. And maybe we should be waiting for the year two data and look at it uh, all in total, especially with the fact that there was interseason RSV during the pandemic. And so I don't know whether the seasonal pattern will continue or whether we'll need to be concerned about interseason play. So those are my my real concerns, why I'm challenged about voting on this at the moment. Thank you, Dr. Bernstein. Uh, Dr. Pergam. Yeah, um, if you can see me or not, oh, there we go. Yeah, I, you know, I have similar concerns to what have been raised um, by others. It, it feels as though a lot of the responses that we were expecting or were wondering about, that study's done, but the data hasn't been analyzed yet. Um, the data, the year two data is there, but we don't have it. There's the finalized flu and RSV um, you know, combo study that's completed, but the data hasn't been analyzed. These are big questions that are important as we get into the season about who should be getting this and why. I think the safety signals, I'm not overly concerned, but I think there's a really good plan of action for how to approach this. But I think, you know, following COVID, where there's been so much pushback around myocarditis and other complications and how that's had a larger effect on, on vaccine confidence, I think it's critically important for us to make sure that we're making a decision that's, that also includes these, these safety evaluations. So I think the additional data would be helpful in terms of understanding that. I do think there are some aspects of this that are intriguing, of course, because this you know does um, look to have good efficacy. Uh, I think it's very interesting that the data also suggests there's longer potential benefits for maybe even up to 12 months and potentially additional protection uh, but that's still not super clear yet. I, I, my biggest concern, is, as others have talked about, is that the population that was studied is really not those who are high-risk patients. And these were um, very stable patients, very um, selected to be healthy um, with you know, potential to pro you know, produce good immune responses, but really were not ones that had the efficacy endpoints that were so necessary for, for decision-making, I think, for all of us. So. Um, those are my specific concerns. Thank you. <clears throat> I do not see raised hands, so I'm gonna start asking for your opinions. Oh, Dr. Cohen. Thanks. Um, I echo uh, much of what's already been said. I struggle with this a little bit because um, this is such amazing data that we have on efficacy for an RSV vaccine in this population, in this age group. So it's at, it's both um, amazing to see that it looks like we have a vaccine that, that may work. Um, but I also feel like this is a little, I, I would love to see more time, um, more efficacy data and um, have a better sense of a, whether or not this vaccine will protect those who are at most risk, as well as whether or not 
this is um, going to inevitably become an annual vaccination or if we um, will get more than one season uh, from uh, a single dose. Okay, thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Cohen. Uh, Dr. Feiken, if we can also focus on the safety question, it'd be great because we're gonna have also another uh, session dedicated to voting question two, which uh, centers around efficacy of the product. Okay, well, thanks for saying that because uh, I, I do have more, more comments about the efficacy, but I do have a couple about the safety. Um, I agree with others that the, the, the GBS uh, signal is potentially there. I, I do feel like it was only, it was only two cases. Um, you know, if you look at the rate, it, 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 it would be on the high end of what would be expected. Um, but given the fact that, it, that it's only two cases, both of which had a, um, a potential other explanation uh, for the GBS, um, I'd, I'd feel a bit more comfortable in doing a, a detailed safety follow-up post, post-marketing. I, I, do, I don't think the second season data is going to help us much with the safety aspects because the vaccination, if I understand, is finished. Uh, and you wouldn't expect to see uh, to see vaccine related uh, GBS in in the second year of follow up. So I'm not sure how we're going to get more data on a GBS signal. Uh, I mean, this was a this was a study of of uh, you know 30, 35, 40,000 people. Um, so I, I'm not sure where that data would come, except in a in a post marketing setting. Over. Okay, thank you. I mean, I know the issue of uh, the MI has been invoked as a trigger, but to my knowledge, this is not an important trigger for GBS, uh, having cardiovascular events. I mean, is it the stress? Um, I don't know. Uh, Dr. Berger? So I don't have an answer for the question you just posed, but so I'll just I'll just go forward. I think I agree um, with exactly what Dr. Feigen just relayed. I, I think there are some concerns around the safety signals that we've seen, particularly around GBS uh, and AFib. Um, even though that is a numerical differentiation, you know, I will say I I, I also agree though that there is this post marketing surveillance study that's been uh, that's being agreed to, where those types of signals will be meted out. Uh, you know, from if if I'm ignoring all the vaccine efficacy questions that we'll we'll get to, from a safety standpoint, uh, you know, I agree. I mean, this was thirty five thousand uh, people involved in the study. It's going, you know, I'm not sure we're going to see it in a different way. So I, I think the post market surveillance studies are going to be essential to move forward here, um, you know, if this does get approved. Okay. Um, I do not see any hands. So I'm going to ask Dr. Holly James to weigh in. Um, I, I don't think I have much to add in terms of safety. I, I agree that that um, you know that, that 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 really the place to definitively nail whether there's a, a concern with these very rare events is in the post marketing surveillance. So I'll reserve further comments for the efficacy. Thank you. Okay, uh, Dr. Hildreth. Uh, thank you. I agree with my colleagues, and my main concern is that the the uh, immunity seems to wane fairly, I don't know, relatively quickly for for these vaccines. So there have to be boosters probably given uh, every year, and so with the safety profile for the revaccination be different than it is for the primary. So that would be my my concern. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Um, Dr. Perlman? Yeah, I, th I think what I was thinking was has been well discussed by previous people on the on this uh, meeting. Uh, I am I'm pretty concerned about the GPS after having the swine flu in the 70s since I'm old enough to remember that and also living through all the COVID-19 vaccine stuff where 
we have abysmal uh, booster rates because of people's concerns, most of not valid. So I, I just don't want, I'm, I'm very nervous about having any uh, safety feature come up, even in post-marketed surveys, because it'll affect both this population and then uptake of the vaccine for babies, where we know already that the COVID-19 vaccine is not taken up uh, particularly well for the little children. But on the other hand, I also appreciate the argument that we're never going to get the data to know whether the GBS and atrial fib are really issues until we do a post-marketing survey. So I guess I would vote in favor of saying that safety is okay, but with a really, really careful post-marketing evaluation. Okay, uh, Dr. Kim, I think. Well, thank you. I, you know, given the question, given the voting question uh, one here, we don't have any more data that we, we're going to be uh, that we're going to be presented with. Uh, in uh, now or in the immediate future, because the the safety data that are what they are. Uh, so therefore, uh, is that enough to is that enough to make a make a decision on the on the safety issue on this? And and uh, the concerns aside, post marketing uh, further post marketing uh, analyses pending and and th those other things in place. I think um, I think given uh, the task at hand. On voting question one is is it's actually uh, I appreciate that uh, that the other committee members have expressed uh, concerns uh, regarding Guillain-Barré syndrome and uh, and and other uh, adverse uh, adverse events, but um, but given the available data, is that adequate? Uh, I think uh, to me, I think the uh, the the answer is fairly fairly straightforward on this. Um, uh, on the, uh, uh, the, uh, the is given the, the safety on this is that going to be beneficial in the long run uh, and provide the protection that uh, that people need? So, um, so it's um, uh, obviously other things need to take place down the line uh, as far as the product continued product evaluation is concerned. So that uh, that that's a reassurance that I need. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kim. Um... I think uh, everyone uh, had an opportunity to um, discuss the issue of uh, the safety. Uh, I'm, I'm going to read the question, are the available data adequate? Um, reading the briefing document and um, listening to the presentation today, Two issues uh, rise to the top uh, when it comes to safety. Uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome, of course. The 1976 uh, influenza program uh, was, was a, a, you know, it's still fresh in our minds. I, I know Dr. Perlman said it's old, but it's, it's really not. It's, it's part of the reason why we follow GBS so closely on every clinical trial. And the disease has an incidence of one in 100,000 in this population, but what we are seeing here is more like one in 9,000. Um, so this is major in terms, if we, are, if we take it at, at, at this level, given that because it's two events, the confidence interval around this estimation would be wide, but nonetheless, it's uh, significant. Uh, um, in terms of, of incidence. Uh, the other issue is, and I know I brought it a couple of times, but it does pertain to safety. The study that evaluated the co-administration of influenza and Abrisvo is a 1,200-plus person study. Um, and individuals were administered different doses with uh, of uh, the RSV vaccine with or without influenza. There was no interference with the RSV antibodies, but there was trend of interference for the, with the uh, HAI. Uh, we are not presented with, that with the magnitude of, of that interference. So th that is also, even, even if uh, there's a follow-up study, 
And that study is better powered to answer this question. I mean, we've seen a lot of data where we say, see it and we say that, well, probably there is, we can't say either way, but I also find it um, intriguing that neither the data from the 1200 person study were shared and there are outstanding data that can definitely inform this question, which has important safety implications for the population in whom a brisvo will be given. We do know for a fact that influenza vaccine in this population prevents hospitalization and death by virtue of how the study population on this trial were enrolled, meaning 1% CHF, 5% COPD, and these are the two subgroups in whom the majority of the events would have happened, so they are a minority. So we could not uh, learn more about uh, the, the hospitalization and death uh, because in this trial. So we are left with an outstanding question for which data exists elsewhere. Uh, and that that weighs a lot in, in how we can, at least for me, answer this question. Um, any final thoughts from any of our committee members or from the FDA before we turn over to Susan for the um, voting? We have one raised hand. Let's see, Dr. Korn. Thanks, Dr. Al Um, are, So, are we? We're going to vote on this question before discussing the second question. Yes. So right. the way the way the flow is, we discuss, we vote, we uh, explain the vote, and then we move to question number two. Okay. Um, I guess so. First of all, I agree with you. I think that, um, and I apologize for for messing up my thoughts last time, but no, it's there's there's available data here that we haven't seen yet, and I feel like we, if this large outbreak hadn't occurred last fall, I don't know that we would be in a place where we're being asked about this without the co-administration and other available data um, or data that will be available in the next several months. Um, I think, you know, the timing is, um, you know, feels rushed. I, um, I don't think that this is a viable vaccination program if we have to administer flu vaccine and this vaccine and maybe even COVID vaccine separately. Um, so I, I, as you were saying that, it, it struck me that I agree this is a safety issue because it would be potentially interfering with influenza vaccine effectiveness. Um, and um, it, it does seem like um, inevitably this vaccine will be co-administered if, if it is recommended and, and authorized. Um, so it, it does feel like, um, and licensed, but it does feel like um, I, I would love to hear from the FDA, like what would happen if we needed to wait for some of that additional data to be presented? Uh, yeah, that would be a great question. Um, those two studies would be very informative. Anyone from the FDA to answer Dr. Cohen's question and, and my concern? Can you hear me, uh, David? Yes, we can. No, no question. I just think that this discussion is absolutely essential in terms of our regulatory review process and incredibly helpful. Um, and, and, and you're delivering exactly what we wanted, which was a, a robust discussion around the both the safety topics and the efficacy topics. OK, thank you, Dr. Castle. We have time for more comments, if anyone has any. I do not, oh, there's one hand. Let's see. No. Dr. Perlman, uh, Dr. Perlman. Yeah, so I would, I just want to ask Dr. Kessler if he can give a more definitive answer on whether we can postpone this and get more information. Yeah, I knew what you were thinking. That was going to make some changes there. Dr. Dr. Kessler, you're very, uh, you, you, your microphone is very uh, distant. We can't hear so, you. I, again, I, th I think we're looking to the advisory committee to provide input to the FDA in terms of the timing of this, of this approval. And, and these voting questions have been crafted specifically to ask that question. 
And so, um, yeah, I think your input would be <laughs> considered as will the vote. Okay. Dr. Portnoy. Right. Um, I guess, I guess my last comment, given our recent exposure with uh, experience with COVID, um, I think we have to be really careful before we send a vaccine out to cover large groups of patients, given the hesitancy that occurred surrounding COVID vaccine, which turned out to be a very safe vaccine. The public is very skeptical and in order to maintain uh, the trust that the FDA gets from the public and perhaps to rebuild that trust, we need to make sure that we're really careful about the safety of a vaccine before we send it out to uh, immunize a large population of people. We just need to be very careful that we have all of the data that we need in order to confidently say that this is a safe vaccine and that the risk of getting the vaccine is less than the risk of having the infection. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Portnoy. Dr. Bernstein. Yeah, this is um, uh, just a, a question and then maybe I should know the answer, but um, was the submission for BLA, is that, it, was it a surprise to the FDA or is this normal that people, that industry would pre uh, present interim uh, data that's to some extent incomplete at the moment, given their original study that they've been working on. Is that, was this initiated by the company? Was the FDA asking for an interim analysis? I was, uh, I was just wondering what the logistics were. That's a great question. So, um, as a standard for all submissions, um, uh, companies are required to meet specific criteria before they can submit uh, to the FDA their application. Um, once we receive their application, we then review their application. Um, and the application submission is typically based off of predefined criteria that the company has established um, and has uh, discussed with the FDA. Now, the question of whether or not companies have come in previously with interim analyses, the answer is yes. There have been um, examples of vaccines in the past that have used case-driven and interim analyses um, to meet their specific endpoints. And so that's exactly what um, Dr. Castle was mentioning is that um, while this, this, this application has met criteria for submission and for our review, um, we really are eager to continue this discussion um, that the advisory committee is to help guide us um, in our, our decisions going forward. Thank you. Dr. Kohn. Thank you. I'm sorry to be, um, uh, this is a little bit of an off-base question, but I'm wondering if anybody from the FDA um, can Tell us what, um, can remind us what happened with the, I believe it was the two-dose hepatitis B vaccine, where there was a similar, very, very small but important signal in the original safety um, uh, trial. Did, has there been, has been I, I think my question is, has there been an example of, um, of additional, of FDA asking for uh, additional uh, safety analyses or increasing the uh, size of the safety um, analysis um, with these small but pot potentially important signals? Or have you always relied on post-marketing data, which um, you know is, is obviously going to be the, the fastest and easiest way to detect um, an increased risk? Hi, can you please repeat that question one second? Um, can you repeat that question for us, please? Sure, sure. I think I'm asking if there's ever been a time where uh, regarding a small but potentially very important safety uh, risk in a, in a large clinical trial, if there's ever been a time when FDA has gone back and asked the company for it, to expand the size of their vaccinated population um, just to assess safety. Yes, hi, good afternoon. My name is Joe Turner. I'm the acting um, 
um, deputy office director, um, Office of Vaccine Research and Review. In my previous roles at FDA, I have been um, involved in uh, post-marketing activities. And, um, you know, I, I don't have a specific example in response to your question, but just to say in general, when FDA is considering a post-marketing uh, requirement, and as you know, FDA now has the authority to require post-marketing studies, I can tell you that when FDA is um, discussing with uh, applicants about the context of post-marketing studies, that, um, that, that the answer to the safety question um, really should, should the, 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 in other words, the, 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 the post-marketing study should be able to answer and best characterize the safety uh, uh, um, signal in the post-market setting. Um, so in addition to routine pharmacovigilance that's done for any you know, post-licensure um, vaccine, there is also an ability for FDA to require uh, post-marketing studies specifically to best characterize uh, an adverse event um, signal. And so I think, you know, what we want to hear from you know from your vote and your discussion today is what you know what, what is your opinion of this uh of the safety data that uh, were under reviewed uh, by FDA currently and uh what um you know what is your best opinion uh so that FDA can move forward with the BLA review of safety and efficacy um in this uh, application thank you Thank you, Dr. Turner. So as I understand it, is weighing on the data as is, not on the data as might be in the future, right? Okay. Um, Dr. Feiken? Yeah, hi. I I have some questions around the um, this issue of co-administration with influenza vaccine. Um, and, and here, I mean, maybe to get some clarity from FDA on sort of what the difference is between what we vote on and what ACIP votes on. Um, you know, I, I take uh, Dr. Cohn's comment that, that in practice, this vaccine would likely be given at the same time as the influenza vaccine. Um, but... In, in theory, it doesn't have to be given at the same time. And um, whether we are, are, you know, certainly as, as ACIP, when, you're, uh, when they make recommendations on policy, they would consider the practical features of how the vaccine would be optimally used. But for us voting uh, uh, for VRPAC, are, are we to consider the, the policy and the, the, the the implications of, of how these vaccines will be used or rather how they work given the data that, that we've seen today, because it, 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 is, it is possible that we could just evaluate uh, the, efficacy, the efficacy data given what we've seen today uh, and that ACIP could then say, well, we don't have, we don't have enough co-administration data to recommend use with influenza vaccine. So just to get some clarity on how we should be viewing this as a, as a strictly uh, sort of uh, vaccine performance type vote, or, or, and, or are we actually to consider policy here? And I do notice from the report that the, the data on the co-administration study should be available by Q2 2023. So I guess the question there is if we were to wait to get that data uh, what would be the timelines for the next RSV season? Would that be too late? Uh, which I, I think is of some consideration here. Yes, thank you. So thank you for um, that clarifying question. So um, exactly as you stated, our goal for this committee is that you vote on the data as is. Um, our job as the regulators would be to determine whether or not the vaccine is safe and effective. And we are hoping for your advice in that regard. The ACIP would do additional um, voting um, uh, subsequently to determine um, who, when, and, and uh, et cetera, might receive the vaccine. Um, I hope that answered your question. Um, did you have a follow-up question? Sorry, I might've missed it. Um. 
It was just a comment that, that the data on the immunogenicity, uh, sorry, of the co-administration would be available by Q2 2023 and what, what that would do to the timelines for, um, for a potential um, approval of this vaccine. Um, I can only speak to the data that we do have available at this time. Um, however, uh, Dr. Marks is also on the line and I'd like to turn um, the microphone to him for a moment. Thank you. Thanks, and I'm sorry that I'm, uh, I'm not able to be on camera. I think, again, we, we have to judge this on its own uh, and not, we, we, we are not in a position that, at this point to require a co-administration study. We have to essentially look at what we have in front of us and look at the benefits and risks for this particular vaccine uh, given a, a problem that, uh, you know, I, I think the, the issue here that, and this goes back to the question about why are we talking about this now? It's because obviously RSV uh, is a pretty serious respiratory infection. And so this was the reason for uh, trying to, I think, where the sponsors tried to move forward with this, given uh, the uh, earlier part of this season where there was a uh, pretty big scare with RSV. So I think there is there is some rationale of what's going on in the background here. Um, uh, for uh, some urgency to having an RSV vaccine. And the agency, based on your feedback, can use a variety of different tools, um, including different approval strategies, and in, uh, as well as uh, potentially requiring uh, post-marketing studies uh, to help clarify remaining uncertainties. Over. Thank you, Dr. Marks. Um, Dr. Dr. James. Um, I thank you. I have I have two data questions that are prompted by by this discussion um, that 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 could could provide a, a little more evidence on on the the issue of potential uh, interference with the um, immune responses to the flu vaccine. I, I wonder for the sponsor whether or not there is a um, sort of broad ILI. Uh, endpoint that, that was captured in this study that, that would include both potentially RSV infections as well as influenza infections that might shed some light in terms of the um, the overall impact of the vaccine on influenza-like illness and, and relatedly whether there's data in the in the phase three study on the extent of flu vaccination um, that, that might help interpret that overall endpoint. Thank you. Yeah, it's Alejandra Gertman. Uh, I just want to check that you can hear me. We can hear you. Yeah, okay. Thank you. So um, the study was designed, since we didn't have information about the flu vaccine, to not allow co-administration of the vaccine at the same time. So we have a temporary delay criteria for which um, the two vaccines could not be given together. Uh, and if they were given together, that will constitute a protocol violation. In terms of collecting information, uh, we tested PCR for RSV and we collected information if the testing was done uh, for medical care and not as part of the study. And at this time, I do not have information about the flu. I do have some information about COVID, um, you know, how prevalent COVID was when we we're doing the study, uh, but we can go back definitely and look um, at uh, diagnosis of flu vaccine, um, diagnosis of flu influenza in participants in the study. Any final thoughts, additional thoughts, questions? Um, Dr. Pedar, should we be voting now? I don't see any raised hands, unless the, anyone from the FDA needs to make a final comment, uh, then we can proceed. And Dr. Elton Solly, no, thank you, thank you to the committee for a very robust discussion on, on the safety topic. I, I do think it would be useful to, to vote on the question now.
Right, Tana, I will go ahead and um, read the instructions for the voting and then we will begin. Um, only our nine regular members and three member, um, three temporary voting members, a total of 12 will be voting in today's meeting. With regards to the voting process, Dr. El Sali will read the final voting question for the record and afterwards all regular voting members and temporary voting members will cast their vote by selecting one of the voting options, yes, no, or abstain. You'll have one minute to cast your vote after the question is read. Please note that once you have cast your vote, you may change your vote within the one minute time frame. However, once the poll is closed, all votes will be considered final. Once all the votes have been placed, we'll broadcast the results and read the individual votes aloud for the public record. If um, Does anyone have any questions related to the voting process before we begin? Anyone? Very good. Okay, Dr. El Sali, if you could please um, read the voting question number one for the record. Sure. Are the available data adequate to support the safety of ABRIS RSV PREF when administered to individuals 60 years of age and older for the prevention of lower respiratory tract disease caused by RSV? Thank you. Um, at this point, Derek will move all the non-voting members outside the main room. Uh, for folks who are not voting, please uh, do not log out of Zoom. We'll be back uh, in a few minutes. Thank you so much. Derek, let us know when all the voting members are present.
We are ready to display. Great, thank you, Derek. Um, so um, there are 12 total voting members for today's meeting. 58%, seven out of 12 have voted, um, have voted yes, 33% have voted no, and 8% have abstained from voting. Um, if I could see the Excel to read for the recording for the public record. Okay, so at this point, I'm gonna uh, read the votes one by one for the public record. Um, David Kim voted yes. Marie Griffin, no. Um, Stephen uh, Pergam, yes. Henry Bernstein, no. Stanley Perlman, abstain. Dr. El Sali, chair, no. Jay Portnoy, yes. Um, Adam Berger, yes. Holly Janes, yes. James Hildreth, no. Daniel Feiken, yes. Amanda Cohn, yes. Um, Dr. Osali, if you would like to begin the voting explanation for voting question one, that would be great. Thank you. Sure. Um, I will go down the list as uh, displayed. Uh, Dr. Kim. Well, thank you. I voted yes. Uh, and, and as I indicated earlier, um, the, the we have the data that we have. Uh, and then we were asked to make a decision based on the data that we have. So I was interpreting the question very narrowly. Uh, so I wasn't uh, necessarily taking into consideration what ifs or, or uh, uh, taking into consideration other data that might be forthcoming. So for what we have today, and given the charge that we are given today, uh, I felt compelled to say yes, because the uh, the information we have uh, does, uh, does encourage us to uh, to be to be able to proceed with the uh, with the use of vaccine based on its safety data. Dr. Griffin? Uh, yeah, I had, um, you know, the data we have today, I guess, um, there's one in 9,000 people had GBS, which is really concerning. Uh, we don't have administration on, uh, data on co-administration, which is a safety issue. And we don't have information on repeat vaccination, which is a, also a potential safety issue. So I feel like we don't, have, uh, I'm not assured of the safety of this vaccine. Thank you. Dr. Pergam. Yeah, I, I, I'd sort of, um, in the same camp as um, Dr. Kim, where I sort of looked at the data we had available. Um, I'm concerned about the flu vaccine, um, um, at least what has been discussed, but without seeing data, um, I didn't feel like I could um, include that a part, of, a part of my discussion and my thought process. I think in order to really get at the, the, the crux of the GBS, the GBS question, it, it, it's almost an impossibility without post-marketing data for the, the small number of cases that would be seen. And even if we did another 40,000 patients with a study and we saw no cases, would that still mean there's no potential risk? I think that's a hard decision to make. So I, I'm, I felt um, compelled that the data looked um, safe, although clearly more work needs to be done in that post-marketing surveillance, which I think they outlined well and would work really closely with the FDA to accomplish. Dr. Bernstein? Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. Sally. I, I voted uh, no because um, I, I am concerned about the safety signal, and if it was really just the safety signal, I might have been convinced based on the data discussed today that we could have, um, uh, that the safety uh, data was adequate, but I am really concerned about the co-administration as well with flu vaccine and with um, co-administration with COVID vaccine. These respiratory viruses, we need uh, as many of the public vaccinated as uh, possible, and I would not want to take two steps forward and three steps back. Uh, if there was a, a real problem with co-administration. Thank you. Dr. Perlman? Yeah, I think I had the same opinions as other people, and I ended up more wishy-washy, so abstaining. <laughs> yes. I, th I think that the I'm most concerned about these things like the GBS and maybe the atrial fib. Uh, but on the other hand, I also don't think we're going to get the information without a post-marketing study. So that's why... I came out as an abstain. Dr. Portnoy.
Dr. Portnoy, you may be on mute. I'm trying, I was trying to unmute my phone and my clicker didn't click in the right place. Okay. Uh, th thank you. I, I kind of agree with uh, the other people who voted uh, yes. Um, I, I felt comforted that there was a pretty large number of people who were exposed to the vaccine and there were no obvious uh, or significant signals that occurred in those individuals. Uh, there are always is a possibility that less frequently, uh, less frequent adverse events like GBS could show up over time, but you know, you can go for uh, a very long time before you can identify those very infrequent uh, events. And I, I don't think that it's necessary to wait for that. They'll show up if they're gonna show up. The data that we have right now to consider though did not show any significant uh, adverse problems. So I felt comfortable voting yes on this question. Dr. Berger? I'm not sure. I'm not sure I can add any more than what everyone else who's voted yes before me has already stated. I, you know, I think I agree you know, with where everyone is. I think I think I, I do have concern clearly about the safety signals that were that were detected in the studies. Um, I do think the post marketing surveillance studies are are where we're going to get better answers to that. Uh, Yet yeah, the fact is, and I, and I think a couple of people have already stated this that data is not going to be coming from a, a trial. It is going to be resting on that post-marketing surveillance. Uh, so at, at this point, I think in terms of whether the safety, you know, the, the, the data we have is going to be adequate, it, it is the data we have. Um, and, and at this point, I, I think I agree with Dr. Boyd Portnoy, uh, you know, who just stated nicely that, you know, the signals that, that we're seeing from, you know, other, you know, other types of scenarios are not seen in the data itself. Um, the, the limited signals we do have, you know, we, we definitely need a much larger population to be able to see um, see whether those are real or what the actual uh, amounts are that they're going to be, you know, the ratios that will come out for those. So, uh, you know, from that, I, I felt that I could vote yes at this point uh, with a heavy lean towards the, the real requirements of that post-market surveillance study. Dr. James. Um, I, I, I agree with the, the comments that were just made and, and my rationale for the safety determinations as it pertains to the um, Guillain-Barre and, and, and additional potential safety signals in terms of the potential interference with flu vaccine immune responses. I guess I came down on, um, you know, interpreting quite literally, you know, the, the safety package that was presented here, which, which basically pertains to safety and efficacy of the vaccine when not administered concurrent with flu vaccination. And, and, and in, in that context, I, I, I felt that this was a reasonable package of safety and, and ultimately that the potential interference is uh, a, a very tricky and complicated question. Um, but I, I guess I view it more as an implementation question as opposed to um, pertinent to, to our considerations here. Okay, thank you. Dr. Hildreth? Uh, thank you. I voted no because I'm concerned about the guillain uh signal. I'm also concerned that the public is hypersensitive to using post-marketing uh, to answer some of these questions because it makes it feel like they're being experimented on. And that's a real concern about the trust that the public has for the FDA, so that needs to be protected. So I think we need to do everything we can to make sure the vaccines are safe before we uh, send them out to the public in large numbers. So that's why I voted no. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hildreth, Dr. Feipen. I voted yes. Um, I feel like as others have stated, for GBS uh, being a, a rare complication that we, we, we're just not going to be able to get the data we need to, to make a decision um, except for, for post-marketing surveillance where we need um, millions of people to, to detect uh, a safety signal there. And, I, and, and even though this is all about safety, I, I can't help but think about the uh, risk-benefit uh, analysis and, and ratio of uh, the amount of disease, severe disease potentially that could be prevented by this vaccine. Um, I also agree with Dr. James that to me, the co-administration is really a question of implementation and, um, 
an optimal use policy rather than, than one of safety. So I think that would, would not concern us here today in this vote. Thank you. Dr. Cohn? Thank you. Um, this was actually a, a very challenging um, vote uh, for me today. I um, did land at yes. I think if you take um, what Dr. Hildreth and Dr. Feiken said, I, I felt both of those things very strongly. Um, and I and I uh, think Dr. Hildreth just, just um, illustrated the, the concern I have about post-marketing surveillance. Um, but also um, understanding that it, it really is going to be the only way to um, get at the GBS uh, question um, quickly and at the same time be able to use a vaccine that um, will protect against what can be a very serious disease in older adults. Um, I do hope and know that FDA will do a, a really strong job at um, both ensuring that the post-marketing surveillance is, is good for this vaccine um, if it is uh, uh, approved. Um, but um, I, I, I tried to take myself out of this question of what will this do for vaccine confidence? Because we, I know we're in this moment of significant vaccine, lack of vaccine confidence, and we need to maintain that. But I also think we need to maintain our, um, our, our same um, scientific perspective that we did prior to, to some of these real challenges we're having with vaccine confidence um, in order to uh, most effectively use vaccines. So it was a struggle for me, but I voted yes. Well, thank you all. Um, I will explain my vote. Uh, Dr. Uh, Bernstein and uh, Perlman expressed my viewpoint uh, precisely, and Dr. Griffin. It's a, it was a one in 9,000 risk of GBS, which is concerning. And um, the issue of, while the issue of co-admin is an implementation question, we were given information in the briefing document that there is some type of interference. We don't know the magnitude, we don't know the, you know, the extent of it, the, the, the confidence interval around that particular interference and the data were not shared, so we can make at least maybe uh, dismiss maybe these data. I don't know. We were le I was left with the idea that there is interference and whether we like it or not, th this vaccine is gonna be given in the fall around the time of administration of influenza. So knowing that there are outstanding data that maybe, maybe um, um, can inform this uh, safety question uh, uh, well, but we don't have it. I said, no, the data are not adequate to reassure of the safety. I guess I interpreted it narrowly, just in the opposite direction. Um, well, thank you all. We now move to the next question. Are the available data adequate to support the effectiveness of ABRISVO, RSV PREF, for the prevention of lower respiratory tract disease caused by RSV in individuals 60 years of age and older? We will uh, do the, um, the same uh, process uh, whereby each committee member uh, will um, um, share their viewpoint uh, of the interpretation of the data we saw today pertaining to effectiveness. And I see hands. We begin with Dr. Griffin. Uh, yeah, I, I want to share other people's sort of uh, amazement at how well this vaccine does work for preventing disease. And um, to finally have a, a, an effective RSV vaccine is, is really great. Um, you know, it would be nice to have data on hospitalizations, but even the data on prevention of medical care visits is really important. Um, and about, I guess, four or five percent of us get RSV every year. And so, yeah, it would be great to have a vaccine that could prevent those more mild illnesses as well as hospitalizations. So, and I think 
they, uh, you know, they did meet their primary endpoint. Um, so I think there, there's a lot of, um, the data does support the effectiveness of this vaccine. It's just um, the population was underrepresented by um, people who could most benefit from the vaccine. But the data that we see is, is great. Thank you, Dr. Griffin. Dr. Pergam. I think I sort of stated a lot of, a lot of my comments before in the prior question, but I'll just reiterate. Um, I think the data is exciting in terms of what it shows and the potential for an RSV vaccine is highly exciting. Uh, primarily, the data we have in front of us for adults, but also the potential that um, a vaccine is of this uh, potential could um, have a major effect in children. Obviously, that's not what we're talking about today. But um, I, I think it, what, what's troubling is just the inability to really assess true efficacy in a population at highest risk. I just don't feel like that is well um, linked in the data. I think, as you pointed out, 1% with CHF, 5% with COPD. Those are the high-risk populations that are really going to develop uh, complications and you would expect to see with hospitalizations and uh, major morbidity. Um, there's obviously no immunosuppressed pa patients in this population um, who are very at risk for developing complications. And then, uh, you know, I think there's a lot more data for this second year to find out how long this efficacy lasts. And it feels like that data is literally like a week away from being made available, but we just don't have it. And so, some of this feels like we're making we're, we're voting on this prematurely without um, all of the information in front of us um, and that goes for the flu vaccine and and, and um, uh, you know RSV vaccine combination so I, I'm, I'm I'm struck because I know how important this vaccine is to prevention but I don't feel like the timing of this vote is is necessarily the right time for me to fully be supportive of its efficacy and I'd like to see more data. Thank you, Dr. Portnoy. Great, thank you. Um, I, I pretty much agree with what Dr. Pergam says. I, I'm desperately eager to, to have a vaccine that works for RSV. This has been a terrible disease my whole career. I would love to see it, no, but no doubt about it. My concern is that so few patients uh, were actually infected by RSV in this study that if just a few of the placebo patients, or I guess a few of the uh, actively vaccinated patients had had actually developed RSV, the confidence interval would have gone past the 20% and this would have been statistically insignificant. The numbers of patients are so small in this study that I just don't have confidence in the statistics. Even though they're statistically significant, I'm very skeptical about that. I'm concerned that there could be a type 1 or 2 error, whatever kind of error that would be. And, uh, and I, I think that it would be much better if this vaccine um, could be considered after the study was completely done, because I think more patients would have been included. Uh, there would have been time for uh, a more complete analysis. It would have been more robust numbers. The uh, confidence intervals might have been a little bit narrower, which would have given me more comfort that this vaccine actually works. This is not an emergency use authorization. If we were in the middle of COVID and we needed a vaccine immediately or people are dying, and I know that people are dying from RSV, but um, it's not like COVID. Uh, it's not an emergency use authorization. We can take the time to finish the studies and uh, get the information we need before licensing this product going forward. Uh, so I, I remain a little bit skeptical given the data that we have. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Portnoy. Um, I do not see, they, oh, here we go, Dr. Cohen. Um, I will just reiterate what um, uh, everyone has said so far. I feel like this is not great timing to be asking this question right now, whereas with the safety data, you weren't gonna get more safety data. This data is actually like, on the cusp of being available and will be incredibly influential in terms of um, both increasing the confidence of uh, the efficacy estimates, as well as potentially helping us understand um, uh, any sort of duration of protection issues, at least um, through this time. And so I, I it, it feels like 
there is not a reason to, um, to, it, it feels like we are not in a state of crisis and we can um, wait for this additional data to be presented or shared, um, at which time I'm really hopeful that we will, uh, that the data will support that the vaccine is as effective as it appears to be so far. Thank you, Dr. Cohen. Dr. Bernstein. Thanks. I, I agree with what my colleagues have, uh, have said. I, I, kind of feel that it, it's a little premature to be um, moving in this direction so quickly. I kind of feel we waited decades to come up with an RSV vaccine. And I, I feel that um, there's a modest amount of uh, data on the most vulnerable uh, populations. There's not efficacy as far as preventing hospitalization and death in, in those that are most uh, vulnerable. And uh, I, I just think there's more data that's, as Dr. Cohn said, that's on the cusp. And I, I just think that it's a little early for us to be uh, suggesting that we have adequate data to support the effectiveness of the vaccine at this point. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna go down the uh, name list. I don't see any more hands. Dr. Berger. Thanks, Dr. Sally. I'm, I think I'm, I'm in the boat with everybody else. Uh, I, I would love to see more, more data available to be able to make this decision at this point. Um, but it also is an unmet need. You know, we, we've not had an RSV vaccine at all. Uh, this would be potentially able to protect older individuals. But again, we're missing a lot of the data to show that it really is effective. But the, I mean, the data that we've seen, though, is, you know, from a preliminary standpoint, it does look great. You know, I think I, I do agree with Dr. Griffin in, in terms of that assessment. Uh, you know, the, the efficacy rates, you know, above 66%, above 85% for, for three, you know, greater than three um, symptoms, uh, you know, is, is, is very exciting to see. Should we be voting at this point? I think that's really the question that, that everyone is coming, you know, coming to. And I, I, I guess I do have a question that might be better addressed by FDA, but I, I guess that where, where I'd be interested is, you know, depending on what happens, is there a potential of having this pushed out, I mean, to, to hold on this question until uh, the data actually is finished. I, I mean, I think, I, you know, I think, um, I, I think uh, as others have pointed out, it, it's just around the corner. And, and I guess the question is whether or not, you know, could this question just be held until that data is available and then the committee actually meet and discuss. I, you know, I, I don't obviously know the answer to that question, but again, I think it's really an FDA question at this point. Um. Dr. Kaslow, are you available to answer the question or Dr. Pert, maybe? Thank you, Dr. Berger, for that question. That's exactly the question we're asking in this voting question. And we do take it literally, are the available data adequate to support the effectiveness for the print for today? That's the question we're asking. Okay, so I guess the answer is as before, just vote on the data as presented to you, even though we know the study is incomplete. That's uh, correct. Dr. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Jaynes? Um, you know, I, 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 guess, I guess just one comment and follow up to, to some of the, the perspectives that have been shared. Um, I guess it's, it's not clear to me that um, or, or to what extent additional follow-up of this study through the, the second season would address um, all of the remaining questions around efficacy. Um, it seems to me that many of these questions are sort of baked in by the trial design and, and by the population that's been enrolled here. As, as Dr. Al-Sali has pointed out, there are very few individuals that were enrolled that were immunocompromised uh, had, you know, the, the eligibility criteria dictated not enrolling individuals with without stable pre-existing conditions. There are, I think, just about five percent of participants over the above the age of eighty, um, and so those questions 
um, I don't think will ever be addressed with this study population. Um, the, the, the question around durability of vaccine efficacy is, is one that, that could, could be addressed with additional follow-up. I, I guess I was somewhat reassured by the, the data that the sponsor shared that have not been FDA reviewed, but but were preliminary data um, suggesting that the vaccine efficacy estimates were stable, um, um, and 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 not not appreciably different when one included uh, all the data to date. Um, um, and 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 in terms of the severe endpoint, um, I don't recall precisely how many severe disease endpoints there were that accrued, except that there weren't the 12 that would, would, would have been required to, to meet the criteria for performing the interim analysis. Uh, again, I'm, I question whether or not there would be sufficient numbers of severe disease endpoints, even with the second season of data, to uh, reliably evaluate efficacy against that critical endpoint. So I guess that's all to share for now. Thank you. So Dr. James, I just want to clarify that the additional data shared by the sponsor included a few more cases from season one. Um, but you know, the 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 we had a very early, very intense RSV season and definitely way more than 44 cases. Um, but yeah, I just want to clarify that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh okay, keep going down the list. Dr. Feiken. Yes. Um, I mean, to me, if I, if I just read the voting question, eh, which is, I think, what we're being asked to vote on, I feel like there was sufficient data presented to, to answer this question in, in the positive. Do I wish that they had enrolled more people in their 80s where the real risk of hospitalization goes up? Yes. Do I wish they had enrolled more people with under eye illness? Yes, but I think we do have some signals uh, that for 80 year olds um, that the, the trend in the efficacy was in the right direction along the lines of, of uh, the other age groups with wide confidence intervals. And, and the same with those who are in a severe risk group. I think we saw uh, a similar. Um, and I do think that the, you know, the, the primary Efficacy analysis was stated to be the first RSV season, not the second RSV season. So while I think it will be interesting and useful from a programmatic standpoint to see uh, if there's durability of protection into that second season, I don't think that is the primary question uh, and, and the way that the data was, was analyzed here. So, um, and the last point I, I wanted to make is I, I, I do, I think it's unfortunate that this happened during the COVID pandemic. And we all know that rates of RSV um, were decreased because of all the non-pharmaceutical interventions. I think it's unfortunate because they didn't get enough severe cases uh, because of that. I think we do know from other respiratory viral vaccines that they do tend to have higher efficacy against the more severe cases. And if this vaccine works similarly to, to those other vaccines, um, we would expect that for severe disease hospitalization, uh, we should see at, at, least, at least similar efficacy, um, if, not, if not greater, rather than lower efficacy. Over. Thank you. Dr. Hildreth? Uh, thank you. Uh, I agree with my colleague uh, who just spoke that I think there's sufficient data to make the, to vote yes on this question. Um, I also wish there were more enrollees participants who are all 80 years or older to um, have more data in that age group, but I think there's sufficient data to to say that the the efficacy of the vaccine is sufficient to prevent lower tract disease. So my vote will be yes. Dr. Kim. Well, thank you. Uh, you know, for for a clinical trial here, I'm I'm looking at um, uh, looking at the question 
question of um, it did, uh, was a was the primary point uh, was that addressed and met? And the answer is yes. Uh, FDA, FDA uh, analysis confirmed that. Um, and uh, and with that said, uh, whether it's preliminary or final, um, I, I, I have to ask the question: uh, What is the alternative? We, um, and that is uh, if if the uh, if we if the vote is no and the and and a vaccine, uh, which admittedly I think we say uh, is it's a good vaccine um, uh, that that can and perhaps should be used. Uh, is not available for the uh, let's say for the uh, for uh, the upcoming RSV season or perhaps even sooner and and, and the all chance that it might be uh, it might be injected um, uh, uh, interseason. Then we have uh, in terms of the public health uh, implication, we would have uh, people who are unnecessarily uh, impacted adversely by uh, by not having the vaccine available. Um, so, uh, considering that other possibility, um, you know, how how should we go? Um, the uh, if we rephrase the available data uh, to say if this is the final data and the only data uh, that we have, then how would we vote? And and honestly, if, if this is if the data that we currently have is preliminary. Uh, and it's not like we're going to get uh, get additional uh, additional uh, study subjects enrolled. Um, and there there are certain projections, uh, of course. It, it's, it's not going to be. Do, do we expect uh, reasonably a vastly different outcome than the analyses that have been completed? And so, weighing all those uh, weigh, weighing all those possibilities, and again. Uh, thinking about this voting question as narrowly uh, as as what's been written, then uh, then I think uh, I, I, I then I think that there is evidence uh, to support the uh, support the notion that the effectiveness of the of vaccine uh, against RSV is is uh, is is um, is rather profound. So uh, so that would uh, uh, lead me to uh, to the decision that that I will. Make uh, yeah, as we when we take take the vote. Okay. Um, yes, I'm sorry, Doctor Perlman. Yes, yeah, so I agree with uh, what my colleagues have said up till now. I am I I am going to vote yes for this uh, because I think about a couple of things. So first, when the COVID nineteen vaccine was being first put out, but we were hoping for efficacy of 50%. And here, this vaccine is above 50%. Now, it's a, a, not the ideal population to have been studied, but uh, as opposed to safety, if it turns out that this isn't quite as effective as we thought, I don't think that anyone is going to be hurt, which is what I was worried about with the biosafety. So, I, and I think a lot of people will be helped. And uh, if, if there's no safety issues, I think we'll find out if people who are really compromised can mount a decent response to this vaccine, because we don't even know that really, and we want to find that out. But I, I think that the data we have right now is uh, adequate for for this general population, which isn't the ideal population, but that's what, that's what I'm thinking. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Perlman. I'm trying to see if I skipped anyone no i think everyone had an opportunity to weigh in correct um so okay it's my turn at the end uh the as presented yes the vaccine does prevent lower respiratory disease in a generally healthy 60 year old and older population um the I know on the issue of safety, everyone said these are the data we're gonna get, but to me it's on the efficacy. These are the only data we're gonna get. The uh, unfortunately, the the populations enrolled was not enriched for COPD and CHF, uh, and um, these are the individuals who would have had significant disease with this virus. The I know that these statistics are. Um, predefined in terms of 
how many cases would lead to the um, uh, analysis and that we have uh, utilized this approach with other vaccine, but also in a disease as prevalent and as ubiquitous as RSV, also making decisions based on 44 cases kind of feels also um, just too small a number of cases, but it, it was preset with the agency in, in advance. Um, the issue of durability is very important and uh, the RSV season is complete almost. So we should have those data from season two. Uh, what happens when antibody, antibodies wane? Uh, do we lose uh, the efficacy? Do we, um, is it maintained against uh, the outcomes of interest? You know, this has to do with the fact that the study was not completed um, prior to the submission. But then again, um, it seems that it was uh, um, negotiated or, or ac um, acceptable. So th these are the the thing the thoughts in my mind when when I'm looking at the effectiveness uh, of this product. Uh, I see one hand, and I'm gonna see Dr. Bernstein. Yeah, I just had a, a question because one of the struggles that I'm having, and maybe uh, colleagues around the table can uh, weigh in. I I kind of feel that the the there. The way this has been presented is that there's a large unmet need, but the unmet need is for vulnerable populations, and this study really does not answer that question. And, and although the, the um, efficacy is rather high, there are some you know wide confidence intervals, but I just I kind of feel the unmet need, this is the wrong population necessarily that uh, the VE is addressing. So I'm sort of wrestling with that. I, I, I agree with you, Dr. Bernstein. The, the, the population where, where, where the vaccine is going to potentially have the biggest impact is less represented in this study. Dr. Griffin. Uh, yeah, I just... I want to say I, I agree with that, and I, it's it's really concerning because um, I mean my answer to this will be yes, but I feel like it's pre-licensure that we are able to get our best data, and it's really we're playing catch up if we have to get efficacy data post licensure or post recommendation is even harder. Um, and, and this is a vaccine that would potentially be recommended for every older person for every year. I mean, it's a huge market for huge for forever, maybe. So I, I just feel like, wow, it would be really, we play catch up with flu vaccine forever because we never had the clinical trials. And I feel like this is an opportunity to have more information before licensure, before recommendations, so. But uh, if I may ask, what would the, how would that be in a new trial that enriches for individuals older than 70 and individuals with COPD, CHF, for example, or? Yeah, I don't think that would be unreasonable for a vaccine that's going to be used for every or going to be recommend, could be recommended for every older person every year. I, I don't think that's and I think, yeah, maybe it makes sense to do a trial in the healthier people first. But um, I think the risk benefit would be much, much better for people 70 and older people who are frail in a nursing home, CHF, COPD, people who have had pneumonia who are going to get pneumonia again. Um, yeah, I think there's another, another study is not unreasonable. 
but, but however that doesn't i guess uh, I, i'm sharing the same concerns of course as you you have expressed but that, that doesn't help us with how we're going to answer the question on hand based on the trial we have knowing that the population that's going to get the vaccine is going to be different and the unmet need as dr bernstein put it is in a different population yeah well i think fdi needs to listen to these other comments and not just the answers to the voting questions yeah I agree. Thank you, Dr. Griffin. Dr. Cohen. Thanks. Um, yeah, I totally agree with Dr. Griffin. Um, it, it, it does feel like there's this, this is not an EUA, this is a BLA that we're, that, that's being looked at right now. So this is a permanent sort of, you know, decision unless I know FDA can always change um, the, 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 uh, I, I know they can always adapt to changing data, but I do feel like this is a pretty large decision to license this vaccine. And 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 I I am I know that we don't always have the right group of people in our studies and that that needs to change. I believe that the risk benefit in those groups that Dr. Griffin just discussed will be good for this vaccine. I'm really my. I'm concerned about what happens next year. For example, if we vaccinate a whole population of people this year and we have no data on what's gonna, what they're gonna need next year, if they're gonna need a vaccine, we're going to be very stuck without the completion or we'll have just had the completion of this data, but we won't be able to look at a booster dose. I just feel like we're gonna at constantly be playing catch up from a, boosting perspective or an annual vaccination perspective. And we're always going to have limited data because we um, pushed ahead with vaccinating in um, uh, based off of, uh, of this interim analysis. But I also do agree that this vaccine looks like it works really well based on the available data. Dr. Kessler. So just, I just wanted to be clear with everyone that this is the primary analysis for the primary endpoint of this of this study. Um, so because I'm hearing interim analysis and preliminary, just just wanted to be crystal clear that um, as specified in the study, this is the primary analysis for the primary endpoint. Over, Dr. Cohen. Uh, sorry, that was from earlier. Um, that's it. thank you for that helpful clarification, though, Dr. Kessler. Okay. Okay. I think uh, I don't see any additional requests or hands. Um, uh, we can proceed with the voting. Okay, so just uh, again, this is for the public record. Um, I have to say this, our nine regular members and three temporary voting members, a total of 12 will be voting. Dr. Osali will read the voting question number two for the record. Uh, you have one minute to vote and voting options are yes, no, or abstain. So if Dr. Osali, you would be kind to read the second voting question uh, for the public record. Voting question number two, are the available data adequate to support the effectiveness of ABRISVO RSV pre-F for the prevention of lower respiratory tract disease caused by RSV in individuals 60 years of age and older? Um, great, thank you. Um, at this point, Derek, we'll move all the non-voting members um, out of the main room. Please do not uh, log out of the Zoom. We'll be back in a few minutes. Derek, let us know when all the voting members are present. <laughs>
We are ready to display. Great, thank you, Derek. Um, so what we have is uh, we have seven out of 12 members who have voted yes, four out of 12 have voted no, and one out of 12 have, um, has abstained. Uh, for the public record, here I go reading the votes one by one. Okay, um, Dr. Jay Portnoy, no. Dr. Stanley Perlman, yes. Dr. Marie Griffin, yes. Um, Dr. Holly Janes, yes. Dr. James Hildreth, yes. Dr. Henry Bernstein, no. Dr. Kim, um, David Kim, yes. Dr. Hannah El Sali, yes. Dr. Adam Berger, abstain. Dr. Daniel Feiken, yes. Dr. Stephen Pergam, no. Dr. Amanda Cohn, no. Um, that concludes my reading of the votes. Um, Dr. El Sali, I'll hand it over the meeting back to you for discussing the voting questions. Hmm. We'll go down the list. Dr. Portnoy. Great, thanks. I had a split vote. I voted no for this question because, as I said before, there are such small numbers that one or two cases in the opposite direction could have changed the results. Uh, and I'm very concerned about that. I, I think it's rushed. I, I would really like to have seen them complete the study, get at least another year's worth of RSV data, and then I would feel more comfortable about the results. Uh, given that fact, I'm, I'm okay with these results because statistically speaking, it did show efficacy. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Dr. Perlman. Yeah, I don't have much to add what I said just a few minutes ago. I think that for the primary goal of the study, I think the endpoint was met. I also think that I wish we had, I wish also we had more numbers, that we had more uh, different kinds of people in the study. So it's imperfect, but I think it met its primary endpoint. Thank you, Dr. Griffin. Uh, yeah, I agree with that. Um, the primary endpoint was met. And met prevent it lower respiratory tract disease. I do want to point out that in, in the study population, there were only two RSV hospitalizations prevented, and there were two GBS hospitalizations that were caused. So as far as serious outcomes in this study, um, it, it's, it's really tough, you know, so. Thank you. Uh, Dr. James. Um, thank you. I, I voted yes um, f f first on the, on the population. I, I guess I interpreted the question quite literally to, to be, you know, whether or not this supported data of uh, regarding efficacy in the population of adults age 60 or older. And, and, um, and so on that, on that basis for that population, I thought that this was a reasonable data package um, notwithstanding the, the questions that have been raised around potential um, efficacy in other key populations with, with the burden of, of RSV um, uh, associated with disease. And, and, and then in, in terms of the um, you know, strength of the statistical evidence, I, I also share some concerns raised by others in terms of you know, there being relatively few primary endpoint events and, and um, just one single trial here um, and, and an analysis based on interim analysis that sort of turns into the primary analysis once efficacy is established, but nonetheless an interim analysis. But I guess I was swayed by, you know, the, the high estimates of efficacy, um, the consistent estimates of efficacy across subgroups, and, and the fact that the lower bounds of the confidence intervals were not just above 20%, but above 30%, I think in all cases. Um, so, you know, Make you know gauging the, the the balance in terms of benefits and risks. I, I voted yes on that basis. Thank you, Dr. Hildress. Uh, uh, thank you. I, I don't have much to add to my colleagues. I, I think that based on the question we were asked to address and the data put in front of us, um, I think the the criteria are met, and uh, so I voted yes. Thank you. <laughs> okay. I guess uh, someone should take note of the enthusiasm of the yeses. <laughs> Dr. Bernstein? Well, I'll be enthusiastic about the no, because I, <laughs> I still believe that uh, it, 
the, the vaccine is, uh, is created to meet unmet uh, needs for, for vul vulnerable populations, not, not healthy people. Uh, yes, it's impressive. The, um, the uh, VE against uh, lower respiratory tract disease, but it really didn't do anything for hospitalization or death, which is one of the major things I suspect that we would want from a, a vaccine in protecting against or preventing respiratory disease. And I think some of the confidence intervals, even for the healthy ones, were kind of wide in my mind. So that's that's why I voted no. Thank you. Dr. Kim? Well, I don't have anything more to add than what I said earlier and what I heard from other committee members. I think, uh, I think uh, but I will say that uh, that I, I look forward to additional data coming in to review, um, hopefully to further add to the uh, uh, to the yes vote that I, uh, that I just cast. Thank you. Dr. Berger. So I, I voted to abstain because that was the the one that made sense to me for saying I'm leaning yes, but I want to see the other data that's about to come out. And it wasn't clear to me which answer actually got you that from the question that was posed. So, uh, you know, the abstain here, like I said, is is more of a lean yes. Um, you know, but I do have I do have concerns about the 44. You know, that there's only 44 patients who we're making these decisions on, um, and I do understand that that still met the pre-specified primary endpoint. I, I fully understand that, and the, uh, you know, but it's still like the, the idea that that data is just going to be available shortly. Um, you know, I'd like to be able to see that to make sure that that, you know, still pans out as others have stated, you know, the confidence intervals are, are quite wide in many of these. And, you know, I think a couple of people have already pointed out that, you know, a couple of swings the other direction may change that efficacy numbers. Um, you know, that being said, I, I do want to just explicitly say, I'm, I find the data exciting. I think the idea that we be looking at a vaccine efficacy rate of 85% is, is, Fantastic, uh, and I certainly hope that pans out. And I, you know, as, as Dr. Kim just stated, I do look forward to seeing the rest of the data as it comes in. So that's my uh, that, that's why I voted abstain. Thank you, Dr. Feiken. I voted yes. Uh, I think the the primary endpoint was was clearly met. Um, I do feel like others that it's disappointing that we don't have more data on the high-risk groups and the severe outcomes, partly by design and partly by circumstance. Um, and I think like with the post-marketing safety surveillance, it'll be critical to get, if this vaccine does get licensed, that there is robust uh, post-introduction vaccine effectiveness data and impact data in those high-risk groups against severe outcomes, because I think how this vaccine will opti optimally be used uh, is going to be the more challenging question. And I think that will be a, a, a work in progress that could take perhaps years and a lot of post-introduction uh, evidence to shape what that looks like. So I think that would be critical. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Perga. Boy, I'll tell you, this was, um, considering how we voted on all the COVID vaccines, I think this was probably the most difficult um, decision I've made in a, in a while. Um, I voted no because I, I feel like there are too many lingering questions in this data set. Yes, it did meet the primary endpoint per the letter of the law, but there is so much data that is just waiting on the other edge that I think will be informative. I lean no only because of that information, but in terms of the data that's presented, I'm, I'm very much interested in this being a yes, but I think with additional data, that becomes an easier decision for me. Um, I, I'm really struggling with this um, because of the importance of what this vaccine means to public health, but I, I, I really encourage the FDA to rethink how they developed this vaccine question and this design of this trial, because 
what you hear from all of us is that this did not target the population of interest. And this was in some ways um, set up to be a, a population that, um, you know, was maybe a little bit easier to approach and easier to collect data on. But the real importance is the population that is at risk. And I think there was a missed opportunity to develop and design this trial in a way that would be, it would make this decision easier for us moving forward. Um, and it's, it's unfortunate uh, from my view, because I, I think there's some really lingering questions that I think even with the additional data, we may not get answers to, and will lead to a lot of additional work in the post um, licensure period. Um, and then I just wanna say, you'll see where I am on the list of voting. Uh, that's how long it took me to think about this. And I think part of that is also because of what Amanda Cohen said, and I, I imagine she'll probably feel the same, is this is a BLA. It's very different. We're approving this vaccine, um, and that means it goes to, to production, it goes out to the public. And I think I want to be very cautious about how we do that. When the EUA and, and COVID vaccines, we were in a, in a pandemic in a very different situation. And I think we need to be cautious how we think through this. So that's the reason I, my vote was no. Thank you. Dr. Cohen? I think I echo Dr. Perkins' uh, uh, comments uh, almost precisely. I um, also uh, believe that um, had we had a little bit more time to see the data that is on the cusp, I would have been had been a confident yes. But um, and the data that was presented today, I do believe met the endpoints as as we all do. But I um, feel like we. I, I think I voted no to try to take a step back and and get into um, our sort of pre pandemic approach towards vaccines. And, and I do know that we had a bad RSV season last year, but we've been waiting for these vaccines for, for decades. And I think the time we could have had to really be confident in this data and, and get the complete first season data and potentially even um, understand um, second season would really, it's, it's going to, I feel like we're going to get um, very stuck trying to sort through lots of post-licensure data um, when with a little bit more time, we may have understood um, the clinical trial data um, better. Thank you, Dr. Cohen. Um, and the last I'll say my uh, rationale for the vote, it was again, it took me a while to cast my vote as well. Um, the, as agreed upon with the agency, and as agreed upon in the statistical analysis plan, the answer is yes. However, you know, we. I'm going to revisit re, uh, COVID like some of my colleagues did. When we were designing and implementing the COVID vaccine trials, we had to stop some of the enrollment um, for a while in order to allow for the at-risk populations to be represented. Because when we do a clinical trial, invariably the healthier, the, uh, the, the, the non-minorities, the, the ones living in certain areas are the ones who are going to enroll. But they are not necessarily the... Um, the population in whom uh, the vaccine needs to be implemented. And we followed at the time, actually, FDA guidance that the trials have to mirror the populations at risk. And um, it is, you know, for this particular trial, uh, I think everyone uh, here is in agreement that this did not take place. And this should be taken into account uh, as the um, um, the analysis of, of our discussion takes place at the level of, of the agency. <laughs> okay. Um, anything else from any of our members? or from the FDA. No, not at this time. I think we turn it back to Dr. Pedar to, to close. I'll have some closing remarks after it goes back to her. Yes. Um, thank you, Dr. Castle. Uh, please uh, go ahead with your closing remarks. Uh, 
Dr. Kasla. If you have any closing remarks, Sorry. please go ahead. Thank you. No. Sorry, we were on we were on mute. So um so I'd like to thank the advisory committee for the critical and probing questions and the subsequent voting discussion today. It was quite helpful to hear the discourse on the safety topics, including GBS and other demyelinating disorders, the concomitant vaccine use, atrial fibrillation, and the importance of robustness of the post-marketing studies and surveillance. Um, and also on the efficacy topics, including the durability, the at-risk populations, the post-approval vaccine effectiveness and correlates of protection. Um, input from experts qualified by scientific training and expertise in evaluating evidence on effectiveness and safety of products is really a critical part of the regulatory review process and the advisory committee has served us well today. Um, we look forward to uh, further discussions tomorrow. In the meantime, let me thank the advisory committee meeting staff and also the technical staff that ran a meeting today for uh, a remarkably flawless meeting meeting today in this virtual environment. Let me also thank the FDA ELA review team and the invited and open public uh, hearing speakers. And finally, um, we greatly appreciate the time and diligence of the advisory committee members and of our chair, Dr. El Sali. Um, we'll see everyone tomorrow. Great, thank you, Dr. Caslow. Uh, for closing comments, I wanted to thank the committee and CBER staff for working so hard to make this meeting a successful meeting as always. I now call the meeting officially adjourned at 4.14 p.m. Eastern time. Have a wonderful evening. Bye-bye.